And Tam, when you, or pardon me, Janine, when you get a chance, can you elevate uh, Vice Chair Diadamo to co host? Ms. Townsend, Mr. Loffer, are we uh, ready to begin? Looks like we are prepared to go, Chair Escavel. My clock shows we're about a minute away, so we may want to wait just a moment. But technically, uh, we've got a quorum and we have uh, everything functioning from a technical perspective. Great. We'll, uh, we'll give it. And now it is nine according to my clock. So good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Escavel. I am chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Tuesday, uh, June 1st, and it is nine o'clock. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues. With me today are Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, Board Member Tam Doduck, Board Member Sean McGuire, and later in the board meeting, uh, Board Member Laurel Firestone will be joining us. She will just be a bit late here this morning. Uh, as you can see, this meeting is being webcast and recorded. Uh, so please do speak, uh, uh, state your name clearly when you are called on. As you can see, uh, we do not have a physical meeting room in order to comply with uh, COVID restrictions and as authorized in the governor's executive orders. And so uh, you're either viewing us through our customary webcast, which is on YouTube um, or the Cal EPA website, or if you are intending to comment on any one of uh, our items today, you should be here on the Zoom meeting platform uh, with us. If you do not, if you are not currently on the platform and you do intend on commenting on one of the items today, there are instructions at the top of today's agenda on how to get a, a password. And then otherwise, uh, you can email comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov in order to um, receive assistance in uh, getting a password and also filling out our public speaker card. Uh, once you are here on the platform, you will be muted, your cameras will be turned off until uh, it is your time to uh, provide comment. And with that, and, and please do again, speak clearly into the microphone and or phone uh, when it is uh, your turn to um, be uh, called up. And with that, we'll start today's meeting with a presentation of Superior Accomplishment Awards. And I'd like to call up Karen Mogus to uh, present them. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Chair Escaval and members of the board. Yeah, I'm Karen Mogus. I'm Deputy Director of the Division of Water Quality at the State Water Resources Board. And I am so pleased to yet again be presenting Superior Accomplishment Awards to actually five staff, four of which are in DWQ and one in OCC this morning. Um, so uh, I'll just get started and try not to take up too much of your time. Uh, starting with our underground storage tank leak prevention unit, I have uh, a staff person, Tom Henderson, who is an engineering geologist in the, in the program and a recognized subject matter expert in all things underground storage tanks, both uh, technically and in regulation. Uh, implementation. And Tom led a Herculean effort to adopt three sets of regulations in three years. I don't, I don't even comprehend that. I got one set of regulations done in 17 years. So um, it's, it's a huge effort. Uh, Tom and his team spent countless hours reaching out to the regulated community, uh, local and state regulators, the Coupa programs, and other stakeholders, his technical and regulatory, regulatory support improved understanding of and compliance with the underground storage tank program requirements, and due to his expertise, stakeholders and colleagues alike seek his assistance with best practices for design, operation, and compliance with regulatory requirements. And so Tom's efforts have been a huge asset to DWQ and really pleased to be presenting presenting this award today. I'm going to wait till the end to do the clapping because we do have five people we're, we're um, presenting to. Uh, Julie Osborne, also with the underground storage tank team, is an attorney for, for the Office of Chief Counsel and has for many years provided legal support to the underground storage tank unit and worked hand in hand with the technical team to, de to develop and adopt updated regulations for the UST program. She ensured that these regulatory packages met all legal requirements, drafted regulatory language and corresponding documents, and facilitated discussions with Office of Administrative Law to ensure success 
successful implementation of the regulations. Without Julie's tireless efforts, these three regulatory packages in three years would not have been possible. She, um, and if you've ever met Julie, she is just the kindest, most um, soft-spoken yet uh, professional and uh, strong character. So just really a joy to be able to uh, present this award to her as well today. Um, moving on to our water quality and wet water quality certification and wetlands unit, I have two staff people uh, in that unit I'd like to recognize today. First is Catherine Woody. She's an environmental scientist in the program. Uh, and just for context, this program issues about a thousand permits per year between the state and regional boards. That's a huge amount of effort. And Catherine has contributed to significant advances in the program's data quality, data management, and performance reporting in close coordination with the regional boards through our roundtable. A recent state audit required an overhaul of the program's data entry procedures and quality assurance and quality control program. And Catherine's efforts resulted in improved data entry procedures data quality and the ability to track performance across the program. She also provides training to state and regional board staff on data entry, fees, and program practices to ensure consistency across all of the state and regional board program implementation activities, and has made significant contributions to the program that have increased efficiency and uh, consistency across the state. Catherine is, uh, has been an excellent uh, asset to this program. Similarly, Jean Bandura, Bandura is an environmental scientist in the Water Quality Certification and Wetlands Program, and she recently led the Water Board's 2020 certification of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permits. Those permits streamline the permitting of the lion's share of the dredge and fill projects across the state. Most of them are relatively small projects and can be permitted under these nationwide permits, but we have to go through the process of certifying that they are in compliance with the state's water quality objectives. Um, Jean demonstrated strong leadership, organizational and research skills, as well as flexibility while dealing with changing federal regulations and changing interpretations of federal regulations and a strict federal deadline that was more aggressive than ever before. Um, her efforts in completing this certification, as well as her significant contributions to the program's data management and performance measure tracking have been invaluable. Um, and finally, moving on to our groundwater ambient monitoring and assessment or gamma unit, um, Dory Bellin is an engineering geologist in that unit, and she has been instrumental in developing a variety of GIS tools to support analysis of groundwater data housed in our GeoTracker Gamma data system. Her expertise is recognized not only in DWQ, but across uh, the GIS user community. And recently, she provided support to our NPDES permitting section to develop a mapping tool for stakeholders to use to determine where requirements for suction dredge mining activities would apply across the state. She worked with the permitting staff to define criteria needed to develop the map layers and designed an easy to use, high quality, informative tool in a very short amount of time. She trained staff and stakeholders on how to use the tool and presented it to, to you all in briefings in uh, recently earlier this year. Dory's enthusiasm and willingness to share her expertise is an asset to DWQ and, a, and an example for all staff at uh, the water boards. So uh, please join me in congratulating all five of these staff on the huge efforts that they have contributed to the water boards and particularly in this time, I mean, I, I think I can safely say that all of these folks have demonstrated our resilience and ability to get work done, even in really challenging times. And so just really happy to be able to, to present these awards today. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you all for all of your great effort. And if, uh, if you want to get on camera, I can't tell if everyone's on camera or not, but please show your cameras uh, so we can clap for you. <laughs> there they are. 
Great. It's really great to see you all. And thank you so much, Karen. Um, really, really appreciate the, 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 the overview of the incredible work that you all have been uh, doing here. To Karen's point, it hasn't been an easy year. And uh, what we have seen from our, our programs and from you all is just an incredible resiliency and even just continuing to innovate and push on what are uh, key uh, programs when it comes to protection of water quality, but also contributing to incredible decision-making that's going on in the state collectively. And there I think of Gamma and some of our other programs. So, you know, um, I think for some, perhaps when they hear, you know, process improvement and, and, and data quality assurance and cleanup, it seems a little, um, maybe not that sexy, but it's pretty sexy. And it's incredibly important to the functioning and running of our regulatory uh, systems here. So thank you for continuing to innovate, continuing to, to do work that is not uh, often over-resourced uh, and instead is really coming from your uh, just incredible leadership in your program. So just thank you. I really, really do appreciate this opportunity to acknowledge you and your work. It, it makes um, you know, the decisions that we have to make here uh, just so much easier when we have tools, 21st century tools like this that are really you know, data intensive, but help us at least make better decisions here amongst us. So just thank you. Really, really appreciate all of you. And, and this is so dissatisfying, you know, a little kind of virtual clap, but soon, uh, you know, we'll start to be in person again. So instead we can have the awkward dais photo, which I never <laughs> thought was that great either, but at least we could at least uh, see each other in, in person here. So thank you. I appreciate it, Karen. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay, well, that, uh, that is our uh, uh, Superior Accomplishment Award presentation and just really appreciate that uh, we do that as an agency here. Um, important to acknowledge the 2000 plus folks that actually make uh, this work happen. Um, okay, now on to public forum, which is another thing that we do here at the board, uh, allowing uh, anyone who uh, would like to speak before the board on an item not agendized or otherwise uh, on uh, before the board's uh, calendar to be able to, to speak to us. And today we have about uh, eight individuals and I believe our first will be Scott Fahey. Or no, I may be I may be wrong. Hold on, let me look at my ticker. It is sometimes not as up to date as my uh, my spreadsheet might be. So Chair Escobar, it should be Mayor Brand who is up and queued in. Thank you, appreciate it, Mr. Lawfer. Uh, Mr. Brand, good morning. Good morning, Chair Escobar and board members. Uh, thank you. And uh, my name is Mayor Bill Brand of Redondo Beach. And I'm calling uh, really obviously about the extension of that are being considered to the once through cooling compliance for the AS Redondo Beach power plant. And I know you guys talked about this back on May 18th, but I have to complain uh, that I was never notified that that was gonna be discussed. Uh, no one really that is, has a real vested interest in this was notified. And, you know, we've been very involved in this for, <laughs> I've been involved in this since before the once through cooling legislation was even enacted. So it was very disappointing to find out uh, that that was discussed and we were, not notified. Um, I know it wasn't a hearing, it was a discussion, but that was our opportunity to have a discussion with you. So, um, and we met with your board, we did meet with your board. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your staff, right? And a compliment of your staff, I will say back on May 26th. And that's when we found out that you did have that discussion. So uh, we were very sorry to miss that. And, and we had scheduled that meeting before that you discussed it. So. Um, really frustrated that we were not informed of that. We're not able to participate and have a discussion. And one of the things we wanted to talk about, so now that we're relegated to just non-agenda items and that there's a ban on ex parte communications is this non-agenda uh, opportunity. So I know you can't talk to us about it, but um, this is extremely important to us. And uh, we think a lot of things um, aren't, maybe you don't know about like how much money is flowing behind the scenes related to your decisions. Uh, just extending uh, the AES power plant in Redondo Beach is worth about $40 million a year to them. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. And they're spending significant monies lobbying. And uh, you can pull up the reports. Uh, I forget the exact name. It's like a report of lobbyist employer. And just the last half of last year, uh, a company called AES US Services LLC spend over $200,000 uh, pay with payments to um, two organizations. One was called Whiteman, 
which they paid $165,000 to, and the other one was Carter Wetch and Associates, which they paid $40,000 to, just in the last half of last year. And what were they talking about? <laughs> they were talking about uh, once through cooling issues, and they were talking to KISO, uh, I, uh, the PUC, the California Energy Commission, you guys, State Water Board, the first ones on the list. And we've been told that there's a, a ban on ex parte communications. We don't know why, but there it is um, in a public document that, you know, they've hired very expensive lobbyists to talk to you and we're relegated now to non-agenda items. So um, I don't know that you guys realize this. And um, also the last hearing you had, which was September 1st, Assembly Member O'Donnell came in and spoke to you about how important it was to extend the AES Redondo Beach power plant. He's an Assembly Member in the Long Beach area. And that was on September 1st, 2020. And you can pull up the uh, 497 form from uh, the FPPC that Assembly Member O'Donnell's campaign had to file. And that 497 shows a contribution of $2,700 uh, in October <clears throat> from guess who? AES. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a lot of money flying around out there. And I think you need to know that when people are testifying before you, many of them, I would venture to say, are actually being paid or certainly have a financial conflict of interest. Uh, and you should know about that. You should know about that. And your staff should, should, I shouldn't be the one telling you this. Your staff should be telling you this so that when you hear public testimony, you're aware of these sorts of things. Because uh, I'm not getting paid. <laughs> the residents uh, that are suffering the air pollution and the noise are not getting paid. You guys are not getting paid that much. And uh, for sure, uh, the plankton and the fish and the lobsters and the seals that are killed uh, every year when this plant uh, ingests water in their 14 foot diameter intake uh, are not getting paid. So um, I guess we're going to be uh, coming and speaking to you under these non-agenda um, items. The hearing we were told by your staff is not until October. So we feel like, you know, your hands are gonna be tied. I've had this happen to me many times. I was on the council for eight years. I was on the, I've been mayor for four years. I just got reelected for another four years. And often staff comes to us at the last minute and we really have no choice. And so uh, I feel like this is the way this has been set up because if you're gonna extend AS Rotondo Peach beyond the end of this year, well, you're giving them two months notice. <clears throat> and that's that's just not reasonable for the public to think that that hearing is really uh, going to have any impact on your decision that your hands at that point will be tied. So I wish you weren't waiting till October because, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I really think you, you need to be sending the board that, you know, we've extended three other power plants for three years. This one for one year, uh, you don't get it anymore. And that's the end of that. And they'll go figure it out and they will figure it out. So uh, anyway, hoping you don't extend AES any further. Uh, KISO, PUC, Energy Commission, they'll figure it out. You don't, you don't need to- uh, Thank you, Mayor. I apologize. Anyway, uh, thank you for your time. Sorry to go thank over. Thank you as well. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you as well, Mayor. I appreciate uh, your, your time. And when it comes to the noticing, um, you know, no, nothing different was not done in the noticing of that item as opposed to uh, what was done previously last year. So, um, but uh, I, I can hear that you feel that um, maybe we should have had a, a, a maybe a, an individual kind of flag for those that had uh, previously been um, interested in the item. I'll just say that you know we we don't have the best um, communication systems, uh, so, and so we're not that granular when we track. I think some of these items, but if there was a mailing list that was specific to once through cooling, and um, you should have been on it, let's let's make sure that uh, that is the case. So I appreciate it, Mayor. Chair. Uh, yes, Vice Chair. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your comments. And um, I would just like to follow up a little bit more. We, we have list serves. Um, and so I think it'd be important to follow up on whether or not there is a list serve uh, for this item and how we can correct it in the future if there are any uh, further informational items. As Vice Chair Diadamo and Chair Esquivel and Mayor Brand, I, I was just going to point out, uh, I did reach out to staff and did confirm that there was a notice that went out on the state water board's 
once through cooling, it's under the oceans issues. It is. um, it's the same Lyris list that was used for the notifications last year. Mayor Brand, maybe we can have uh, staff uh, reach out to you afterwards and we'll try to figure out why you or our key staff at the city did not uh, receive that notification in case there was some sort of technical issue. But we did have a number of speakers who made it there. And like I said, we did confirm that the, the electronic notification did go out to everybody that's on our once through cooling list. Well, I thought it was on it and so did our many other people <laughs> and we didn't receive it. But I did want to point out that we went to go look at the video of the meeting and it's not there. Uh, the May 18th meeting, if you click on the link to view it, it gives you the May 21st meeting. And if you click on the May 21st meeting, it gives you the May 21st meeting. So we were unable to look. Okay. I was unable to look at the May 18th meeting before I came We'll make on. sure that's posted. Yeah, we'll make sure that's definitely posted. All, thank of, our, you. all of our meetings are, are archived that way. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate Harris, the flag. Well, I did have, I did notice that the video was incorrect and I already have requested it to be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. And thank you again, Mayor. Uh, next, we have Scott Fahey. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to th I'd like to thank the board and uh, the State Water Resource Control Board chair and its members for this opportunity to speak today at the public forum. My name is George Scott Fahey. I reside at 2787 Stony Fork Way, Boise, Idaho. Uh, today I'm requesting a confirmation of diver diversion curtailment exemption for permit numbers 20, 784, and 21289. The permittee is Sugar Pine Springwater LP. The points of diversion are upstream from New Don Pedro Reservoir and the Tuolumne River watershed. The purpose of use is industrial. The place of use is off-site state licensed water bottling plants and the season of use is year round. Item 10 of the executive director's report presented to the board last week, May 18th, 2021 states, quote, due to the critically dry conditions throughout the Delta watershed and the projection of insufficient supplies to meet water demand, the state water board is likely to issue notices of water unavailability for all post 1914 appropriated water right holders in the Delta watershed as early as, unquote, this month, this month, June 2021. Therefore, as the manager of Sugar Pine Springwater's general partner, I, am respect, I respectfully request the State Water Board confirm the Sugar Pine Springwater diversions are exempt from curtailment and shall be lawful during this year's foreseen curtailment, unless all pre-1914 diverters upstream of New Don Pedro Reservoir are ordered to curtail all their storage and diversions. The Sugar Pine permits authorize year-round diversion. Annually, pursuant to decision 1594 and decision 995, the Tuolumne River is considered a fully appropriated stream from June 16th to October 31st. Nonetheless, by exchange, Sugar Pine Springwater has the right to divert pre-1914 non-jurisdictional waters in accordance with Division II of the Water Code. If the State Water Board issues a notice of water unavailability for all post-1914 appropriated water rights holders in the San Joaquin watershed, then the Tuolumne River shall be de deemed fully appropriated. Nonetheless, in accordance with Division II of the Water Code, Sugar Pine has been authorized to use a physical solution exchange, which allows Sugar Pine to lawfully divert when the Tuolumne River is a fully appropriated stream. I have provided a chart to assist the board in its analysis of the fact of this matter. The Stanford Vena appellate decision states the issue of a subsequent curtailment order requires the State Water Board determination that amounts to a, I quote, quasi adjudicative application of the emergency regulations to the facts in this situation, New Don Pedro Reservoir, at the time a curtailment order is issued, unquote. By analyzing the facts of this matter, one can see 21.6 acre feet have been provided by Sugar Pine this year to meet its annual FAS diversion replacement exchange 
exchange requirements pursuant to turn 19 permit 2784 and 39 acre feet of replacement water has been provided in advance and credited to future replacement water requirements pursuant pursuant to term 20 of permit 2784 and term 34 of permit 21289. Thereby, one of the two issues paramount, of paramount importance to, to be met ha, have been, has been met. Not a single downstream diverter shall be harmed by Sugar Pine's lawful diversions of water during the upcoming curtailment period foreseen by the State Water Board. The second issue, the public trust must not be harmed. In 2011, a comprehensive objective survey of the riparian vegetation at, Sugar Pines, at the Sugar Pine Spring sites began. That survey was completed in 2016. That time frame encompassed the 2014 and 2015 drought and the impacts of the 2013 rim fire. Additionally, sugar pine was continually diverting from its springs at that time. The survey concluded those diversions caused no harm to the springs repairing vegetation. Therefore, sugar, pardon me, therefore, the State Water Board accepted the surveys as compliant with and in completion of that, requ uh, that requirement. Mr. Fahey, I apologize, yeah. but um, we're a bit at time and I, okay, I don't think I have one able more to resolve. Paragraph. I have one more paragraph. Um, Okay. Sugar pine. Please, uh, go quickly. Yes. Sugar pine requires a curtailment exception to ensure it provides its customers the continuity of service expected within the state of California's bottled water industry. I sent Mr. Robert Cervantes a letter dated April 2nd regarding this matter. Please have the state water employee authorized to issue a curtailment exception. Contact me. Time is of the essence with regards to this matter, which I would like to resolve prior to the board issuing its next notice of curtailment. Thank you for the record. I will send a copy of this to the clerk of the board. And now I'd be glad to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Fahey. I don't believe we have any questions at this point. We're not prepared to talk about your matter, but I appreciate the flag. And uh, more importantly, do follow back up with our uh, water rights staff. So thank you, Mr. Fahey. Pardon me, sir. Um, could you please have someone that has the authority to issue an, a curtailment exception contact me so we can start appropriate Mr. Fahey, discussions? Mr. Mr. Fahey, thank you. Mr. Fahey, thank you. Our water rights staff will be in contact and uh, attempt to uh, respond to your, your concern. There are many as well, though, so I think we're going to have to beg a little time as well as we uh, circle back with you. I don't know if Mr. Lawfer has anything further, but um, at this point, I don't think there's I'll just note that uh, can, uh, Deputy on. Director so, Ekdahl is on the on the line and has been listening, and so I'll reach out to him and make sure we have the appropriate folks follow up with Mr. Fahey. Thank, Thank you very much. Offer. Appreciate Thank it. You, Appreciate it as well. Next, we have uh, Regina Chichazola. Hi, um, thank you for let, good morning. Thank you for letting me speak during public comment. And I uh, apologize for the background. My kid is in here and we're in a hotel coming back from vacation. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to talk real quick. I'm sure as many of you are aware, um, there has been a juvenile fish kill that is ongoing in the Klamath River where we're losing all of our juvenile salmon this year. Um, this isn't the first time this has happened. We pretty much have no salmon coming back for the last six years in a row. Um, and it's just a devastating situation for our community. Um, and so based on this, I know there's nothing we can do at this point about these dead fish and it's just really depressing. However, there is a lot we can do in other situations and into tributaries of the Klamath River. Um, so I have some suggestions. Um, one of them is I am again asking if there could be emergency regulations on the Scott and Shasta River in order and some curtailments um, that are not just voluntary. I don't believe all the farmers will only do voluntary curtailments. Um, in order to save at least the um, Scott and Shasta coho and Chinook salmon. Um, also, there's a chance of maybe having the irrigation season end early this year because the farmers there are going for more cuttings rather than less during the drought because they can make more money that way because there is no curtailments happening at this point. And I do know you have sent out notices. I'm just saying, please follow through 
and not and be prepared to uphold um, the new um, requirements, at least in the Scott for um, for how much flow needs to be in the river to keep salmon alive that just got transmitted to you from Fish and Wildlife Service, I mean, from fish, Cal Fish and Wildlife. Um, so that's what I'm, we're asking for in the Scott and Shasta. There is a TMDL in the Shasta that does allow for flow too. Um, and then um, you're probably aware, but we recently are submitted a proposal to the board on to how to better regulate the flows coming out of both the Shasta Reservoir and the Trinity Reservoir. Um, as you're aware, sometimes when the Trinity water is um, transferred too late in the year into the Sacramento River, it actually warms up the Sacramento River and adds to fish kills for winter run salmon. Um, and as you know, a recent release of warm water for winter run salmon led to very sick adult salmon um, and some of them dying that um, from warm water that was released by the Bureau of Reclamation. So I think that's just an example of how that warm water can really impact. Um, it, um, that wasn't Trinity release, but still it's an example of how that warm water can really impact the salmon and how much that temperature regulation really matters. Um, so we do have a plan that has been submitted to the board now on how to better regulate the way that the Trinity and Sacramento releases happen. And it does call for less releases in order to protect carryover storage, but in light of climate change, it's just something that's going to have to be dealt with at some point. And I know that there are climate change plans um, for water rights right now, and um, I have read that and submitted comments. However, those are mainly dealing with um, new water right applications. And the case is, is that we had an over allocated system even before climate change became so impactful and we were dealing with pretty much like con almost constant droughts. I, I can't, there's been only a few years that weren't considered droughts over the last 10 years. So um, I just think it's really important that we look at this proposal we're turning in with um, the California S Sports Fish and Protection Alliance and just think about how do we better release water? How do we better protect our carryover storage in our ma major reservoirs? And how can this help both the Klamath River through the Trinity system and the Sacramento River systems? Because those are our salmon powerhouses and those are where our commercial fishermen and um, our tribal communities really rely on to make sure that we have salmon and they're facing extinction. Um, and so then my last comment, and I'm going to try to wrap up even before my time, if possible, is I really think it's time to look at the water rights system and paper water and over allocation of water, even if that means at looking at pre-1914 water rights. Um, the way these water rights were given out, I truly believe is inherently unfair and fairly racist. I mean, it, they're from a time that women weren't even allowed to own land or vote and people of color didn't own land. And, you know, they were still taking native people's lands. Um, so, you know, some of these are really unreasonable uses, um, you know, flood irrigating alfalfa, things like that with these pre-1914 water rights. And in order for fair, you know, when you have cities struggling for water, but then people are unreasonably using it above them, then it's time to redo the system and relook at the system. So those are my three agenda, three items I wanted to bring up. Scott and Shasta water contaminants and emergency regulations, the flow plan that we're turning in for the Shasta and Trinity, and um, looking at water rights and climate change and how to change the system in a way that's more equitable and fair for Californians. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chichazola. I appreciate your engagement and your comments this morning. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have Linda Hardy, but Ms. Hardy may not be on the platform. Uh, is that still the case, Mr. Lawfer? It is. Uh, however, I will note, Chair Esquivel, that we do have one individual who came into the Zoom platform as Scarlett, and we have not been able to yet tie them to a speaker card. So uh, if you happen to be, oh, I understand who it is now, so <laughs> we'll take care of renaming shortly. Okay. Um, so yes, that's correct. Uh, Linda is not on. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on. And uh, uh, Ms. Hardy, if you are viewing uh, via one of the web streams and aren't on the platform here, um, take a look at your email. There are instructions on how to get here. Um, next, we'll call up then Amber Maywald. Ms. Maywald, you should have been invited uh, at this time to either share your camera and unmute. Good morning. 
Miss Mayweather, I'll try one more time unmuting. I think, unfortunately, we have multiple people who are trying to assist you in unmuting. Okay. We're working over there. We are. Now. I think you're, you may be there now. But, uh, I apologize. Hear? Okay, now we can hear you. Yes, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Sorry for the technical delay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I just want to check um, about this. Um, agenda or this item, I'm wondering if it's on the agenda, but it's um, echoing the last speaker about the reclam Reclamation Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. Is that on the agenda today or is that- We will have, we will have, some, we will have some discussion on the drought item. Um, we actually have representatives from Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources to discuss the temporary urgency change petition on that drought item. Um, and would we could uh, and and there will be discussion obviously I think a bit on Shasta management because it's all one system at this you know very much so at this point. Okay. So, so I'm saying if you would like to if would you would like to hold for the drought item you can or you can provide your comment now quickly. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll provide my comment now since I'm since I'm on. Um, yeah. So echoing the last speaker, um, we live in the Trinity. River watershed. Um, I've been a resident here for 20 years. Um, the entire community is absolutely devastated and concerned about what's happening with the salmon right now. I mean, you're gonna have thousands and thousands of people and constituents um, just absolutely just angry and devastated if this um, salmon situation is allowed to go on. Um, the fact that you've got like 89% of juvenile salmon that are infected <clears throat> with um, bacteria from warm water temperatures that are dying now. I mean, we're talking about a keystone species and I think that it's gonna be a travesty if the water board does not address this appropriately. Um, if, if another big salmon kill is allowed to happen this year, you're gonna be facing an extinction of a, of a keystone species I mean, this is a keystone species for an entire ecosystem, okay? We're talking about eagles, bears, um, not to mention the human impacts on the economy of the recreational opportunities that sport salmon fishing provides, um, as well as the commercial fishing industry off the coast. Um, so <clears throat> again, I'd just like to say that <clears throat> I think a lot of people are extremely concerned. A lot of people may not know how to make their voices heard but the voices you're hearing today might just be a few, but there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that want to see the situation addressed um, appropriately and swiftly and decisively. So I would just encourage, my, my, my main point here is that I would highly encourage the water board to, um, to not approve the current reclamation Sacramento river temperature management plan but instead to adopt and approve the alternative water operations plan that has been submitted to you, the CSPA, alternative water operations plan that has been submitted to you that will regulate the water temperatures in the Sacramento, the Trinity and the Klamath rivers throughout the season to make sure that we do not have a salmon die off, that we do not see the species go extinct. And, you know, I think that it's important to take into consideration that climate change is very much um, man-made and there is that impact, but even within the face of climate change and these extreme droughts, humans have the option to make choices in the moment about how that's going to affect the world, how it's going to affect the ecosystems, affect animals, affect people's lives. So I really encourage you to prioritize this species, the salmon species, the water temperatures in the Trinity, the Klamath, Sacramento rivers and do the right thing in this situation. So thank you for your time. Thank you as well, Ms. Mayball. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, next we have Linda Webb. Good morning, Chair Esquivel. Good morning. Thank you for letting me be here. I'll be brief and I don't need to show my mug here today. What I have instead is the Bear River rocks in the Shasta River. Um, when agriculture decided to turn up its water 
uh, onto its fields this weekend while no one was working and no one was looking, they thought, but Friends of the Shasta River was watching the gauges and when we saw it plummet to below six cubic feet per second, which is a trickle, um, one of our members went out and took pictures. This is Bear River rocks right down in the, the bottom of the river with a lot of algae on top of it because of course the water had been allowed to get warm and grow all that algae, which also hurt the salmon. Um, this is an emergency and it calls for emergency curtailment of ag water and it can't be voluntary. We see here this evidence this weekend of what ag does when things are voluntary. And that picture tells the whole story. We need it now before we kill everything in this river. And you, I believe you do have the power to act on that. I hope you'll do it soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webb. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, next, we have David Webb. Thank you. Um, Good morning. I, I was hoping, okay, and, and Janine has, has, has allowed me to share some pictures, which I apologize for getting in late. I want to speak to the dewatering event uh, as a member of the Friends of the Shasta River and, and point out, which I have before, that the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the entity that sets harvest and allocates fish to the various people that depend on them, has since the beginning of its tenure here, identified the Shasta River as the important, most important tributary to the Klamath River. And we have taken this tributary and we are beating it to death. If you look at these two gauges, we, uh, I wanna start with the top one, the Shasta River near Montague, this is approximately river mile 13. You can see that starting on the 28th, uh, flows in the Shasta started dropping precipitously. That's Friday the 28th, just leading into the weekend. And by Saturday the 29th, they had bottomed out at five and three quarters cubic feet per second. They then began to rise as the water master began to try to wrest control of the river again and get emergency water from senior water users who shouldn't have had to deal with it. And by the 30th at, at river mile 13, back to where she normally keeps things around 20 cubic feet per second to serve downstream irrigation, not to serve fish. The, the lower chart, the Shasta River near Wairika, you can see that that low flow event had moved downstream for those 13 miles very, very slowly, leaving aquatic organisms on the banks, drying in the 90 degree sun, all the way until nearly 24 hours later when that low flow event finally reached the mouth of the river. Now the next page, please. And if you can rotate it right one, one turn. Looking upstream, what we can see is that at, at river mile 25, there was more than ample water in the river. There was over 80 cubic, 84 cubic feet per second at river mile 25. So this was not a complete lack of water in the system problem. This is a management problem. And, and the problem that we are faced with is that we have a broken adjudication. We have a water master who can and will do an exemplary job, or she is dedicated to doing a perfect job to the extent she is able. We have an adjudication dating back to 1932, which does not include riparian users who can exercise their rights willy-nilly, no matter what the other conditions might be, and are able to apparently dry up the river if they get around to it. We have an adjudication which has no provision for in-stream flows for aquatic organisms. And we have an adjudication which no one locally can afford to address, either because of the social costs of, of tipping over the apple cart or the financial costs of tackling an adjudication which undoubtedly will be very contentious if it gets changed. We need your help to tackle that tough issue that, we, that was preventing us from doing anything to improve conditions in the Shasta River. Even 1707 dedications are being held hostage to this broken adjudication, which will not allow the water master to shepherd 1707 dedications beyond the mouths of the tributaries from which they originate. And so instead of being able to take water to the mouth as some de dedicators want to do, they are trapped, leaving it only reaching the mouths of the tributaries they're dedicating the water from. We absolutely need your help addressing this fundamental antiquated, non-functional adjudication that we cannot fix ourselves locally. 
It has to happen soon. It has to happen now. Thank you very much. It was well, Mr. Webb. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, next, we have Isaac Kinney. Aikui. Aikui. Nick, now Isaac Kinney. Wage push as he pet tooth as he earthly girt, but one match up as he wage push up. Hello, my name is Isaac Kinney. A uh, lot to go off of. Um, but uh, again, wanting to start with uh, the California state uh, still does not have the, the clearest path to title. And the if infrastructure built uh, with that lack of clear path to title uh, is, is uh, invalid in my, in my uh, opinion. And as a business owner, uh, by not addressing uh, your decisions as a board, with the Governor Newsom's Truth and he uh, Truth and Healing uh, Commission is again continuing an economic apartheid on Indigenous peoples of California as well as Indigenous peoples brought to California. Uh, understanding that all of our environmental justice and all of our uh, environmental related decisions still need a social justice component to them, and still need a, a, a threshold that we need to meet for that social justice to create equity, not just here in California, but because of our markets here in California are international, we need to make sure that what we're doing is in good faith. Everything that the state of California up to this point has all been taking without taking responsibility. This is continuing to be a pattern where the state of California continues to take life systems from the natural environment. However, not taking responsibility for the uh, demise of the environment. And so this is a big part of that still needs to go into the decision, especially because the infrastructure you're deciding on today was built without the uh, prior and uh, informed consent of the indigenous peoples of California, as well as the indigenous peoples living in California. California has the most populated, is the most populated state in the United States. And because it was built invalid, that is why there's so much uh, bigger markets. That's why there's so much of these bigger investments that these type of large scale projects and, and regionalization is still being used to stretch and to uh, really, to really just again, uh, extract. Um, and so the extraction of water, uh, the extraction of, sorry, one second. The extraction uh, of water needs to stop uh, for the combined fish kills happening right now. Uh, the extraction needs to stop to make sure that future generations understand what culture is. Uh, decisions to ensure that water users uh, for big agriculture, for big unstable obsolete infrastructure uh, is actually impeding on my religion because the water is tied to my religion. This is again, another legal ramification that the state of California is not taking into account and needs to. The fish kills are a huge part to not just indigenous peoples, but to markets, economies, and all communities, not just in California, but because of our proximity to Bay Area and Southern California markets, what we do here in California has a trickle effect everywhere, whether it be in the Pacific, whether it be in the Atlantic, whether it be in Europe, making sure that we're doing what we need to do to get outside of what is the status quo, and it will, be, it will be outside of the status quo because of the decisions of California regarding water have been so bad. This is where the status quo does not work. And so this is where I do want to challenge to make sure that give you support if you as a board need more information to stop taking water and the reasoning for stop taking water, we can for sure help you out with that. Uh, but again, without 
including at the decision-making level, indigenous business owners like myself, California tribes at the local, state, and federally recognized levels is continuing an apartheid. If you aren't sure, this education system is a big part of where we're at today. And making sure that the infrastructure changes is a big part of the water of what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today- Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kenny, I apologize. Uh, you've hit uh, about five minutes here. I appreciate your comments this morning. Just thank you. Wow, that was five minutes already. Well, hey, that's what it is. Uh, just stop taking the water, uh, knock it off because it's a bigger issue than I think what you guys are really trying to do. If you're really trying to, to you know, create good, healthy communities, you know, you have to take the indigenous people's lead. You have to make sure that they're in the room and making the, de the decisions. The state of California is inferior to tribal rights. And that needs to be clear in your decision making as a board. If we don't Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Justice, I appreciate it. Oh, got, gotcha. Is my time up? Yeah, time's up. I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Hey, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Uh, next, we have Nancy Kui Kendall. Um, you just asked to unmute me. This is Regina. It's the wrong one. Sorry. Good morning. Hello? Yes, good morning. I'm on now. Okay, great. You Thank are. you so much. Um, my name's Nancy Kirkendall. I live up here in Northern California. Um, and I wanted to first say that um, I think that the Bureau of Reclamation Central Valley uh, Project Operations on the Sacramento and Trinity Klamath River systems could result in extinction of um, probably several cold water spawning fish. And um, I do support the alternative plan that the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance has presented. Um, I, it's an emergency now. Uh, we're an emergency every year here with our fish in Northern California, it seems over for more than 20 years, uh, it seems that we're always um, afraid that we're just gonna lose the entire resource. And um, the whole system could come crashing down. The, the fish are the basis of the entire ecosystem here. They provide health in, in the forest and in the ocean. Um, plus uh, they um, are, you know, the foundation for uh, numerous uh, native cultural um, beliefs and systems here. Um, so I just think that I, I do support um, a lot of the things that Regina was saying is, you know, some of these water rights holders, their rights need to be curtailed. These rights were over allocated in the past. They were never allocated fairly in the first place. And um, we're going to lose some of our beneficial uses in um, these, uh, these rivers and creeks uh, because people are drawing too much. People have feet, we have wheels. We can move where we can get more water if we're dying. You know, we're not gonna die out. But, um, you know, like Vandana Shiva said, extinction is the death of birth and all of California's native fish are really on the edge now. Our environment is really on the edge. Our native peoples are suffering, like the last speaker was saying. And um, I just, I just hope that uh, in every decision that you make, you remember that um, you know if you're in the ICU, you don't want to get sent home with band aids and vitamins. You know, you want it to be taken care of like it's an emergency. And our fish stocks are in an emergency situation. We need to look at, at things we might not have done in the past, you know, like curtailing water rights uh, uses, at least temporarily, uh, while we're in an emergency condition. Um, farms can be planted later, replanted. Uh, factories can be restarted when they have the water, but fish can never be 
uh, recreated if we kill them all off, if we kill off the whole ecosystem. And um, I just hope that all of your decisions, that you really think about that, that we are in this critical time of a sixth mass, extinct, mass extinction. And I know that you've got a lot of laws and policies and all these things and all these people who want you to do something uh, that may be different than that. But I just hope that you're that all of the board members and are always considering um, that the continuation of life is what is the most important here. And we, if we kill off the fish, you know, we're clearly next, you know, they, they were here in millions and we could be gone as well. And uh, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time today. Thank you. I appreciate your time as well this morning, Ms. Kui Dendel. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Robert Gaddis. There we go. Good um, good morning, Water Board members. Uh, my name is Robert Gaddis. I'm a resident of Redondo Beach. Uh, as Mayor Brand mentioned, uh, in October, this board will rule on whether or not AES Redondo power plant will be extended for another two years. As you know, the AES power plant is surrounded by the most densely populated cities on the California coast, uh, Redondo Beach and Hermosa Beach. Uh, over 20,000 California citizens uh, and taxpayers live within a mile radius of the plant. This 70 year old power plant burns fossil fuels, polluting the air with hundreds of tons of poisons and deadly particulates. Um, it also uses ocean water to cool its generators, polluting millions of gallons and killing a large amount and a wide variety of aquatic life. The general assumption among the residents of California is that important decisions such as the one before you are weighed objectively. The ban on ex parte communication has the appearance of supporting the idea that this is an objective decision. Let me read for you, um, for the public, a brief email exchange between regional water board staff and AES, a $10 billion fossil fuel energy company based in Virginia and the operator of the AES Redondo power plant. This email exchange was recently obtained by a Redondo Beach resident through a public records request. Uh, this uh, first email is from Corey McKinley of AES and it's to uh, Thomas Seibels at waterboards.ca.gov. And uh, now I'm quoting him, Thomas et al. AES would like to provide a big thank you for some excellent work today during the entire renewal process. We are truly grateful for the tremendous effort and dedication put forward in the renewal of both permits and TSOs. We would like to thank the entire regional board staff, executive staff and council for their hard work in achieving this goal. Sincerely, Corey McKinley of AES. The response uh, from Chris Morris uh, at, uh, at the uh, Water Board staff. Um, and this is a response to AES from uh, the Water Board staff. Thank you so much. I believe most of the credit goes to Tom for his dedication to this project and his accumulated knowledge and experience. Thank you, Tom, Chris. Clearly this email exchange raises the question of who is the Water Board staff working for? the residents and taxpayers who pay their salaries or this Virginia-based fossil fuel energy company. Given that water board staff appear to be working diligently with and on behalf of AES, we, the residents who live next to the power plant, appear to be at a disadvantage in this matter before you, a matter that affects our lives. Uh, I think this should be rectified going forward, and I think you should consider staff subjectivity or lack thereof in your decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaddis. I'll just say I have full faith in our staff and their objectivity, and but I appreciate the flag of the email. Thank you, Mr. Gaddis. Uh, next, we have Jessica Law. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Esquivel. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I understand that you are addressing drought later in the agenda. Um, so thanks for letting me take a few minutes just to 
frame up some of the issues uh, from the Sacramento region. My comments are not specific to a TUCP or the Shasta Temperature Management Plan, uh, but they're just more general uh, regarding uh, this year and the decisions that the board and other state and federal agencies have to make. So as you know, Folsom Reservoir plays a critical role in the statewide water supply system during drought. We recognize and support the efforts of state and federal agencies to balance the statewide system in this really critical year, maintaining public health and safety, water supply, power and energy generation, and endangered species projections or protections are placing competing demands on a very complex and stressed system. Our top priority here in this region is to protect the capacity of Folsom Reservoir to provide reliable water supplies and sustain recreation, aesthetic, and ecological health of the Lower American River. All of this without placing unnecessary risk on water supplies for fish and people, not just for this region, but statewide. Reclamation, the Bureau of Reclamation will really need the flexibility to implement real-time management of Folsom Reservoir and the Lower American River. Um, and we support the actions that uh, identified by Reclamation and DWR in the Drought Action Plan that was released last Friday. State and federal agencies will also need to take action to protect the health of the Lower American River, specifically guarding uh, to protect steelhead and fall run Chinook from lethal conditions. After the last drought, the Water Forum um, worked with Reclamation to implement an improved flow management standard that balances reservoir and river conditions throughout the water year. We demonstrated through an extensive biological rationale, which has been uh, presented to the, the Water Board uh, in a previous occasion, on how to opt optimize releases of cold water to protect fish on the Lower American River and avoid or minimize redirected impacts to the Sacramento River fish. We've been working very closely with state and federal agencies over the past several months and very intensely over the past several weeks to develop and refine temperature modeling and a reservoir release plan that will help balance uh, conditions for fish and water supply. Our preliminary results indicate that reclamation will not be able to maintain the temperature thresholds required in the biological opinion of 2019, that's 68 degrees, to support steelhead salmon, but that 69 to 70 degrees is more likely. Um, I just want to reiterate that reclamation will need the regulatory flexibility to implement alternative actions that can improve conditions for fish species and maintain storage in Folsom. Uh, and the Water Forum is committed to continuing to provide scientific expertise, everything from temperature modeling, uh, fisheries expertise in hydrology, um, and consensus-based recommendations to support the state and federal agency team in decision-making and protect the environment of the Lower American River. So thank you for your time, that's, that's it. Thank you as well, I appreciate your comments this morning. Thank you, Ms. Law. Next, uh, we have Dan, uh, Backer? Bacher, I apologize. Yes, yeah, that's Dan Bacher. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I'm the, I'm a, a long time investigative journalist focusing on water environmental justice and fish for over 35 years. And I strongly urge the board to adopt the emergency water plan submitted by the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, California Water Impact Network, and save California salmon. The CSBA plan will reduce Sacramento water river temperatures and significantly increase salmon survival in the following ways. Number one, limit June through October releases from Shasta and Keswick dams to 5,000 CFS using Shasta's cold water pool to maintain Keswick releases at less than 54 um, degrees. Um, two, eliminate June through October use of the Spring Creek power tunnel between Whiskey Town and Keswick reservoirs. And number three, maintain June through October flows of 300 CFS to Whiskey Town reservoir through the Cal car powerhouse increase uh, June, October releases to Clear Creek to 300 CFS and increase June, October releases from Trinity and Lewiston dams to the lower Trinity River, the main and biggest tributary of the Klamath to um, at less than um, um, to uh, 800 to 870 CFS. 
um, I want to remind the board members that the dire drought situation that we are currently in, um, where adult winter run Chinook salmon are now dying before spawning on the Sacramento River below Keswick Dam, and juvenile salmon are dying on the Klamath River has been greatly exacerbated due to poor water management by the state and federal governments over the past decade and decades previous to that one, to the last one. And eight out of the past 10 years, the combined water exports from the state and federal projects have exceeded the 3 million acre feet export figure that many believe to be the maximum amount of water that can be exported from the Delta without destroying the ecosystem and harming fish species. And every year, except to 2014 and 2015, the state and federal water projects ex exported well over 3 million acre feet of water from the Delta. And this um, directly correlates with the expansion of almonds um, acreage by powerful growers like Lyndon Stewart Resnick throughout the valley. Um, the uh, 3 million acre feet figure of water exports in all years is a key recommendation of the Environmental Water Caucus updated solutions, water solutions plan titled a sustainable water plan for California. In fact, 2011, was the all time record export year with 6.67 million acre feet of water diverted from the Delta. I mean, this is the, the largest amount of water ever, ever diverted from the Delta um, since the, the state and federal projects started. And this was fo closely followed um, behind just four years ago by the 6.5 four million acre feet of water exported in 2017. 2018 saw 4.62 million acre feet of water exported from the Delta, while 2019 saw 5.3 million acre feet exported. And last year, 2020 saw 3.65 million acre feet exported. Now, if the state doesn't have enough water to maintain carryover storage so that salmon can successfully spawn and juvenile fish can outmigrate, we end up in the situation, the dire situation of extinction that we're now in. I mean, fish kills are occurring right now and it, it will get worse in the summer and fall unless the water board uh, does something and adopts this plan. Again, I urge the board to adopt the emergency water plan submitted by the three groups. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Bucker. Uh, next, we have James Dunlap. I believe Mr. Richardson is not on the platform here with us currently. Um, then we have Sherry Norris and Tom uh, Stokely. Um, I, I will say, we, I apologize, I probably should have um, cut us uh, a little shy of five minutes here so we can quickly get through public forum. Um, so if uh, folks can uh, be a little speedy, it would be helpful for us to try to get onto our, our items here. But Mr. Dunlap. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman uh, and board members. Um, 480,000, um, that's a number I'd like you to, to try and keep in mind. Um, I know that uh, a lot of your uh, appointments uh, have been longstanding. Your expertise is, is not in question. Um, my big concern is uh, a, somewhat of a follow-up of the long fin smelt that was recent, recently listed as uh, extinct in the Bay Area Delta. Um, and I'm, I'm frightened. Well, it, it was recently filed, excuse me, um, as extinct in the Bay Area Delta. Um, and uh, they're looking to attach the water. Um, <clears throat> what do you need? What does the board need to take action and to enforce 
current board policies. Um, I know the Shasta, the Scott, um, these rivers um, have uh, stringent guidelines that aren't being followed, that aren't being for enforced. What, what is it that the board needs to, 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 to adamantly follow and preserve um, this fisheries? Um, I'm a Yurok tribal fisherman. Um, I have not had a commercial fishery in, in quite a few years. Um, I remember uh, as a kid, uh, all of the fish, uh, the surfish, the candlefish, they've all gone away. Um, my concern it goes back to that number, that 480,000. That's the number of years it's taken our salmon to acclimate to the creeks and the streams in which they live and which they spawn. We don't have another 480,000 years for those fish to redevelop and um, acclimate to those creeks. Um, you know, and, and that's my concern. Um, uh, you guys do a, a, a job that, you know, puts you between the rock and the hard place. There's no question about that. Um, and that's my concern is what can we do to help you to enforce the rules and regulations that are designed to preserve and protect the fisheries, uh, the aquatic life, the ecosystems that you guys have been, um, uh, have taken on that responsibility. And I know that you can't just uh, wash away or, or wipe away the responsibility to the agriculture department. It's a, you know, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, it has us at odds um, because there's nobody, there's not that many people with deep pockets fighting for the fish as they are for almond profits. You know, the third consecutive year of uh, almond profits, record-breaking almond profits in a drought year. I, I would like to see a moratorium put on those uh, almond uh, uh, orchards that are, that are continuing to pop up everywhere. It's the big cash crop. Uh, another big issue I have is all of the unallocated water for marijuana grows. I attended the water summit several years ago um, and I was promised or I was told that uh, enforcement for these illegal diversions, uh, not only for the in creek taking of water, the groundwater, um, but also the winter water would be addressed. And I don't think any of these uh, issues have been taken into account. We've got large scale pot crops that are legal, but they're unallocated water. Um, these creeks, uh, th these grows, um, they can't support the hundreds, if not thousands of grows on the Klamath and, and Trinity watersheds. Um, the, uh, the chemical runoff, the water quality, uh, the water temperatures, um, you know, they're all directly related, I believe, it, not only into the agriculture up the Scott and Shasta rivers, but also involving uh, the massive amounts of minor grows that are scattered throughout the area. Um, and I, I really hope that, uh, you know, that you can bring forth some ideas um, in which the population and the members can help you do your job better. Um, thank you, Mr. Dunlap. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your time and your comments this morning. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sherry Norris. Hi, I'm coming in. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, good, morning. Good, good to um, be here with the water board virtually and hopefully someday we'll see you all in person again. Um, I'm just here um, to also echo and, and support what my colleagues have been saying about the need to take care of the salmon and my huge concern that while salmon are going extinct that the almonds are being uh, and, and other ag crops are, crops are being prioritized because these ag crops can be replaced once we lose our salmon, if, when they, if they become extinct, they cannot be replaced. So I wanna remind the water board of all of the work that the tribes did with you 
and many other stakeholders to complete the Water Quality Control Board Plan for Inland Surface Waters in Closed Bays and Estuaries of California for tribal and subsistence fishing, beneficial uses and mercury provisions. And thank you for adopting that resolution in 2017. And what that connects to today is that the water quality objectives related to those tribal beneficial uses uh, include the combination of eating fish and salmon, as you'll remember. And because wild caught salmon are naturally low in mercury, wild caught salmon, um, when we lose salmon, we're, we're unable to meet that uh, beneficial use and that criterion that was established for you not that long ago or by you not that long ago. Um, the, it's, it's extremely important that tribes are able to eat fish and also salmon. Salmon are carrying that burden for us in the state of California where we have, of course, mercury in our waters left over from the gold rush. And you remember that SIA gives information to tribal families and low income families um, and the doctors that serve them and the women, infant and children clinics as well. Omega-3 fatty acids that are in these fish um, have health benefits that you cannot replace with any other uh, supplement. So I really want to in, impress upon you the urgency of making sure that we have salmon as we move forward. And we are at a critical moment. And please, you are the backstop. We need you, Water Board. We, this is the time. This is the time to step up and take care of, of, the, of the families that are fishing, the families that are low income, the tribal families for all the future of the future generations for having salmon in this water body, please. The ag can be replaced. The salmon cannot. Please help us. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you, Ms. Norris. Thank you for your time this morning. Mm -hmm. And last, we have Tom Stokely. Thank you, members of the board. I'm Tom Stokely from Mount Shasta, California. I'm with Save California Salmon. Um, I've been watching these temperature issues for over 30 years. And I strongly urge you to reject the Bureau of Reclamation's temperature management plan and instead adopt the CSPA, CWIN, Save California Salmon temperature management plan. Um, this all started back in the late 80s when the state board through water quality order 8918 said that the Bureau's temperatures would be controlled through water rights rather than through waste discharge requirements. Uh, back then, we were told in the early 90s during the, that, that drought that uh, the cold Trinity water was needed to be diverted to the Sacramento River to save the winter run Chinook salmon. It turned out through some investigation that that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, even though Trinity River water as it's let out of Trinity Dam is very cold, it heats up as it moves through Lewiston Reservoir and then as it's moved towards the Sacramento River through Whiskey Town Reservoir, it warms significantly. Uh, we've looked at temperature differentials between the Spring Creek Power Plant and Shasta Dam releases, and they average about five degrees different uh, where the Spring Creek water is much warmer than the Shasta water. Uh, normally, the Trinity water is cold enough, but with the storage low and the weather heating up, uh, we're seeing temperatures uh, during summer months in the high 50s. Uh, this creates a lot of power, uh, but the key thing about our plan, and I did help develop it with uh, CSPA and CWIN, is that it reserves another half a million acre feet in storage, about 200,000 acre feet more in Shasta and about 300,000 acre feet in Trinity. So this water would not be lost to fish, but in fact, by conserving water, and saving water for another year of drought, you'll also be saving salmon in the Sacramento River and the Trinity River and the Lower Klamath River. Uh, these are really uh, unprecedented times. All the forecasts that the, the inflow uh, are, the water's actually coming in at lesser amounts than what was predicted. Uh, every day Shasta goes down, every day Trinity goes down. And I hope that you will uh, do the right thing and adopt the CSPA plan and reject the Bureau's plan because you're really looking at presiding over an extinction event here. And I think it's uh, very important for you to uh, adopt that plan. So I won't delay you any further, but if your staff has any questions for us, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Mr. Stokely. I appreciate your time this morning and the submittal. Thank you. 
Uh, that concludes public forum now and appreciate everyone's time and uh, patience this morning as we uh, got through public comments. Next, we'll move on to uh, actual board business. And the first item is our consideration of the board meeting minutes from the May 18th board meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll move adoption of the minutes. Second. I'll second. Ms. Townsend, can you please call a roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Board Member Dodek. I'll abstain. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, the vote carries and the board meeting minutes are adopted. Next, uh, we'll go to our uncontested items, uh, which is just a single item number two. Uh, Ms. Townsend, is it still uncontested? Yes, it is, sir. All right. Uh, just wanna thank everyone for their good work and the regional board for all of this. Uh, and if we have a motion, we can uh, adopt. Yeah, I'll move to adopt item number two. Second. second. Uh, thank you both. Ms. Townsend, can you please call the roll call vote? Yes. Board member McGuire. Aye. Board member Firestone. Aye. Board member Dodek. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. And Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. Uh, vote carries as well. And item number two is adopted. And thanks again to the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board for the good work. Uh, next, we uh, move on to item number three, which is an item uh, with our Central Valley Regional Water Board, and it's a consideration of a proposed resolution approving revisions incorporated into the Central Valley Salt and Nitrate Control Program Basin Plan Amendments uh, to the Water Quality Control Plans for the Sacramento River and San Joaquin River Basins and the Tulare Lake Basin. Mouthful of an item. Really appreciate the Regional Board's good work here and our creative um, sort of resolution uh, and, and being able to give some direction and have the region come back uh, with an amendment. And that's this amendment here. Good to see you, Mr. Palupa. Good to see you too. Good morning, good morning. And we'll have uh, Jenny Fuller will be presenting the amendment, but I do wanna um, um, say thank you, uh, Chair Esquivel, members of the board, uh, Kelly PA for helping out with the negotiations as this thing wound its way through. Um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of effort went into this. I think I, I counted in just like a, a bottom line, I think this is about the 18th hearing that we've had on the series of CV SALTS amendments um, in front of the state board and regional board, including some of the ones having to deal with the uh, MUN, the Tulare Lake de-designation, Lower San Joaquin, MUN. And I think this is, this is the big one. This is this is the um, you know should cap off the final CV salts uh, uh, package. There's a couple of stragglers that will probably be raked up in the next couple of years or so. But I, I do want to appreciate all the effort that went into this, um, the amendments to the amendments. And with that, I'll I'll turn it over to Jenny. I think she, I saw her on the on the um, uh, Zoom format here. Thank you. And just you know. Top comment as uh, Jenny comes on, you know, this uh, program is really uh, coming into fruition at a really critical time. Um, you know, we certainly have our safe and affordable program, uh, but we also have drought, as we know, and uh, all these issues are interrelated, uh, including the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So this CV Salts program has to uh, be integrated in all that space. And so just really appreciate the leadership from the region and all others in helping make sure that we uh, have a functioning program, but it also is aware of the many other different components of uh, water management in the basins that um, this impacts. So just thank you for that. And hello. Hey Jenny. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Patrick, and good morning, Chair Esquivel, Vice Chair Diadamo, and members of the State Water Resources Control Board. My name is Jennifer Fuller, and I am a Senior Environmental Scientist in the Rancho Cordova Office of the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. 
I am here today regarding State Water Board consideration of approval of revisions to the salt and nitrate control program amendments to the water quality control plans for the Sacramento River and San Joaquin River basins and the Tulare Lake Basin, which I agree is a mouthful. <laughs> Next slide, please. Before I get started with the main presentation, I wanna provide everyone with a quick summary of why we are here today for the State Water Board to consider the approval of these revisions. The salt and nitrate control program was developed in response to extensive salt and nitrate accumulations in Central Valley waters. These accumulations have human health, economic, and environmental impacts. After the Central Valley Water Board adoption in May of 2018, the Salt and Nitrate Control Program was approved by the State Water Resources Control Board with directed revisions in October of 2019. It was subsequently approved by the Office of Administrative Law in January 2020 and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in November of 2020. Implementation has begun with these approvals and the State Water Board directed revisions have been incorporated along with clarification revisions from the Central Valley Water Board into revised salt and nitrate control program basin plan amendments that were adopted by the Central Valley Water Board in December, 2020. I am here today to present these proposed revisions for consideration of approval. Next slide, please. For our presentation today, I will first discuss a brief summary of the proposed revisions to the Salt and Nitrate Control Program Basin Plan Amendments. These revisions encompass the State Water Board Directed Revisions, the Central Valley Water Board Clarification Revisions, the revisions to the original Basin Plan Amendments based on the review by the US EPA. Next, I will discuss a summary of the pertinent public comments received during the State Water Board public comment period. Lastly, I will discuss Central Valley Water Board staff recommendations and next steps if these revisions are approved today. Next slide, please. I will now discuss a summary of the proposed revisions. Next slide, please. The State Water Board approved the original Salt and Nitrate Control Program Basin Plan Amendments with the stipulation that the Central Valley Water Board make targeted revisions to the Basin Plan Amendments. These re directed revisions are detailed in State Water Board Resolution Number 2019-0057. Among the revisions directed by the State Water Board are changes to the offsets, exceptions, and drought and conservation policies, and the Salinity Variance Program, modification of an overarching program goal to reduce not balance salt and nitrate loading for the Central Valley, inclusion of a maximum limit of 35 years for nitrate exceptions and a goal of 50 years for restoration of basins for nitrate, and inclusion of additional management zone requirements, including a residential sampling program to identify nitrate contamination in domestic wells, and meaningful consultation and review every two years for early action plans and management zone implementation plans. Next slide, please. During the incorporation of the State Water Board directed revisions, the Central Valley Water Board also incorporated clarification revisions to the Salt and Nitrate Control Program Basin Plan Amendments. In addition to minor non-substantive edits, the Central Valley Water Board revisions include specification of site-specific delineation values for the conservative salinity permitting approach, additions of sections to the nitrate control program for consistency with the salt control program, as well as additional timeline specifications, and a correction to a previous oversight in the estimated cost to agriculture section of the original basin plan amendments. The oversight was only a clerical transferring error and the numbers in the original salt and nitrate control program staff report remain correct. Additionally, as is often the case and as authorized by Central Valley Water Board Resolution R5-2020-0057, after the adoption of the revised salt and nitrate control program basin plan amendments, the Central Valley Water Board Executive Officer set a memorandum to the State Water Board on April 28, 2021, 
that detailed minor non-substantive modifications made to the revised basin plan amendments to correct minor clerical errors and improve clarity and consistency. The memorandum is posted on the Central Valley Water Board, Salt and Nitrate Control Program, Revisions webpage, and those corrections will be incorporated into the net basin plans. Next slide, please. Additionally, a minor clerical error was detected in the State Water Board draft resolution presented for approval here today. In whereas number one of the draft resolution at the beginning of the paragraph, the words instruction and the colon will be removed from the draft resolution before it is finalized. This revision is shown in bold and strike through on the slide. Next slide, please. I will now discuss revisions to the original basin plan amendments based on the review by the US EPA. Next slide, please. During the incorporation of the proposed revisions to the salt and nitrate control program, the Central Valley Water Board received a letter from the US EPA on November 20th, 2020, approving most of the surface water components of the original basin plan amendments. In this letter, the US EPA also disapproved three salt control program provisions as well, which have been removed from the current proposed basin plan amendments. These disapproved provisions were discussed previously between US EPA and the Central Valley Water Board. The subsequent removals were relatively minor and do not present a challenge to current or future salt and nitrate control program implementation. The provisions removed involved two authorizations for exceedances of various secondary maximum contaminant levels for surface drinking water in Title 22 of the California Code of Regulations, though both of these authorizations are retained as drinking water provisions for groundwater. Additionally removed was an authorization for a multi-discharger salinity variance. The removal of the multi-discharger salinity variance was also addressed in the State Water Board directed revisions in the approving resolution due to prior comments received by State Water Board from the US EPA before the State Water Board approval of the original Basin Plan Amendments in October, 2019. Next slide, please. Now I would like to address the overarching comments State Water Board staff received during the public comment period for approval of these proposed revisions. Next slide, please. A State Water Board public comment period was conducted from March 5th to April 5th, 2021, regarding only the proposed revisions to the salt and nitrate control program based in plan amendments. Three sets of written comments were received from Pacific Gold Agriculture LLC, the Central Valley Salinity Coalition, and a joint letter from California Rural Legal Assistance Incorporated and the Santa Clara University Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences. Central Valley Water Board staff wrote a response to comments document to formally address each of these comments. Many of the comments were beyond the limited scope of this review, but were addressed in the response to comments document and forwarded to other opportunities for addressing those issues, such as the SAFER and SIGMA programs or the recent early action plan and preliminary management zone proposal comment period and workshop. I will now discuss four significant comments from the comment period. Next slide, please. The first comment requests adding a requirement to the basin plan amendments that all data sets, analyses, procedures, and data products relied upon by management zones be publicly accessible for greater data transparency. Data transparency and public accessibility are extremely important to the state and Central Valley Water Boards, and it is their goal to strive for both as much as possible. Documentation and public review are required throughout the development process of the management zone submittals, and future management zone submittals 
with analyses and data development will require full set, full data sets and full descriptions of analyses, procedures, and judgments relied upon by the management zone. All of those data sets and analyses will be publicly available from the Central Valley Water Board website. Additionally, these specifications will be more effectively addressed in the individual management zone implementation plans and early action plans instead of the basin plan amendments. Next slide, please. The second comment requests that the basin plan amendments regarding the residential nitrate sampling program define resident and clarify that owner consent is not required for sampling or the installation of point of use or POU water filtration systems. The state and Central Valley Water Boards understand these challenges and agree with the importance of getting nitrate sampling and replacement drinking water provided as quickly and effectively as possible. The Central Valley Water Board will facilitate these sampling and replacement drinking water programs to the best of its authority, which includes tracking residences where property owner consent for nitrate sampling is unattainable and obtaining a warrant under an order from Water Code Section 13267 for sampling if necessary. If a 13267 order is issued to a property owner, the burden of sampling cost may shift to that property owner, further incentivizing giving consent for sampling. Additionally, when a tenant is unable to get property owner consent for a point of use water filtration system installation, the management zone must provide replacement drinking water from an alternate source. Point of use installations will further require sampling for a full range of water quality contaminants and establishment of a robust service plan. Furthermore, these specifications will be more effectively addressed in the individual management zone implementation plans and early action plans instead of the basin plan amendments. Next slide, please. The third comment requests that the basin plan amendments include in the residential nitrate sampling program, well sampling protocols, such as sampling frequency and seasonality, sampling for other constituents, and which types of wells should be included in the sampling program. The state and Central Valley Water Boards agree that there is the potential for variability of nitrate concentrations in groundwater. After the initial prioritized nitrate sampling to identify residents affected by nitrate contamination, protocols can then be developed and utilized to represent potential nitrate variability in future follow-up sampling. Due to the unique characteristics of each management zone, these protocols will need to be tailored to the individual needs of each management zone. The need and frequency for follow-up sampling would best be determined using local geologic information and a review of the existing data and trends. Additionally, an early action plan conditional approval letters sent May 7, 2021, the Central Valley Water Board requested that all early action plans include an offer to resample any wells above 7.5 milligrams per liter for nitrate within one year of the initial sampling. This is to investigate if nitrate fluctuations may cause those wells to exceed the drinking water standard for nitrate of 10 milligrams per liter at other times of the year. Furthermore, these specifications will be more effectively addressed in the individual management zone implementation plans and early action plans instead of the basin plan amendments. Next slide, please. The fourth comment is a request that the basin plan amendments require during management zone development and processes that the management zones participate in mandatory stakeholder engagement not merely encouraged stakeholder engagement. Public stakeholder engagement for management zone development and processes is required in the revised basin plan amendments. 
including multiple public comment periods and a Central Valley Water Board hearing for each management zone implementation plan and reviews every two years for early action plans and management zone implementation plans. Public stakeholder engagement adequacy will be evaluated during the approval process of the early action plans and management zone implementation plans. Next slide, please. I would now like to discuss the Central Valley Water Board staff recommendations and propose next steps of this project. Next slide, please. At this time, I would like to ask the State Water Board to include in the staff presentation, excuse me, at this time, I would like to ask the State Water Board to include the staff presentation into the record and approve the proposed resolution to incorporate revisions into the salt and nitrate control program, basin plan amendments for the Sacramento River and San Joaquin River basins and the Tulare Lake Basin water quality control plans, as well as authorized submittal of the revised salt and nitrate control program basin plan amendments as approved to the Office of Administrative Law and the US Environmental Protection Agency for approval. Next slide, please. Thank you, Chair Esquivel, Vice Chair Diadamo, and members of the State Water Board for your consideration of approval of these revisions. This concludes our presentation. At this time, I would like to open the floor up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Really appreciate the good overview and the great work. Um, I know that uh, it was a tight timeline that we asked folks to come back and a, a lot of discussion to get there. So thank you. Thank Any, you. no questions for me off the top. I will note we have, um, uh, yeah, about uh, 10 or so folks um, for comment. Uh, any questions off the top from fellow board colleagues though? So. Okay, hearing none, and then we can uh, go to comment. I'd like to first call up uh, Ben King. Oh, I, I apologize. I will look at my scroller again here. Uh, I, I, the first person to speak, it looks like, is, um, and I apologize, I don't see them on my list here. Um, it is Mr. King. It is Mr. King. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. King. Yes, good morning. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hesper and Board. Um, so, I, I, my name, um, I submitted comments for Pacific Gold Agriculture. And um, my comments related to the presence of salt water and arsenic around the Sutter Buttes. So it's a natural occurring contaminant. And I understand the board's uh, response in saying that it was a natural occurring contaminant. But um, uh, I grew up in Calusa, the city of Calusa, and um, there is uh, uh, arsenic uh, around the Sutter Buttes, which was detailed in, uh, by the DWR in 2008. Um, TDS levels in the Sacramento Valley going back to 1949 have been, re have been measured as high as 10,000. And the DWR work was around uh, about 9,000, I believe. Um, so there is, um, and then um, there is my, my, my concern and based off of the reason, the reason I made comments so late is um, I really never intended to comment, but looking at the issue around the Sutter Buttes, um, I'm really concerned about these desorption of arsenic because of the volcanic parent material in the Sutter Buttes, Buttes and the translocation of that through the Willows Fault, which is similar to the issue that the USGS has identified in Albuquerque, which is also tied to old volcanic structures. Um, my concern is that it's probably a 50, 100 year problem, but that with the groundwater, we, we're actually having more uh, pressure on our groundwater aquifers, that the, both the salts and the trace metals like arsenic can be uh, brought up into the freshwater aquifer zone. And my city, uh, you know, I grew up about a hundred yards from Sacramento River, but we use groundwater. So there, most of the Sacramento Valley is uh, on groundwater and there's really no other alternative. Um, I personally feel like there should be some consideration of uh, freshwater filtration systems for these cities, um, like uh, the city of Davis and Woodland now has 
um, you know, just go keep on going north, which allow us to basically maximize our conjunctive use going forward. But uh, I, I um, the one, one one major concern is is that uh, there isn't been has not been a lot of water testing around those center uh, because there is a lot of groundwater. The question is quality, um, and um, I'm making comments around Sigma two. Um, I kind of feel like this is my input as far as my legacy of my family's involvement. It's not something I tended to be involved in, but uh, I'd like to bring your attention to this natural current contaminant. And the last point would be just as uh, Sigma is a gigantic issue, as you mentioned, Chairman, but just the how does the constitutional right of fresh water, uh, human right to fresh water also fit in this? And how does your prioritization system under the CV salts fit into that where boron is considered, but some of the other natural occurring contaminants are not considered as, a, as something on your radar. I, I know this is a very complex system and I appreciate all the work being done by the board and the, center, the uh, uh, Mr. Pulpa's group and it's at the very end part, but I felt like I needed to respond at this point. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the, the uh, honest engagement here and the flagging for uh, local conditions and concerns sounding uh, like mainly around arsenic, but uh, there may be some, some salinity nexus here then. Uh, of course, this program is, is control of those, those inputs um, on dischargers that are impacting those. But uh, in our groundwater, division of drinking water rather, um, unit concerns like impacts to uh, water quality from naturally occurring arsenic or otherwise are you know, part of the board's purview. So I just, I do appreciate the good flag and uh, the data and engagement. And so I uh, appreciate that uh, wholly, Mr. King. Thank you. Thank, thank you again. Sorry, can I just ask a, a yeah. follow up question? Um, and Please just do. wondering um, if staff at the Central Valley might be able to just speak to um, any programs of control for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think this is one where there's increasing um, understanding of the impacts of um, pumping on uh, groundwater leaching of naturally occurring contaminants into aquifers that where otherwise those contaminants um, weren't as high concentration. And it's a, it seems like it's more of an emerging understanding than maybe in the past. And I'm interested um, if the Central Valley might talk about how they see this either um, fitting or evolving into this program or other programs that the regional board has? Yeah, um, no, I, I, thanks for that question. And, and uh, again, thanks to Mr. King for his comments. Uh, uh, Buttes are a very, very special place. I know I, um, a, a very, was it that, I think there's a couple of geologists who called it, it's the smallest mountain range in the world, just a very, very unique place in general. Um, in terms of the, the main issues, I think we've got salinity, we've got groundwater pumping, and then we've got groundwater pumping and its relationship to arsenic and drinking water. The salinity issue is one that will be tackled through the P&O study. That, the dynamics that Mr. King described are dynamics that are um, you're kind of popping up throughout the valley where you have increased pressure on uh, uh, groundwater pumping. Uh, does draw salinity into areas where it wouldn't necessarily be, um, whether that is into a municipal system or into, you know, as, as agricultural supplies in, in short, water short years um, tap the groundwater more, they introduce more salinity into the picture. Um, that's something that the PO study is, is studying globally throughout the Central Valley so we can kind of figure out tactically how we want to solve this strategically, how we want to create a program that addresses that imbalance throughout the valley on the whole. Um, so certainly, you know, we, we will, that's a process that's evolving. Uh, Mr. King, I, I think as we kind of get more information and proceed with the PO study, um, we'll keep you looped into that. Um, the arsenic and groundwater pumping is not something that the regional board has a whole lot of authority over because again, our authority extends primarily to discharges. However, we are seeing an increased interface in these areas simply because we do see Sigma and one of their undesirable impacts really is looking at the impact of pumping on 
uh, like, uh, like you mentioned, Board Member Firestone, uh, the leaching of, of these constituents into groundwater. Um, you know, with safer and additional tools, we have DDW doing additional testing of systems uh, that haven't been tested before. And certainly there's a growing awareness in those unregulated areas, which I think is largely where Mr. King is talking about. These are a lot of domestic wells in that area where there's really no regulation and very little testing historically for constituents like arsenic. I think we're really, as a state, just trying to get our arms around that. It's not something that the regional board is super invested in, again, because this is not necessarily an area where there are heavy nitrate impacts or frankly, there's not a lot of heavy agricultural activity in this area. Uh, the way we see creating nitrate impacts, the way that nitrate and salinity programs are down south. But there are these impacts as, as you know, the additional agricultural development happens in this area, you are gonna see uh, additional pressure being placed on groundwater. And I think you could see those impacts on domestic wells. So um, on the whole, it's kind of an issue that we're tracking and we're trying to continue the discussions with DDW and uh, other authorities to, to kind of maintain uh, um, uh, awareness of what's happening in those spaces. Basis. Thanks. And I guess I'll say, um, you know, particularly for this issue of um, activities that are um, exacerbating or creating higher concentrations of contaminants into aquifers, like pumping, there's, I think, you know, a number of newer studies really documenting how that is increasing levels of arsenic and uranium um, from, from activities, um, including uh, irrigated agriculture and other water supply pumping. Um, I do feel like this is an area where, like you said, it, fit, it, it doesn't have a clear home, um, but certainly it's, um, I know within, like, like you said, that the um, purview and concern of the regional board in terms of activities that are harming um, groundwater quality. And so just encourage us all, us to be working with you all to figure out how we can um, uh, understand how this fits into the authorities and work that we do, be it um, you know, it, it may not be in this program, it, it, like this is salt and nitrates, um, but I think there are, um, you know, a number of ways that we permit um, pumping in through the water boards um, in terms of impacts on water quality rather than, you know, sigma and adjudications that are more on water supply. Um, so just I guess just emphasizing that I really hope that our staff can work with you all in trying to, to look more closely at this because um, it is kind of a source water, water quality impact um, that I know is, is central to all of our concerns around groundwater quality. So, and thank no. you, Mr. King, for, for bringing this up because I, I do think it's an issue that we're understanding more and more is a challenge. And, you know, we have more programs around and experience around when there's plumes from uh, other uh, past contamination. But as we're changing and increasing plumes from what was naturally occurring contaminant into new areas, I think it, it presents new challenges within our, our regulatory process to figure out how we can address. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, board member. Uh, uh, Mr. Palupa, did you want to follow up with anything uh, for this? Yeah, no, I, I, I just want to echo uh, Board Member Firestone's comments. I mean, it's, again, our authority, as you know, extends to discharges, but what a discharge is, is kind of a, an interesting concept. We don't regulate pumping, but then again, when you see the incre an increasing plume, like Board Member Firestone says, um, we don't want there to be a regulatory vacuum and to everybody let, be left pointing their fingers, oh, you should have regulated it or you should have regulated it. So it, from my vantage point, it just increases the amount of conversations that we need to have with the GSAs and with DDW um, and with local authorities that do regulate pumping uh, to make sure that we have our arms around this issue as it continues to evolve. Yeah, to my mind, the groundwater ambient monitoring and assessment program, our GAMMA program, which we heard a little bit about earlier on our superior award, accomplishment awards, uh, is a really important component. Uh, we need to continue to 
ensure that we're having robust data collection and understanding and then modeling thereof and just better to board member Firestone's point, understanding of what is happening below our feet. What are the challenges to water quality that we know we'll continue to see, particularly with drought that, can, that concentrates our contaminants. And there we even have data coming in from the Division of Drinking Water, which we know in the last drought, we saw systems uh, begin to not meet um, uh, standards that they were meeting prior because of degrading uh, groundwater quality. So a lot to explore. And uh, again, thank you, Mr. King, uh, for your good comments here and spurring uh, our good discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, now, next we have Tess Dunham. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, it is. Um, Hello, uh, not a lot to say here other than to, uh, well, I guess I should start with my name, Tess Denham, Consories and Conway, and just wanted to um, touch base here today with respect to the basin plan amendments that are before you. You know, we um, appreciate the regional board's process and your process in the development of these and the, the ability for us to get to agreement with uh, multiple stakeholders with respect to the moving forward with these basin plan amendments. We do believe that they are consistent with what was agreed upon in the conversations that we had in 2019 that led up to the state water board's adoption of the basin plan amendments. Most importantly, during this time period where we have been developing these amendments, through the CV salt process, work has begun in earnest, right? Where our feet have not been, uh, we have not been sitting idly by while these were under development. We have been actively working in implementing both the nitrate control programs as well as the salt control program, which will be part of your, uh, your next item as far as discussion as the informational item. But we encourage your adoption of these today and we will continue forward with implementation of both the salt and nitrate control programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Uh, if I can ask one question, just uh, and not to put you on the spot here, uh, knowing as you've heard from some of our discussion, whether it's Sigma or the way that this program interacts with so many of the other activities going on in the basins, um, how, how best do we make sure that, you know, there is cross-pollination with groundwater sustainability agencies that, you know, the discussion and understanding of even just this program, its benefits, how we're proceeding, uh, is known uh, to those those GSAs so as to be able to really better coordinate um, and better inform that decision making that has such critical impact to things like water quality and the concentrating of contaminants, et cetera. Uh, do you have a suggestion on how best we, we do that? Is it you know just continued uh, just investment in kind of the collaborative space for for those? Are there maybe you know specific opportunities for us to kind of stand up and and in unison, you know, and in, in tandem, sort of uh, discuss these these challenges. Well, I think you know we definitely, as we've gone forward with implementation, both for the nitrate and the salt programs, with respect to the management zones, as well as the development of the prioritization and optimization study. Clearly, there is um, conversations that is happening, or that are happening with the GSAs today. Um, for where we have our priority management, management zones, there is communication happening as to the GSA role versus the management zone role and how do we collaborate with respect to those activities. A couple of our management zones are actually administered by the same you know, agency that's administering the GSAs. So there is a lot of cross-pollination that is happening on the ground every day. Um, you know, I think in part, we're all still waiting to see where the GSPs come out that have been submitted. I don't think there's any bit that have been officially approved yet at this point in time. Um, and, but the cross-pollination is there. And I think we just continue to need to have those conversations. Um, and then of course, factoring out, factoring in the drought and the impact with respect to drought has made it even more challenging for all of us. I don't know that I, you know, on the spot, I could say that there's, you know, one specific thing that can happen um, other than to let you know that we are all, you know, we're all talking and chatting and a lot of conferences that talk about it. Um, and just a matter of, you know, as we learn more and, you know, figure out the nexuses between that, what role can a management zone play and collaboration with a GSA. And most importantly, for a lot of the folks that I represent, is making sure we are using resources 
wisely, right? The last thing we need is for growers um, and those subject to a management zone to be paying for their management zone and to duplicate and pay for the same thing through, their, through a GSA. And so I don't think that helps any of us. We wanna make sure we're using our resources wisely. Yeah, I think I thank you for that uh, spontaneous colloquy because I think it, it really is then um, also then uh, about the state's resources writ large, all of us collectively, and what we're expending and how we expend that. Because I think of the safe and affordable program, of course, you know our drinking water uh, programs here, and the need to also see that that real collaboration between the programs and those. And I know that there are discussions there and. I think it's just needing to continue to really um, ensure that we're spending wisely collectively our, our community's resources, our state's resources, and actually uh, tackling what are these real generational challenges. And then we have an opportunity to finally address here before us. So thank you. I, I appreciate the, the discussion. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Daniel Kozeb. I, good morning, uh, Chair Esquivel and, and board. I, I'd sort of echo the things that, that Tess said. Um, certainly appreciate the work by the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the State Board uh, staff as they work through these. We're, we're now working through all the implementation issues that are related to actually managing the delivery of testing and water on, on the ground. So we've had a number as uh, as Anne and, uh, and Patrick can attribute to a number of calls between us figuring out all the small details. They seem small, but they're really critical in getting these programs out. And I'm sure as board member Firestone knows, it's easier to talk about delivering water than it is to actually test and deliver water to people in their home. So I, I think uh, the management zones that have worked have done really exceptional work, Valley Water Collaborative and Chapchilla. Uh, management zone as well as King's Water Alliance and the Kawea Water Alliance and Thule management zones are all working very effectively in their areas at various uh, levels and so just wanted to um, thank everybody involved in getting us through sort of the final approval I think I've sort of said I thought we were I thought the final approval was a number of times over over the history but I think uh, getting these changes and fixes for uh, for everybody into the record are really helpful and uh, and that all the folks who are working we talk all the time uh, in between the different groups we, we also have hundreds of uh, p and study participants that have signed up and paid to be part of the study as far as the SALT side. So both programs are uh, on the ground working uh, very actively. And uh, as, as Tess said, we, we certainly support the basin plan amendment before the board today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kozen. Appreciate your work and engagement on all this. Uh, and then last we have Michael Claiborne. I apologize, I, I misspoke earlier. I uh, combined uh, items number three and four when I, I saw how many folks we have speaking. So we have another, the other tranches uh, after the CV Salt update. Uh, Mr. Claiborne. You should be invited to unmute here in a second. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Okay, you are now, good to see you. Good morning to the chair and to the board. Uh, so we, along with Community Water Center and Clean Water Action have engaged in the CV Salts Basin planning process for many years. I'd guess that of the 18 hearings that Mr. Palupa mentioned, we've likely been at all of them. Um, and I'd also say it's already feels like it's been a long road, but we're really just at the beginning um, of implementation. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, drinking water get to people on the ground and also for uh, Base, uh, management zones to bring their members into compliance and restore groundwater basins. Our goals in engaging in this process have been to ensure that residents impacted by nitrate pollution and groundwater have a safe and affordable source of drinking water. In the short term, this means replacement water, kiosks, and or point of use uh, or point of entry filtr filtration. In the medium term, it means dischargers must come into compliance and where it makes sense consolidation and extension of public drinking water service. And then ultimately the best way to ensure that residents of the Central Valley have safe drinking water that isn't impacted by nitrate uh, is compliance with water quality objectives and restoration of polluted groundwater. In October of 2019, when the original salt and nutrient control program was approved by this board, we had numerous issues with the salt and nutrient management plan. 
But to this board's credit, after stakeholder negotiations, the approval resolution, resolution directed many revisions to the SNMP to better protect groundwater quality. And we're appreciative of the state board's intervention in its approval resolution, as well as the central board's timely compliance with resolution 2019-0057 in revising the SNMP. There are though three things that I wanna to flag today in implementation. The first is that although the basin plan amendments allow up to 35 years for compliance, time schedules are required to be as short as practicable for each discharger or category of dischargers. In implementation of the salt and nutrient management plan, we will be very skeptical of proposed uh, schedules that are 35 years in length. The state and regional boards must play a strong oversight role to ensure that dischargers come into compliance and stop contributing to exceedances and pollution and nuisance in the receiving water in the shortest practicable period of time. Second, the revisions to the SNMP did not adopt clear standards for when a management zone must provide financial assistance to a water system that is presently providing safe water to its customers, but at a higher cost because of nitrate pollution. The, this policy issue must be adequately and equitably addressed in implementation and the state board's guidance on this point will be critical. And then finally, resolution 2019-0057 directs state water board staff when, within one year of approval of this resolution or the resolution to identify internal and external options for developing and expanding the capacity of local community organizations to participate meaningfully in the development of management zone implementation plans and related processes. We continue to believe that community capacity building will be essential to equitable implementation of CV salts and we're eager to engage with staff and the board to expand community capacity. I'd also specifically thank board members Doduck and Firestone for their leadership on this issue. And then thank you again for the opportunity to provide a comment on this item. We look forward to implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Claiborne. Appreciate your uh, contributions and commitment to the effort. Thank you. Fellow board colleagues, questions, thoughts, discussion? I guess I will start and uh, add my thanks to those already expressed to regional board staff for their tremendous work on turning this around, but also to all the stakeholders involved for just tackling the challenges associated with this very, very difficult issue, uh, working together um, and getting it to this point. And, and really, as have been mentioned, this is just the start of a very challenging, difficult, long-term process that will require tremendous coordination, uh, collaboration, and yes, engagement from the state and regional water board. And I think, um, you know, especially on issues such as community engagement and capacity building, um, yes, we, we did put uh, the responsibilities on the groups to, to do that, but I think it, um, it also should be a responsibility of us, the water boards, to provide some guidelines uh, where appropriate to ensure some consistency and to ensure that um, it gets done. Um, that is our role after all, and, and you know that. I don't have to tell you that, Patrick. Um, but you know, thank you so much for all the hard work that went into this and all the hard work that will go into this. And um, I'm sure there will be other comments and perhaps some discussion, but um, I uh, would be honored and pleased to move for adoption of this item. Thank you so much, board member. Other colleagues? I can echo that. And um, again, this is really challenging, just the beginning, um, a ton, a, like a decade of work going into this um, and uh, decades more to come to make it successful. Um, so thank you all and, and I'll second the motion. Thank you, board member. And before we actually vote, I apologize. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, Chair uh, Dr. Longley and uh, Vice Chair Kadara are here in the board meeting uh, uh, with us. Um, if, if you would like uh, to, to say any words, what we can also uh, save comment uh, since we'll be talking about the program here uh, on the, and the update uh, further in the next item. Um, but just wanted to at least acknowledge 
uh, Chair Longley and, and Vice Chair Kadara here. Okay. And then, so we have a, a second, if any other board colleagues would like to make comment. Hearing none, I just wanna echo then the comments that board member Doduk and uh, board member Firestone made. We are only at the beginning here. As we heard, this is a really important program. I look forward to hearing further on the update here and discussion then, but um, appreciate the, the flexibility in being able to um, allow us to adopt, but also send back to the region some revision to be able to close this out, uh, to be able to, and, and the good diligent work that's gone on uh, to do so. Vice Chair Kadara. Yes, uh, just a comment. Uh, I, I want to uh, acknowledge the staff uh, for their hard work on this and all the comments that have been made and uh, really wanting to, uh, glad to hear about obtaining the warrant for sampling of the water of the private wells. I think that was a, a big sticking point that we had uh, 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 a month or so ago, trying to uh, make sure that we had a way of sampling those private wells. So uh, just to see that that's something that's being considered is, is great. And uh, the community engagement to me is a critical part to see that the families, the residents, the communities that are impacted that they are at the table in the decision-making process. Um, so they didn't have anything to do with the, the impacts or the contamination, but they certainly can be a part of the solution. And I, I think rightfully so. So thanks to the, to the staff, uh, Patrick and uh, Annie and all the people that have worked on it and the state board uh, for your, your work with us and uh, look forward to the next phase of this effort, of this long effort as it's been stated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Chair, for your incredible leadership and for championing those really important aspects of this program. Really, really appreciate your, your incredible work. So thank you and for, and for joining us here this morning. Thank you. My Chair pleasure. Longley. Uh, thank yes, you, thank Chair. you. Um, but certainly I echoed the thanks to the uh, staff for their long work. This is a journey we're We've, we've been on it now since about 2006, and we're just beginning the journey. Um, it's a long ways to go. I think we also need to look out to the university, look out to the university communities as ways of helping us. Uh, and the, Depart uh, the Department of Energy now through, through the Lawrence Berkeley Labs is putting out a lot of money to address uh, issues such as the nitrate uh, and uh, uh, arsenic issues. Um, I would certainly urge a more comprehensive uh, development of relationships focused specifically on the kind of problems we face here in the Central Valley, and I think it might, might yield uh, good results in future years. I'm personally on two of those contracts with, with agencies developing technology, and, I, and I, I, there's a lot of opportunity. But getting back to the topic today, thank you very much for considering this. And I, I, I think it's, it's a tribute to those who've worked on it that we've gotten where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Longley. Really appreciate your longstanding engagement all, in all of this work. And for those that may not know, I believe it's the Salini, it's, uh, you know, Western State Salinity Coalition, one of the Salinity Coalitions out there, uh, honored Dr. Longley with the Salt of the Earth um, uh, Award and rightfully uh, deserved. So. Thank you, Mr. Long, uh, Dr. Longley, Chair Longley. I think that brings us then to an actual roll call vote. And uh, thank you both um, Chair and Vice Chair of uh, the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board for um, contributing to our discussion here. And Ms. Uh, Townsend. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Dodek. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. And Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. And item number three is adopted. Thank you everyone for, again, the good work and uh, a bit of creative uh, maneuvering on our part uh, to be able to get some edits in and still be able to move forward with uh, implementation of the plan and just appreciate all the I know uh, good work, a lot of work that went into being able to meet those deadlines and still uh, at a place where we're starting to implement. And 
uh, on that implementation then, uh, we can go on to uh, item number four, which is an update on uh, CV Salt's program. Implement an update on the implementation of the Central Valley Salt and Nitrate Control Program. And here we have back Mr. Palupa. Or and actually, it may be Ms. Walters that's actually uh, starting the item here. But by all means, I'll, 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 you know, kind of echo uh, the commendations to staff. I, I really do want to give an, an extra thanks to uh, Anne, who's the program manager for the CP Salts program, and will be giving the presentation today. A lot of stakeholder participation brought us to where we are at right now, and that includes the Salinity Coalition, um, as well as the numerous, numerous stakeholders and advocates who commented on this process and made it a better project. Um, in the end, but I think Anne, uh, really for the past few years at least has been the focal point of a lot of those efforts and, and she's borne a very heavy load and done so in a very, very commendable manner. Um, Jenny also did a, a excellent work in kind of shepherding uh, this last series of amendments to her. So thanks to them. And with that, I will turn it over to Anne uh, to take over for the start of this presentation. All right, thank you, Patrick. And I just wanna say it's a team effort. I have an excellent team that helps me. So definitely the kudos go to them um, as well. So, um, but good morning board members. My name is Ann Walters. I'm a senior environmental scientist at the Central Valley Water Board. And I'm here today with Patrick Palupa, um, executive officer of the Central Valley Water Board. And then also Joe Karkowski, He's the Assistant Deputy Director with the State Board's Office of Sustainable Water Solutions. And today we will be providing you an update on the CV Salt's implementation of the site salt and nitrate control programs. Next slide. Um, so today's item will start with a brief overview, uh, followed by an update on the salt control program. And then next, I will talk about the Nitrate Control Program's uh, early action plans and preliminary management zone proposals. And Patrick will then discuss the public comments um, that were received on those plans and the subsequent early action plan conditions for the management zones. And then lastly, Joe Karkowski will discuss the State Board's co-funding and coordination efforts. Next slide. So just to provide some context, um, the diagram here, uh, shown here, provides a high-level overview of the two distinct programs that address salt and nitrate in the Central Valley. The nitrate control program on the left side is a prioritized program that addresses nitrate pollution in groundwater by focusing first on the areas in the valley that are most critically impacted, and then followed by the lower priority areas after that. Permittees have a choice to follow an individual permitting approach with more stringent requirements, or they can choose to participate in a collective stakeholder-led effort, which is that management zone permitting approach. Uh, the salt control program shown on the right is a phased program to address salinity impacts to both surface and groundwaters. For the first phase of the program, uh, permittees again are provided that option to choose one of two pathways. The first is a conservative permitting approach, which requires meeting stringent salinity limitations, or permittees can choose to participate in a region-wide stakeholder effort um, to develop that long-term sustainable salt management strategy. Next slide. So as we talked about during Jenny's item, addressing salt and nitrate issues in the Central Valley will take many decades. Uh, this diagram gives a big picture of where we are in terms of the next 30 years. And at the top, you can see that we are in the second year of the nitrate control program, uh, which puts us right in the middle of that initial rollout of the priority one basins. And then priority two basins are expected to be, be addressed in the second half of 2022, while non-prioritized areas will follow on a to-be-determined to be basis. And on the bottom, um, we see the salt in the salt control program. We're in that early part of the program's first 10 year phase with two decade long phases planned after that. Next slide. So, next, I'm going to give you a brief update on the salt control program. Next slide. Phase one of the salt control program applies to all permitted dischargers of salt in the Central Valley region. 
and notice to comply letters were sent out to over 3,200 permittees on January 5th of this year. The notice of intents are due by, um, from those permittees by July 15th of this year. And as you can imagine, you know, after that initial mail out in January, the Central Valley Water Board was contacted uh, via email and by phone um, by hundreds of the permittees. They had questions and wondering what to do. Um, and staff was very busy responding to those many inquiries. A salt control pro program webinar held with the Central Valley Salinity Coalition in February helped to answer many of those questions. Um, but we've had a number of one-on-one -on -one meetings and phone calls as well with permittees. We do anticipate uh, an uptick in the work in July when we start receiving more of those notice of intent forms and then also the salinity uh, characterization reports for permittees choosing that conservative pathway. Next slide. In March, the Central Valley Water Board approved the prioritization or an optimization, or we call it PO for short, uh, work plan submitted by the Central Valley Salinity Coalition, which is that serving, which is serving as that lead entity of this effort. And again, um, that PO study is that alternative permitting approach for phase one of the program, and it will last 10 to 15 years. And during this time, the study will define salt-sensitive hydrologic regions identify their salinity sources and impacts. It will also develop um, the conceptual projects for long-term salt management. And these could include both physical and non-physical projects. It will also establish a governance structure and funding plan. And ultimately, uh, it will develop recommendations for phase two of the salt control program, which is when the design and approval steps of the salt management projects will take place followed by the last phase of the program when project implementation will occur. Next slide. Okay, so next I'm gonna give you a brief update on the nitrate control program. Next slide. Okay, so the map here shows the prioritized areas in the Central Valley for the nitrate control program. And over 1,200 Priority 1 Notice to Comply letters were sent out in May of last year to areas shown here in red. And then the Priority 2 areas are shown in orange. And as we talked about, as I mentioned before, those, are, those Notice to Comply letters are anticipated to go out in 2022. And then the remaining areas in green will be phased in as needed after the Priority 1 and 2 areas. So as of today, there are only 22 permittees, or less than 2%, who chose the individual permitting approach. And we're still evaluating the nitrate assessment report submittals on those. But about 84% of the remaining permittees have chosen to participate with their local management zone. And then the remaining 14% have not submitted a pathway choice. So um, we're gonna have to do some follow-up on those. Next slide. Um, but as I mentioned, the vast majority of permittees have chosen to join a management zone. So this table shows the six groundwater basins that fall in the priority one classification. And management zones have been created in each of these areas. An estimated 100,000 residents may be impacted by high nitrates in the groundwater of these six basins. Next slide. Management zones have a number of deliverables to complete to meet the requirements of the nitrate control program. Uh, the first were the submittals of those preliminary management zone proposals and early action plans. Um, and those were submitted by all the management zones by that due date of March 8th of this year. Implementation of the early action plans, uh, which provide testing and replacement drinking water to impacted residents began on March 7th. And the Central Valley Water Board held a public comment period and workshop on those um, plans a few months ago. Patrick will be talking a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The Central Valley Water Board uh, sub subsequently sent out five conditional approval letters and one disapproval letter with a 60-day opportunity to cure to the management zones on May 7th. Patrick will also be talking a little bit more about those details in a minute. Following the Central Valley Water Board's approval of the preliminary management zone proposals, the management zones will need to submit a final management zone proposal within six months. So that's anticipated to be probably at the end of this year. 
Following the public comment period and approval of those plans, a management zone implementation plan will be due six months later. And those implementation plans will really, you know, spell out those overall long-term plans on how the management zones will intend to meet that 35-year deadline uh, to comply with the nitrate objectives. And it will really, they'll serve as the primary avenue by which permits will be updated to incorporate the nitrate control program requirements. Next slide. So I just wanna highlight some of the early action plan implementation activities. These include community outreach, which encompasses both virtual outreach, um, such as webinars and in-person events, such as visiting farmers markets and schools. And the early action plans also include plans for well testing and provision of interim safe drinking water to impacted residents. The plans also include strategies for working with communities at risk to ensure the long-term success of the program. Next slide. The early action plans are primarily focused on three interim drinking water solutions, bottled water delivery, water fill stations or kiosks, and point of view systems. And so currently there are six water fill stations in use and they're averaging about 480 gallons of water per day. Um, in addition, Hot off the press as of this morning, um, I received information uh, from the management zones that 110 wells have been tested uh, since the implementation started less than a month ago, and there are more to be scheduled. Um, there's more than 70 other applications in process and several hundred other inquiries that they've received. And bottled water delivery has started for 19 households in the area where the nitrate levels were above the objective. Next slide. So next I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick and he's gonna talk a little bit more about the public comments. All right, thanks so much, Anne. And um, you know, as, as a starting note, I would say that um, a lot of us were optimistic about this program, uh, but with a dose of skepticism, with a dose of let's try this and see how it works. I will say if you asked me two years ago uh, today, if the success, if, if, if this program uh, if you guessed this program would be as successful as it is and whether you would take it or not, um, I would take where this program is in a heartbeat. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who have put a lot of time and effort into developing preliminary management zone proposals and early action plans with the involvement of communities, with the involvement of other regulators to try and make them successful, to try and carve a path forward towards nitrate compliance for the entire valley. Um, a lot of remarkable work has gone in, even in these past 14, 15 months when we are in strict lockdown. Um, and I think that's a testament to really the good faith of many people around the table uh, trying to work for collaborative solutions here. And, and I think that's fairly remarkable. Um, and as Joaquin, uh, as you said earlier, uh, this implementation comes at, at a time where it is so badly needed in the middle of these drought conditions. Uh, it's also something that I know many of our growers who are providing the resources for these programs are also in very, very difficult situations. Many of them are in very difficult situations uh, because of the drought. And so we thank them for their continued involvement. So this, uh, um, the slide up here is showing the public comment periods that we had for the preliminary management zone proposals and early action plans, which themselves are not permits. Uh, they are really uh, one of the main steps on a pathway to a permitting action by the Central Valley Water Board. But nonetheless, because they had such a heavy involvement with the communities, because the board, both the state and regional board's expectations were that the communities had to be involved in the development of these plans and proposals, we opened this up to a public comment period. Uh, public comment period was a quick one, March 14th to April 15th. Again, the reason being that occurred during that 60 day window uh, after the plans were submitted to the regional board and before the plans began implemented. That's a really, really tight time frame. We also included a uh, public virtual workshop uh, that we held on April 27th, shortly before uh, the plans were scheduled to be approved, disapproved by uh, myself and the regional board, just to hear 
a few more opinions, a few more comments about what the plans were doing well and what they were not doing well, so that when we issued our letters, they could be as well informed as was possible, given the short time frame. Next slide. And so these were the comments that we heard from the main stakeholders as, as we kind of unfolded that uh, public comment period. And I wanna say, this is fairly unique <laughs> uh, in that I think we agree with just about every single one of the comments that came in. Uh, some of them were not deploying immediately, uh, where it's more of a long-term goal, but all of the comments that came in raised some very valid points about the direction of this program. One of the most critical components was we need to see additional public outreach and engagement. Uh, we, every, I think even the uh, most diehard proponents of a robust public engagement strategy acknowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic changed the way in which uh, um, dischargers interact with stakeholders. And I think the thought was that as the COVID-19 restrictions lift, those door knocking campaigns and those on the boots, uh, boots on the ground strategies that many of the dischargers and management zones are planning had to resume. Uh, certainly the regional board supports this. And I think we've heard universally from the management zones that that is the strategy. Once we can get back on to those one-on-one -on -one meetings or once we can get, get back to those small in-person gatherings with community leaders, with individuals who have contaminated well water, um, that has to happen. Uh, second, uh, there was a component of uh, a comment that said, we want more data transparency and accessibility to the information that's being developed through the management zones and through the management zone implementation plans. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, the regional board's expectations for data transparency are higher than they ever have been. Uh, the fact that we are uh, ardently insisting that all data paid for by state resources are mandated through the CV Salts program uh, go into GeoTracker is something that, frankly, wasn't a conversation that we were having years ago. Now I think it's just, it's mandatory. When we talk about data transparency, we talk about data transparency going up to databases that are universally accessible to researchers, to academics, uh, to the public, to other regulators. And I think that's really gonna be the default position as we move forward. It's such a shared problem. Uh, there has to be shared access to the data so that we can understand the size and scope of it. Um, some of the information that came in through the preliminary management zone uh, proposals or through the preliminary early action plans uh, did not have full disclosure of the data. And I think that was really because it was an effort to get things going. Uh, and I think that what our insistence was in our approval letter was we have to really continue to open up data even more so than it has been in the past. And I think you're hearing very, very broad support from that uh, from just about all the stakeholders out there. Next slide. One of the public comments, and we certainly appreciate this, is, is that the initial CV Salts proposal uh, requires property owner consent for doing the domestic well testing. Um, that's really just been the traditional posture of the board because uh, the traditional posture of the board, including what uh, was in the irrigated lands regulatory program that was considered by the state board, was that the regional board had to be able to back up any kind of requests that it had with the regulatory authority to do it itself if it needed to. And the way the laws and regulations are structured right now is that the Central Valley Water Board uh, would need to get the property owner's consent or a warrant, as uh, Board Member Kadara uh, was commenting earlier, uh, to access a well for domestic well testing. Now, I think that's an evolving issue. And certainly what we've been doing and what our approval letters have said is that our enforcement division will keep tabs on any property owner uh, that has not been responsive to requests by residents to have their well tested. So we can come in uh, and do a, you know, a, a, an enforcement action if need be uh, to get a well tested if the property owner is unreasonably withholding uh, permission to do so. And uh, the, the part for unreasonably withholding, I, I don't know any circumstance in which uh, somebody serving water to their residents uh, 
would be ref reasonably refusing to have their well tested. So we'll keep tabs on all of that. And very quickly, at least in our framing of the issue, that could very well turn into an enforcement issue where we will get that information uh, one way or another. Uh, thus far, uh, we have not been seeing many well owners uh, denying that uh, permission. Uh, it's really something I think everybody, again, is, it wants to get to the bottom of. Uh, there's certainly liability issues associated with that. So I think we've, they've been very, very receptive thus far uh, to getting those wells uh, tested. And we'll certainly uh, keep track and re report back to our board and to you uh, if any of those uh, numbers start climbing upwards and what we plan to do about it. Other folks asked, asked for increases to the frequency of sampling. So the thought was that certain wells may show a nitrate level that's below uh, the regulatory threshold, so below the 10 standard um, during one season, but as the seasons go on due to pumping, due to uh, uh, influx, due to rain, uh, lots of different changes in the hydrodynamics beneath the system, that you'd get that nitrate number inching up and, and make it a dangerous well. Uh, what we've decided to do is really take the priority to get as many wells sampled as possible. Uh, so this means that we're not going to be sampling wells quarterly, we're not going to mandate quarterly sampling of wells, but any well, as mentioned earlier, that tests above the 7.5 threshold will be, the, the management zones will be offering to resample that uh, so that we can make sure that that well uh, stays below the 10 threshold or if it inches above the 10 threshold, uh, that replacement water is going to be provided. We will also take a close look at the well data as it comes in. If we notice any seasonal trends, I think we'll incorporate that in, into our thinking. Uh, we have continual review over this process. It's something that will continue to evolve, but I wanna kind of lay the chip down that at this point, our main interest and the interest uh, supported by a lot of constituents in the Valley is let's get as many wells tested as possible. That really is the highest priority at this juncture. Um, additional comment that came in said, we need to increase the sampling protocols for other water quality constituents. We don't wanna give a false impression that because this is a nitrate control program, they sample for nitrates, that's clean for nitrates, you're good to use the well. We know that in many areas of the valley, there are multiple constituents that could potentially pose a harm to somebody drinking that drinking water. And we want to make sure that, that we are sampling and not saying that you have a green light to use that well, that well is totally safe if we just sample for nitrates. This is where a lot of the work has come in with working with entities like SAFER, with working with other folks who are doing uh, sampling for other uh, constituents. I think Joe will touch a little bit on that uh, in the next part of the presentation. But we are, uh, we have developed a sample letter uh, that will go out to any well that tests good for nitrate, um, but where other constituents aren't tested for, uh, we, we want to keep that number low and want to make sure that when we do a, go out and do a well sampling event uh, or when the management zone does a well sampling event, we will be testing for the full suite of uh, constituents that generally pose a risk in that area. Um, but that's what we're going to be doing. Where there's, a, there's a sample letter that's going to go out to folks uh, that will essentially say, uh, we tested your well for nitrate. You still could have water quality issues. Uh, please follow up with testing and then a link to resources for that additional testing. Next slide. In addition, the public did make some comments. We had some comments that the fill stations needed to be operational as soon as possible with the time frame, I believe was uh, down to 60 days. The drinking water fill stations, which are certainly an interim measure, they're not the best solution, but they're a solution that we have at hand to provide drinking water to communities that are in desperate need of it. Um, they take a while to get up and running. You know, I wish it weren't the case, but we need to make sure that when a fill station is installed in a community, that that fill station is safe, uh, that the fill station follows all DDW rules and regulations about the way it is serving the water. Uh, we want to make sure that those fill stations have community support. Uh, so those fill stations, we are trying to get operational as quickly as possible, but those time frames is probably a few months at minimum to get those fill stations up and operational, simply because there's a lot of engagement, both with regulatory agencies, with the county, and with communities before those things get installed. 
Um, additional comments, and I think this is what we've been hearing from you folks at the board as well, uh, is continue to coordinate with the SAFER program. We have a number of regulatory programs that are all operating within the same sphere. Uh, we are, we have a lot of meetings with both SAFER, with DDW, uh, to address a lot of the issues that are coming up. Um, our uh, coordination has, you know, included GSAs, included a lot of other entities within the area, but SAFER is certainly a key component uh, to our interactions. I think uh, not a week goes by where at least I don't have a meeting with, with the SAFER program. Uh, many, many other folks are, are meeting even on a more frequent basis to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're using limited resources wisely, and that we're really getting the drinking water and testing out to the people that need it the most. Um, lastly, uh, and this is a, a good comment that we've heard, is, is that we uh, some uh, folks from the stakeholder community wanted more information on the budgets and funding from the management zones. And I know this can be a tricky issue um, in that, you know, the, the, the thought was, hey, we want to make sure that we you have adequate budgets uh, and funding mechanisms to ensure everything that you're promising actually gets delivered. Um, for us, I think we're going to be asking for additional transparency as these plans get operational, as the plans report to the regional board. Um, our bottom line, though, is that these have to be funded. If you have a plan that it just doesn't budget for enough well testing, that doesn't budget for enough replacement water, you have to go out and make sure that that money becomes available through the folks that are working within your management zone. Uh, if you fail, if you only fund these plans at 80%, 70%, 50%, well, then some of the permitting options, which are really the, the carrots in this whole equation, get taken off the table and you're bounced into a traditional compliance mode. So a lot is at stake with making sure that the management zones continue to come up with the resources that they need to deliver on the promises that they are making. Next slide. Again, uh, in terms of the conditions, uh, this isn't quite a permitting issue. Uh, at the current stage of development, we're giving approval to early action plans and the idea being that if you do not execute on the early action plans, you do not get the uh, uh, permit that we have down the line. That's really what the whole uh, strategy was for this particular program that in order to get a 35 year compliance time frame, of course the clock's ticking is probably uh, 33 and change at this point. But if you do not get you do not get access to that extended compliance time frame to bring your facilities, bring your agricultural parcels, bring your POTWs into compliance unless you have a viable early action plan that is doing exactly what you propose to do, uh, that is doing what all the regulations require you to do. Um, you know, that's the formulation right here. So our approval letter is basically laid out in very clear terms what our expectations were. As I mentioned earlier, one of the components was to continue community engagement efforts and increase one-on-one uh, -on -one communications with community members as the COVID-19 protocols lift. Uh, two, for the well sampling program, we want to make sure that there is additional rigor being placed on the well sampling program. As you can tell from the numbers that Ann uh, mentioned earlier, those numbers are ramping up on a curve. The more and more people are asking to have their wells sampled, uh, the management zones are going out and proactively uh, proposing that these wells be sampled. Uh, that will continue. Uh, we are also going to take note of any property owners that uh, refuse permission for sampling um, and that ingest them into a database maintained by our uh, enforcement division and also continue to get multi-constituent sampling protocols up and running so that wells are tested not just for nitrate but for other uh, potentially harmful water quality constituents. In addition, uh, we've also make, made sure that uh, if there is a nitrate exceedance, that the owner's notified, that residents are notified, and that we are provided, providing the resources with the management zones of where they can go to get replacement water um, as quickly as possible to make sure that everybody is safe uh, when a nitrate exceedance is detected. Next slide. Other aspects, uh, we touched on these a little bit earlier, uh, included in the letter, um, uh, technical 
technical analyses and data transparency. Uh, we are basically putting the marker down that we need to make sure that the the programs as they give data over to the regional board, that it's data that's centrally uh, open for any one member of the public to scrutinize, to take a look at. Uh, that includes both the prerequisites to the data analysis and the data analysis itself and the underlying data. In terms of uh, point of use programs, uh, there was some ambiguity in the Basin Plan Amendment about when they could be used and when they couldn't be used. Uh, the, what the letters, the approval letters lay out is that you have to have multi-constituent testing if you're going to use a point of view system in, in a particular uh, household. Uh, there's no point treating for nitrate uh, and saying everything is all good with the point of view system if the point of view system is not treating for water quality constituents that are actually posing uh, potentially even greater threat than nitrates at the tap. So that includes arsenic, radionucleotides, a bunch of other water quality constituents. So in order to use a point of use system, you have to do the full suite of water quality constituent testing. Uh, financial reporting, we, we laid out our expectation that that financial reporting will increase. We are currently in conversations with the management zones themselves uh, about how they can make sure that their financial uh, information is transparent to ensure that there is a viable set of resources available to pay for all the things that they are promising. And lastly, um, you know, I think this is a common refrain both to the State Water Board, we're reporting more frequently to you. Uh, we want the management zones reporting uh, very clearly to us about the current status of their implementation efforts. Next slide. And here's that, just a, a something to note in terms of what we're looking at within many of the management zones. Uh, these are the other issues that we're worried about. So, um, you know, you can kind of take a look at this. Uh, there's a whole suite of water quality constituents that could potentially pose risk uh, to human health. Um, this is the list. Uh, this is the, the, the top five. But again, there's others that could potentially pose a human health threat uh, in individual domestic wells. And we want to make sure that all of these issues are addressed, even though the nitrate control program is uniquely focused on nitrate, because again, um, as a, a discharge permitting agency, that's the constituent that is in the discharge. Many of these others are either historic uh, artifacts in the 123 TCP or and DBCP or are naturally occurring as in the case with arsenic, uranium, um, and some of the other water quality constituents out there. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe Karkowski for a talk for a discussion about state board co-funding and coordination. Okay, great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we've been in discussions with um, representatives from the CB Salts Coalition, so Tess Dunham and Daniel Cozet, as well as with the regional board on potential uh, co-funding approaches. Uh, you know, Patrick had mentioned uh, clearly there can be other constituents of concerns, and we want to take advantage of opportunities to uh, sample the, those wells where some of the nitrate sampling is going on. So the general approach that we were looking at is what would make sense and be fair and appropriate in terms of splitting the cost. And we looked at a couple of different activities, so I'll briefly go over those. One is the initial outreach. Uh, so that is, you know, we're looking at, well, splitting the cost evenly because at that point you really don't know what um, constituents might actually be at elevated levels. So that when we say between DFA or the Division of Financial Assistance, it's between the state board and the management zones. Then also looking at the uh, domestic well sampling, uh, it, our proposal, and again, this is something that went out a couple weeks ago to the management zones for their consideration, is to provide funding for the general sampling costs and any cost specific to nitrate. And then essentially state board or DFA would look at funding any incremental increase in, in costs for other constituents of concern. Then once we're looking at uh, any potential interim solutions, kind of the administration and follow-up associated with providing those interim solutions, if the only constituent of concern is nitrate that's exceeding that maximum contaminant level, then the management zone would provide the funding. 
then, and if nitrate is not uh, at that level of concern, then DFA or the state board uh, provides the funding. So uh, then we may have situations certainly where nitrate and other constituents of concern are, are at elevated levels. And we'd have to look at that kind of on a case by case uh, basis and, and review that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what we're looking at, uh, you know, again, uh, some of the way we view this is uh, with the perspective of what our funding will allow us to fund, right? So there's the regulatory program that has a broader perspective in terms of providing well sampling, regardless of income level and that sort of thing, as well as solutions. Whereas a lot of our funding sources are um, uh, you know, defined more narrowly. So for example, to uh, target disadvantaged communities or low income households, especially with the safe and affordable drinking water fund that's tied into um, the funding restrictions associated with the greenhouse gas reduction fund. So we're looking at for uh, well sampling. And again, these are all sort of our initial thoughts. Uh, if the community has an annual MHI that or medium household income that uh, meets that disadvantaged community definition, then we would provide that um, funding again, not for the nitrate, but for the other constituents. And then um, for interim solutions, what we're looking at is actually finding out what the household income is. So when we're actually going to a residence and providing a, a solution, whether it's bottled water or you know, point of use, point of entry, that we'd need more information on the income level for that particular household. Uh, there are a couple of different approaches for, for co-funding. We already work with uh, self-help enterprises quite a bit in the area, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. So one is that nonprofit partner could um, apply on behalf of the management zones. They'd have, say, a separate agreement with the management zones in terms of administration, but then the uh, funding, uh, the co-funding would come uh, from us from the state board or the management zones could work directly with with us as well <clears throat> uh, in the interim because a lot of these funding agreements they take a while to uh, negotiate figure out what the parameters are and that sort of thing in the interim the management zones are already including in their letters uh, uh, contact information for self-help enterprises so we do have uh, agreements with self-help to do uh, sampling and provide interim solutions. So if you could go to the next slide, I'll touch on those. Uh, and again, self-help, they serve uh, a number of counties in the, in the Central Valley, that's their area. So we have a couple of different programs. Uh, one provides some uh, well testing, installation of point of use, point of entry de devices to treat whatever contaminants are there. There's actually a pretty good amount of funding uh, that we've provided through the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. There's also a regional uh, bottled water program, and that's uh, broader than just domestic wells, can uh, fund folks who are served by state smalls or public water systems. And then uh, Tulare County has a specific uh, bottled water program as well. Uh, let's see, next slide. And this kind of shows a map of the uh, service area for self-help. So you can see uh, versus the CV salts management zone. So you see the management zones fit within the self-help service area. So that can work out really well. I think there will be a lot of, um, you know, as the management zones are implementing their program, uh, you know, coordination with self-help will be really uh, critical and important. And I, as I understand it, self-help, I just was um, down in Visalia celebrating the retirement of one of their long-term employees last week, and they are getting inquiries already, um, and, which is encouraging. So that's, that's all I had. I'll turn it up, back over to Patrick and Anne to answer all your hard questions. I think next slide is just questions. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, anything further to add, um, Patrick or Ms. Walters? 
No, I think that that's about it. Um, Great. You know, I, I, I really appreciate uh, um, all the involvement from, you know, I, I know there was a big push from the state board from, from you to make sure that uh, there's interface between our programs, uh, the SAFER program, DDW, um, and the regional board, and, and all of those programs are, are actually relatively new. Uh, CV Salts is the, the older program <laughs> for once, and uh, uh, but you know it, it's one of those things where all the issues are continuing to evolve, and and so we're we're continuing to talk, um, and I think that the program is yielding some some pretty incredible benefits right now. Yeah, evolving at a, a very rapid pace um, as we see whether it's, uh, you know, drought impacts or just even our own scientific understanding of the challenges and then possible solutions. So, um, and uh, our agencies sometimes don't move that quick. And so it is really incumbent upon us to understand our uh, programs, begin to better integrate them and ensure that um, even if it's a complicated regulatory landscape, we have uh, in mind the common outcomes in our communities that I think we're all in common driving toward. So uh, really just uh, greatly appreciated. And, um, and thank you for the, the good overview of what is a lot of uh, coordination that is going on. And again, uh, much of it central to our minds here, certainly with the Safe and Affordable program. Um, I guess my, I have just a couple of questions. You know, on, on the point of use issue, um, you know, you did flag uh, appropriately, um, Mr. Palupa, that, you know, point of use, if you're going to install it, can't just be for nitrates, or if you, if it is, it has to understand that that is the only constituent of concern uh, in the household. Um, does that really shift then, I guess, a lot of that point of use discussion to, again, this integrated space between SAFER and the CV Salts program? And um, just kind of wondering if you have any sort of Thoughts. I know that you know all of this is always going to be specific unto the households and communities that we engage. You know whether it's the solutions or the contaminants that they have, but um, just wondering if you have any thought. I know that point of use and point of entry is a space that you know can continue to innovate perhaps and provide us um, solutions that you know we know these longer term so solutions like consolidation and even you know the larger built infrastructure solutions that may be out there take years. That's just how long it takes to, to really get pro projects in the ground. And so these point of use and point of entry solutions, uh, I know to some are, you know, a really important bridge. So just kind of wondering if you have any thought kind of in that, in that space between our two programs, how to, you know, how we might see the work ahead, or is it really kind of waiting for testing to come back, you know, specific uh, circumstances and starting to actually just do? Yeah, I, th I think the point of use is, um, I, 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 it's definitely a tool within the toolbox, but I think that when we have a lot of the conversations, when the management zones have a lot of these conversations with uh, uh, communities, the preference tends to be for bottled water. Um, and for a point of use system, we would insist, and for you know, specific for a point of use system where nitrate is the uh, constituents of concern, so a, no cost sharing agreement, nothing uh, you know, too exotic. Um, we would be requesting that there be a robust management program in place to make sure that the filters are addressed very quickly. And for point of use systems, you have to have property owner permission because you are kind of messing with the plumbing system. There's a few rental agreements that allow that to move forward absent a property owner uh, agreement. So I think it's a, it's a tool within our toolkit. Um, but I think in terms of uh, the quickest tool to deploy, it's usually bottled water. Um, so that's kind of the step that we're at in the evolution of this program. I think as we see more providers kind of step up and say, we've got the maintenance program, here's our track record. We go in, we, we make sure that these filters are deployed. And, you know, some of them have the, the lighting system that says, you know, you really need to replace it. And we never let a light go, go red. Um, those kind of discussions are, are things that we're continuing to talk with the management zones about. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think that they, 
you know, there are situations in, work they, in which they work well and situations in which they don't. Um, but all of that uh, presupposes that you do have uh, the maintenance plan in place and you have, you, you don't put the burden on a resident to kind of swap that out. You really make sure that there's uh, somebody coming in and doing the work responsibly, logging the work responsibly. So I think with that, it, it does get a little bit more complicated. I think that's kind of my probably a 30,000 foot overview. I know it's, it's a, it's a viewpoint uh, that, that uh, Dr. Longley and board member Kadara both share uh, point of view systems. It's kind of a healthy, healthy dose of skepticism uh, when those are being proposed because we really have to look into uh, whether the plan is sufficient to make sure that other water quality constituents or maintenance it doesn't become an issue and, and that these people's health is threatened again. Yeah, I know that there's communities in the Eastern Coachella Valley and uh, uh, nonprofit groups there that, again, uh, see it as a, an, an important um, solution potentially here. But to your point, though, it does have to be maintained properly. And it comes with, um, you know, it's not just easy as install and, and walk away. They need to be maintained properly. And as I understand it, the market um, really isn't there for the sorts of uh, systems that we're thinking of that would have the sort of safeguards you know, I think, as I understand it, most of the products out there have a, a red or green light, but it's only flow based. So, you know, when, you know, the machine isn't having enough flow, then trying to signal an issue, not water quality based, where there's somehow, a, you know, continuous monitoring of the quality of the water coming from the system. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot to explore there. Just thank you. I appreciate the comments and, and uh, the potential, again, for this space to, to fund what is you know, an increasing need certainly in, in communities, but to your point needs to be done right. So thank you. I just, the only other thing I was gonna say is uh, just incredible shout out uh, there at the end uh, from Joe. And I just wanna echo it to self-help for really being an incredible partner in all of this work. We wouldn't be able to do what we are able to do now. And even in the context of safe and affordable fund and the safer program, you know, the bottled, water, bottled water and whole uh, water program that we have and being able to be responsive to communities. Um, it really is off the partnerships of both self-help, but RCAC, uh, others out there, and just wanna give acknowledgement and thanks to their great work and helping us be successful here. Um, and then don't have any other uh, comment. We do have uh, some public commenters as well, but open it to fellow board colleagues. I just had um, a couple of questions. First of all, I wanna thank and add my thanks to all of you. This is really exciting and amazing. And I agree with you, uh, Mr. Palupa. Um, uh, a year ago, I, I didn't think that we would have this kind of discussion, um, but it's important to acknowledge um, as the chair already has that you know things are moving fast. There's a, a lot going on, especially if we start to look at the integration of these different programs. And so the question I have is, I think we're gonna be receiving these updates annually. So just wanna confirm that. Um, and then um, uh, I, I think that the integration piece is just really interesting. And I expect that in a year from now, there's gonna be so much more information there on the integration with the various funding programs that we have, especially with you know, some potential, potentially additional funding sources that we might receive as a result of this year's budget. But then also um, wanting to um, start to look at Sigma as well and I think uh, this time next year, we'll have a little more information um, on, the, um, on the GSPs and starting to ask questions about integration of the uh, GSPs. And I know that there are issues there with baseline that we can't just you know, assume that the GSPs are gonna be looking at uh, you know, this same um, set of issues but um, helping us to better structure how we consider integration um, with the Sigma program as well. And I can confirm they will be annual updates um, uh, that, that is in the amendment package that just, just uh, uh, went through um, a few minutes ago. Uh, but I will say that we're, we're also working and, and the letters kind of laid it out that we're working to make sure that we have uh, some pretty standardized, really top line numbers from the management zones. I know the Salinity Coalition and the management zone uh, uh, leaders are also working to do that. And it's just, you know, so that we, you know, I, I don't have a big digital 
um, display in, in my office. But, you know, if, if I did, it would be, you know, wells tested drinking water you know, provided to homes and, you know, uh, uh, fill stations operational. Um, and, and that's the type of information uh, we want to get very as real time as possible from the management zones to really understand kind of what the status is to understand whether there's a lag time, um, you know, if, if, if things are stagnating, what do we do about that? Um, you know, if the numbers are coming back different than what we expected. Um, so that is happening constantly. You know, that, that is something that we're, we're looking for all the time. We meet very regularly with the management zone folks. And certainly if a, if a hiccup comes up, uh, we'll we'll want to relay it to you too, kind of in the interest of of coordinating all these efforts and all these resources that are being deployed into this sector right now. Sorry, can I just ask a follow up question on that? I think Sean, I'll let you go more, but just on that particular issue, is um, is it possible to uh, you know, I know the regional board provides um updates to our executive officers report on some of the big programs like um, irrigated lands. Um, and I'm just wondering if some of those high level uh, updates, especially in this first year or maybe the first year or two, um, but can be included in um, just relayed up to us through the executive officers report or some way that isn't too burdensome, but allows us to <clears throat> track that as well a little, um, a little bit more. Yeah, no, that that's that's certainly we can do that. Um, my, you know, my executive officer's report does have a CV salt section. Uh, these numbers will be reported. Lots of other good stuff in there that we're trying to shrink it down a little bit because it's gotten to. I think the last one was seventy some pages. Um, uh, but you know, we're we're that's done every couple months. And so if that's information that we can kind of tease out, even just send that section uh, to your administrative staff to make sure that you get it, um, we'll do that. Um, although of course you want to read the whole thing, right? So much going on, um, but, but we'll get those numbers to you and, and, and uh, uh, on that interval, at least if, if that works for you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but Sean, you're welcome. I'll wait till after you go. <laughs> I was just going to quickly say, Mr. Palupo, when you said, you know, you'd have a, you know, if, if you had your way, you'd have like a, a screen up with, with certain numbers, you know, let's think of it as a dashboard in a way, you know, what, what does the dashboard look like for the program and what are those numbers that, you know, we'll see kind of tick up and down uh, or yeah, some up, some down, up on the number of engagement and solutions down on those number of communities impacted by the challenge. So um, yeah, would be great. Uh, and thank you, uh, board member. Board member McGuire. Great, well, thank you. Uh, a lot to dig into here today and just really phenomenal effort all, all around um, with Patrick, with you and your staff and the team that's been involved, Joe. Um, uh, Division of Financial Assistance really engaging here this past year to try and sort out uh, the, you know, the difficulties and really figure out who's responsible for what. Um, but at the end of the day, this is about safe drinking water for communities and for, for folks who are impacted. And so that's, you know, for, from the nitrate perspective and the early action plans, that's what I'm focused on. And so th th this discussion of, a, of the dashboard sort of intrigued me, but um, so, you know, for me, it's, you know, thinking about human right to water, um, our, our, you know, number that we keep going back to is, you know, a million Californians here without access to safe and reliable drinking water, you know, and for me, just as we go forward, getting a better sense for what, what is the portion of that population that's impacted that CB Salts is responsible for. So when we're thinking about metrics and we're thinking about making progress, I'm trying to figure out what is that benchmark that I'm measuring progress against and how much farther do we need to go in the coming years? So I don't expect those numbers today. I know it's difficult to pin down in some respects, um, especially when you're looking at domestic well owners and really not knowing everyone who, who is impacted currently and the moving water quality targets and all that. But uh, nonetheless, I think um, it will be really helpful and important for us to have that information as this program continues to evolve. Um, and then if I could, I have a couple of questions for you. And so one is uh, just a follow up on the well sampling program. Um, we talked about this um, a little bit in our briefing before, but um, so, you know, I appreciate that your work with working with the, uh, the well owner, sorry, the property owners, and in some cases, you know, where they decline um, the opportunity to sample those wells, you know, I'm still, again, concerned about the, 
the tenants, you know, the folks who are living in the homes or drinking the water. And I want to make sure that they have the ability to receive bottled water or to receive sampling, even if it's at their tap or, or otherwise, while you're working through the collaborative or the enforcement process with those property owners. So I'm hoping you could speak to a little bit of that just so we can ensure that folks who are interested in getting their wells uh, sampled or you know, are concerned about the quality of their water have you know, resources available to them. That's my first question. Yeah, no, I, and, and, and um, I, I think we're, we're actively working on it. I mean, I, the, the answer, you know, when people ask, well, who regulates these wells? Um, they're, they're not well regulated, right? Um, and uh, again, one of our thoughts about why it was framed, why the CV Seltz was initially framed as something that uh, uh, was uh, tied to the property owner is, again, related to the Central Valley Water Board's regulatory authority, um, extends to requiring information of property owners or facility managers. And uh, so that's really kind of the backstop and it's not the best. I think what we're doing as much as we can is projecting and saber rattling and saying, look, if you want the, res the enforcement resources of Central Valley Water Board bearing upon you, um, it is not going to be a comfortable endeavor. You know, you're probably going to come out with the short stick, um, you know, as you know, from your other enforcement matters that I know you've seen come across your desk. Um, it, it's ugly. You know, there's, there's very significant fines associated with that. Um, I think there's a burden shifting too uh, when the regional board is when you're refusing access to a sample a well for your residents. And the regional board needs that consistent with a with a regulatory program that it's enacted. We've got a stepwise process that we can utilize uh, to to get to that end result. But that usually will mean that the property owner will bear the burden of uh, uh, ultimately paying for that, and and potentially could get roped into the entire program. Whereas just allowing access to the well to be sampled uh, is really a lot easier for everybody. Um, so I think that's kind of how we're projecting it. The, the, the answer really is, and, and I know this has come up in other areas too, is that uh, we, in some cases, just have a, a, a sledgehammer to kind of pin that little nail in. Uh, and that's, so it's, it's not really necessarily proportional if we really want to kind of deploy enforcement resources uh, to get the, the results that we need. So, um, you know, we're strategizing, the Office of Chief of Counsel is strategizing with the Office of Enforcement, figuring out an easier way of doing this. This pops up in other areas too. Um, again, there's not a really straightforward kind of legislative uh, 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 path to get that done. There's no law that basically says you are required as a, as a landowner uh, to sample your well if you're going to rent it out to somebody uh, to make sure that you're not poisoning them if you're going to rent it out to somebody, which again, seems like an odd result. Um, I'm not in the drinking water sphere, except with respect to this program, um, but that's how California has set it up. Um, so I don't know if I have a great answer for you there, um, except to say that we're strategizing the best we can and, and uh, trying to make sure that uh, we get what's, what's needed to be done as quickly as possible. Certainly the, uh, uh, the management zones have an interest in avoiding that type of result because it chews up a lot of their resources that they could be uh, spending in better ways when somebody's refusing that. Um, so I think that's my way of answering. I will say we do have some of the numbers in terms of, of how of the proportion of a million of Californians who uh, lack access to clean, safe and affordable drinking water. Um, the number potentially affected by these management zones. So again, it's six management zones and priority one basins. This is kind of where most of the nitrate issues are concentrated, although there are other issues, is about 103,000. Um, and that ranges from the low end, the Chowchilla management zone, probably only about 400 people who are potentially impacted by nitrates upwards to um, Turlock. The estimate is around 37,000 and Kings is the big one with 47,000 residents potentially affected. Most of the others, um, Cahuilla has 3,000, Modesto 4,000, Thule around 10,000. Um, so that's kind of the numbers uh, that are basically um, uh, uh, suggested when we take a look at where uh, the nitrate numbers are high, compare that to census data numbers, compare that to um, some assumptions about how many wells are in use, look at some of the well screening data from the uh, uh, DWR database, 
that's kind of how we get get that hundred thousand ish number. Um, really, what we're doing is is targeting that one hundred thousand for additional testing, uh, and really trying to figure out uh, whether that number is a hundred thousand, and that's the scope of the bottled water replacement water uh, program, um, or, or whether we have something else that that whether that number goes up or goes down. Uh, really, is additional testing that needs to be done there. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, pulling those numbers out quickly. I appreciate that. I have to thank, I have to thank Ann. She kind of, all, all the management zone early action plans, they have those numbers in them uh, and pull them all. And I've got a spreadsheet on my desk that, <laughs> that, that tracks them. Yeah. And, and and thank you for your your response, your thoughtful response on the property owner dynamics. I know that's not an easy situation to work through. And I'm hoping that as we go forward here, you know, it can be minimized to the extent it is, but to the extent we need to look for other pathways to get the information and or to get those folks who are impacted um, safe drinking water. I think at the end of the day, that's what I'm looking for in terms of the interim solutions. Um, my second question, if I could, is for Mr. Karkowski, um, since I don't want to pick on Patrick too much more. Um, so so I, as you were presenting, I really appreciate your comments about the coordination, again, and how much you've accomplished in the work with um, self-help also in terms of, you know, their ability to provide bottled water. So I guess this just popped into my head, which was if self-help identified a community or folks who are to be receiving bottled water and it ends up being primarily due to nitrate, would they then transition that responsibility over to the management zones ultimately? Um, or actually, maybe this is a question for Patrick. Um, Basically, you know, we're, we're talking about coordinating responsibility, right? Whether it's multiple contaminants, whether it's just nitrate. And so if self-help identifies a, a community that's impacted, would they, would they flag that for the management zone to then take over ultimately? I guess that's my question. Yeah, I, I don't think we've had those conversations with self-help yet because I, I know when we've... Um, had similar discussions about the Tulare uh, County bottled water program and there's coordination there too. There, there's a lot of hesitancy about moving people from one provider to another. And so that's part of what I, I think we'd have to look at is how early in the process is it? Is it just like uh, the well sample was taken, nitrate's the only constituent. And now that the, uh, you know, the management zone programs are set up, there's a different potential landing spot, right? So yeah, I think that's a really good um, question and um, yeah, something we'll work with uh, self-help in the management zones on. I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, the, the responsibility uh, for the nitrates does rest in the management zones, but I think Joe's absolutely right. It's the, the tough part is making sure that there's a seamless transition. Um, and, and, and when you have a, an interim solution that's been worked out, uh, we don't want to interrupt that. And, and so I think that's, that's the challenge, but we, I mean, you know, just the, the complexities there, there's a lot of them. And this includes even some conversations uh, with DDW and Darren about what is what are the obligations of a small system that might be facing an enforcement order from the state uh, because they're serving nitrate impacted water. And then the management zone comes in with a bottled water program and, and they're like, hey, we're, we're good, right? You know, this, this obligation is suddenly taken off our hands. And, you know, we're working with, with Darren's folks to make sure that, you know, the district engineers aren't uh, left with a, an enforcement order that they can't enforce. So, Again, a lot of these, a lot of these interplays are even situations that we didn't envision when we adopted the regulations. Um, we're we're working on them. Lots, <laughs> lots of Zoom calls. I, I hopefully they'll they'll be replaced with a lot of in-person uh, conversations, or at least a, a few more in-person conversations. But that's kind of where we are. Um, and I think again, the focus is really the, the first phase: get those domestic wells in those areas where we're expecting nitrate exceedances to be all over the place, get those wells tested and get the bottled water out there. We'll, we'll kind of sort out some of the other stuff as the program uh, continues to evolve. Great, thank you, very helpful. Appreciate the responses. Thank you, board member. Board member Firestone, can I just to flag, I think we do have about eight folks um, to comment or so. Yeah. 
Um, just following up on those questions, um, you know, uh, maybe all of the complexities. So Joe, I, first of all, thank you so much to all of our staff at DFA and, um, and Division of Drinking Water and really going above and beyond trying to coordinate safer program with this effort. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as everyone's already said, thank you um, so much to the regional board for amazing work and leadership. Um, I think uh, really, I, I, I did watch all of the workshops um, actually, and just really appreciated the clear leadership and messaging and support um, to make this successful. So thank you all. Um, I, uh, so following up on that question, Joe, I, and actually, I think this was sent to everyone, um, both the regional and state boards and management zones, um, but I, you know, there was a letter that self-help sent that basically said they, they are declining to provide um, services around this. Um, I think I understood that as um, directly through contracts with management zones um, for, uh, and, and listed a number of, of constraints and concerns. And a big one, you know, partly there's a lot of administrative coordination that is really burdensome um, and concerns around um, private wells uh, and the interaction with drought right now and really low level well, uh, low wells with very low water levels. Um, but, uh, I, you know, there is also just concern around capacity of to be able to meet the, you know, volume of need that this is talking about, um, which is huge. And I, um, I'm wondering if um, we are looking at, or if we have any strategies we've identified. I know you went through, you know, where an option is to contract directly with management zones. I know that takes a little bit of time to set up. Um, and uh, another uh, one of the programs you showed was around Tulare County's program that's already funded. Um, but I'm just looking at, are there strategies we have um, for looking at those capacity limitations um, right now around these other contaminants um, to complement you know, the work that, um, and like the volume that management zones are taking on? Yeah, and I, I the the way I understood that um, letter was the capacity limitations. I think aren't necessarily around fulfilling their current obligations to us, right? Where we already have existing funding agreements, it's formally taking on um, additional roles with this, you know, five or six additional management zones, right? That that becomes really challenging administratively. And, and they're also looking at, which we're looking at too, in sort of a triage mode is if people's wells are running dry, obviously there's not much to sample and you want to focus on getting them hauled water, right? It, it, that's usually the solution, hauled water and bottled water. So that's something as, you know, we move um, forward through the summer, we'll certainly be talking to self-help about as kind of our primary provider in that area is how to triage between those uh, competing needs and demands, right? Because um, that's the other thing when we've talked to them recently, the we, we just entered and uh, executed an agreement with them for hauled water, and we're already amending it to put in a lot more money um, because there's such huge demand. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think there, there is sort of a, you know, we may collectively need to um, uh, kind of change our expectations a bit. You know, we're very hopeful that we'd be able to do a lot of uh, domestic well sampling just under the self-help program and then deploy POE or POE in bottled water uh, where needed. But of course, they're going to prioritize and we are if people just don't have water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like we can, we, if needed, we could um, at least increase the amount of funding if that would, that could, um, if that would support them being able to cover additional. 
areas. Yeah. The- and, and I, I think the, you know, the slide that I had there, there's a pretty healthy amount of funding, right? <laughs> right now. It's a lot more than we've ever had before. And we, you know, uh, we just executed that agreement. And certainly when we bring the fund expenditure plan to the board, plus whatever resources we might get, you know, through the, through the budget, I think that's another space where we'll consider how much greater investment we should make, not just in the Central Valley, but statewide on domestic well sampling and then providing um, interim and longer term solutions. Yeah. Um, okay. And then my other question um, related to all of this is I really appreciate the slide. I think Patrick, you had with, um, you know, the contaminants we've already identified as very high risk in those management zone areas beyond nitrate. Um, and so we know that there's a co-contamin- high risk of co-contaminants um, and which which even further um, emphasizes the need to have, uh, you know, this more um, kind of robust and and one-stop shop uh, well testing to be able to inform residents whether their water is safe um, beyond nitrates. And and we've talked about all of those challenges. Um, I'm wondering if there's, ways that we have or could do a better job of sharing um, the specific contaminants of concern in each region that have already been identified through the um, these high-risk aquifer maps um, uh, with both the management zones and then more concretely with the residents when we're when there's outreach going on so that they have a more concrete sense of of you know, specific contaminants and maybe the need, um, the importance of and relevance of, um, of doing additional testing. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's an easy answer because that's being done. Um, and I think Daniel Kozak can, can talk a little more to that. Um, I, did, I didn't want to be uh, remiss. I know there's a lot of shout outs going on to state board staff, uh, John Borkovich and his work uh, uh, for the uh, risk mapping and, and that team. Also, Office of Public Participation was instrumental in setting up uh, a lot of these meetings, including the uh, uh, web forum that we held. So I, I just want to make sure that they get some credit in, in getting moving this whole process, this whole juggernaut forward. Um, they really helped with some of the messaging that we did out there. But yes, in terms of getting that information into the hands of the residents, that that is a key component. And with respect to, to self-help, I mean, I, I think it's um, uh, uh, some of the comments were, were not even necessarily towards resources and funding. It's just people power. Um, you know, there's you, you, even if you had infinite resources, you can't necessarily kind of just throw money at it and expect that you have people who can navigate that that area. So I know everybody's kind of feeling constrained. The drought, you know, is really having a big, big uh, impact on a lot of people's lives and, and drinking water sources. Um, we're cognizant of that. You know, the nitrate you know, management plan uh, management zones are saying we're going to move forward with nitrate testing. We really, really, really want to make sure that we have people uh, who we can give a handshake to and get additional uh, well testing, but we got to move forward with the nitrate component. Um, I know self-help is saying, look, we're, we're at our limit right now. Uh, we can't necessarily get uh, an additional agreements to do to make sure that those programs mesh up, but we'll do our best, I think is kind of what we're hearing. And certainly, uh, you know, Joe and his team have a lot of carrots that they can uh, deploy to say, you know, do your best and here's some incentive to, to continue to do those multi-constituent testing. So it's, it's not, it's not a huge kind of crippling uh, effect uh, on the nitrate control program. It does have some effect on it um, that the management zones are still kind of absolutely uh, going to be deploying resources to get the nitrate testing. We just, it would be nice uh, if we can get the other constituents tested for at the same time. Great. Um, yeah, I have some other comments and questions, but I think I will do that after um, public comment. Thank you, board member. Uh, Chair Longley, I see you have your hand up. Oh, thank you very much. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say, once again, back on point of use devices, uh, very definitely, I have my concerns about them because you ha- actually have to go into the house, which 
maybe the folks are at home or you're invading their privacy. A lot of reasons that uh, make them uh, unsatisfactory. Point of entry, it's better at least it's outside the house and you can sample and so forth. Um, move on and talk about uh, comments about board member Firestone made uh, concerning self-help. I think she's right on. The only problem we have with self-help is we don't have enough self-helps. And uh, there, the resource issue there, I think Patrick touched on it a bit too. It's a capacity issue. How we address that, there's other folks out there, RCAC and others who uh, are in, in that uh, realm of providing services. And that is something I think needs to be addressed. Um, this program is so unique and so important that we have to make sure it has not just success, but overwhelming success. With that said, I think we need to start the dialogue now about special districts or some other entity. And I believe I've spoken with you about this, certainly spoken to board member Firestone, but we need to start talking about how we can put clean water in the house at the tap. And that's going to take at least 2,500, 3,000 or more connections. How do we get there? It doesn't always have to be a pipe. And uh, I, I think, but we need to start this dialogue. Uh, there is funding that is available and will be coming available soon uh, that uh, could be used for this. If we wait, if we put this dialogue off, it, we may miss an opportunity. So I think it's important that we begin that dialogue. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you for your good comments and contributions here, uh, uh, Chair Longley. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair, did you want yes, to? Uh, um, yes, please. Just a comment. Uh, this is in regards to the point of use option. Uh, while I know it poses some issues, um, my concern is that to uh, supporting um, the point of use is the fact that we use the dollars that link to a long-term solution uh, versus short-term and inconveniences and the excessive use of the plastic being used. Um, I know there's maintenance and other constituents that pose concerns, but uh, there should be a nexus in the process instead of gaps that still have to link to a long-term solution. So I don't know what that is, but I think while we're still in this process, we need to give some consideration to how the dollars are being spent and that they link to a long-term solution. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, Vice Chair Kadara. Good, good points. Thank you. Okay, I think we uh, can move on to uh, some public comment. I'd like to first call up and go do a uh, Tume. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Or Yes, good afternoon now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and the board members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Godo Atsume. I'm with Clean Water Action, and I'm speaking in alignment with my colleagues from Community Water Center and Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. I appreciate the conversation we're having regarding coordination here. And I want to echo three brief comments on that. Firstly, on the issue of coordination with the SAFER program, we continue to be concerned about the lack of coordination between these programs like we're talking about. And management zones have begun implementation of their well testing, which unfortunately includes testing for only nitrate. Now, while the BPA is clear that management zones are only responsible for nitrate testing, and for the costs associated with nitrate contaminated drinking water. We are concerned that some residents impacted by other contaminants may get a false sense of security that their water is safe for drinking. I want to highlight that there's an urgency to see this coordination happening, bearing in mind that at the other end, there are people that are drinking contaminated water and using that water with their families and with their children. We believe that it is to the success of both programs that this testing happens simultaneously and definitely to the benefits of impacted residents. Secondly, we recommend the utilization of the aquifer risk assessment tool 
to identify other potential contaminants that might be present in drinking water based on local conditions. And I appreciate the compilation that the regional board presented um, during the presentation of that list. We recommend that residents be notified of those potential contaminants. Finally, because of the potential for nitrate concentration variability, there needs to be more frequent follow-up testing where wells are very close to the MCL or above 7.5 milligram per liter. Relying upon trend data or testing wells one, one year after initial test is insufficient and it puts communities at risk. It also ignores the fact that there's seasonal fluctuations and well tests carried out once a year can miss the time of the year when contaminant level rises above MCL. So we strongly recommend frequent well testing and not just once a year. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you for the conversation we're having on this. Thank you so much, Mr. Tumek, for your contributions and for your flags here. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Debbie Ors. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Debbie Ors with Community Water Center. Um, so I would like to speak on a couple issues today. Um, like my colleague Godo mentioned, my comments are in line with my colleagues at Clean Water Action and Leadership Council. Um, the two I'd like to talk on first is on community engagement. While um, and some of the management zones did, you know, put in um, some effort on community engagement and um, acknowledging that COVID restrictions have made it more difficult. There are quite a number of ways that the management zones could be doing more even with COVID restrictions. Um, many are relying uh, a little too heavily on electronic engagement or at least noticing. Um, we've noticed that some of the management zones will ask, oh, should we be noticing meetings via social media, emails, um, but ignoring that public spaces are still being accessed by people and that public spaces should be where notices of meetings are still being posted. Um, and, and most of the management zones have been very receptive to us bringing up those comments, but um, it is something that we have to keep bringing up that not everybody has access to the internet or regularly checks the internet for, for issues such as uh, this safe drinking water program. Um, so we need to be seeing more mailers. Some of the management zones uh, have not even done mailers yet or they're planning to send out mailers soon. Um, it's really kind of behind, uh, behind and where we should be right now. Um, these plans really should have been created in conjunction with communities rather than uh, solutions being developed and hoping that they work for communities. Um, the other issue is with advisory committees. Some of the advisory committees um, are not adequately incorporating communities within those seats. Uh, the advisory committees for development and implementation are largely made up of dischargers with a couple seats for NGOs um, and some have community members on their advisory committees. Um, these, th these spaces really should have a, a sizable community presence as that is the point of the BPA um, and the State Water Board's resolution. Um, and then the second item we've touched on um, so, uh, several times so far is the issue of metrics. Um, and I'm really uh, happy to hear that the Regional Water Board is expressing a very strong commitment to public transparency of the metrics. Um, really would love to hear when you know, a dashboard or a public space. Uh, so I just got to notice that the meeting's being recorded randomly in the middle of my talking points. Um, but We'd like to see these, I'd like to hear when that metric or when those databases would be public. Um, you know, some of the information like Ann brought up about hearing the average usage for the kiosks is 480 gallons a day. 
But when are those, when are the high use points? Um, is that largely coming from one or two points of the day causing very long lines to be forming? Um, is something really important to know and it, uh, key for identifying whether or not more kiosk locations or just another kiosk next to the first is necessary to prevent, to make sure that access is easy uh, for everybody utilizing the kiosks. Um, and we'd also like to see that this um, information is updated monthly um, or at the very minimum quarterly, but monthly is really gonna be key for identifying issues early on uh, before they become a more serious problem, especially since as Patrick uh, mentioned earlier, that installing a kiosk can take months um, and we really don't want to have people be forced to wait in very long lines or be without a solution for months if we can't uh, remedy the issue before it becomes serious. Um, so thank you all for um, having this meeting today and, and really discussing this and look forward to continuing to work with everybody. Thank you, Ms. Orris, for your engagement and for your good comments today. And sorry for what I think was just a technical blip. Uh, the stream started and stopped there for you, but uh, I, we still captured everything. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Palupa, I see you. Did you want to make some um, response here? OK, just, just coming back on. OK. Just available. <laughs> OK, thank you. And thank you again, Ms. Orris. Uh, next, we have Michael Prado. And Michael, um, we've given you the opportunity to unmute on your phone, on a phone that, that is a star six, if you wish to speak. Can you hear me now? We can. Good Hello. afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, board and Mr. Chair. My name is Michael Prado, and I live in uh, the northern edge of Tulare County and the central San Joaquin Valley. Um, I have a few things here I'd like to talk about is uh, what I think is important to highlight is the fact community member engagement is, a, is central to the success of the EAPs and yet your participation is expected despite the fact you are not being paid to engage in things like advisory committee committees. Um, I was in the process when of the AB 685, uh, advocating for it to pass. Um, very proud to say it was a long journey, but we did it. Part of the AWA coalition. Um, I know from many years of experience that processes like these often do a poor job of including community members and incorporating our concerns and feedback. This is why I try to participate when I can. However, participating in these processes can take a significant amount of time. I am not participating as part of my job. I have other commitments, including serving as the presiding president of the Sultana uh, Severely Disadvantaged Community I am also not alone in wanting to help develop drinking water solutions, but being concerned about the demands on my time. Incentives like a stipend for participating in the advisory committee could help residents from disadvantaged communities. Members were being asked to do this work for free. This is despite the fact that were supposed to be central to the process and our involvement is required by the regulation. And last but not least, I am very, very strong passion for water. I serve on our water board, proud to say for 26 years. And we have uh, taken months in off of the contaminated uh, domestic wells and put in a new well for the community and RCSD went ahead and took them in. And now we are part of us. So we're gonna run three miles of pipeline to consolidate people along the way also, three miles stretch of pipeline. 
And to I was listening to some of the comments about uh, people not wanting to get their wells tested and this and that. Well, the people along the way have an opportunity uh, once in a lifetime to get connected. And there are a lot of people along the way that don't want to know what's underwater. They don't care what's underwater. And, you know, they don't want to let nobody go on the property to test it. Other people, there's 1,2,3-TCP, there's chromium, there's nitrate, um, and it's bad, high. So with that being said, I'm also a member of a Safer Advisory Group meeting. Uh, I was part of the Sigma organization that formed uh, KWA Stakeholder and Advisory Committee, uh, Rural Community Leadership Institute, Water Commission meetings I attend, GSA meetings I attend, Irwin meetings, and California Equity and Water Affordability Crisis. Thank you very much for your time. And it's going to take everybody to make this happen, but we can do it. Let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Prado, for more importantly, your time. Um, again, a uh, point well taken that we don't often well resource communities to engage in what are complicated regulatory landscapes. Uh, you know, the soup of programs you just named and your engagement in them is um, just very much appreciated. So just thank you for, for your contributions and for continuing to contribute to, as you rightfully said, a generational opportunity here amongst us all. And uh, again, I know very well that um, it, it comes at cost for many community members to engage in this. And so just thank you. Uh, next, we have Tess Dunham. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, Tess Dunham with Conserves and Conway. And I think as you know, said before, Daniel Cozen and I have kind of been running point on behalf of the management zones in a number of these conversations that have been going on with the, the regional board and DFA and uh, environmental justice folks and self-help and many others. And so it has been a whirlwind of activity and also with the management zones. And, you know, I do want to, you know, call out too that the significant efforts of the management zones themselves to get up and running within a very short time period. A lot of work, a lot of collaboration that went forward to basically develop six new organizations. A lot of them are in the process of, you know, obtaining a nonprofit status. They've submitted applications with the, with, you know, the IRS and others. And that was no small feat to do all of that within such a short time period. And so just wanna make sure that there's an understanding of all the effort that went into actually getting the management zones um, created and putting them forward. I also wanna you know, just make one comment real quickly on some of the budgetary financial issues. And then I have a couple of kind of some of these broader policy issues that we've come up against, which I think is worth commenting on. And first of all, um, you know, I think, you know, in all of the development of these management zones that we have, the six that are now up and running, that, you know, the, the significant effort and involvement has been great across the board with food processors and wineries and, you know, POTWs. But in all of the management zones, you know, 80% of it is probably on the backs of irrigated ag and dairies. And so, you know, we have proven over the years in our irrigated lands programs and in our dairy program that we um, do step up and self-fund and have never, you know, short shrifted those programs um, in, in implementing them. So I think our track record in showing how we've implemented these programs, which is mostly funding the management zones, you know, hopefully will go a long way when we talk about, you know, budgeting. We've been able to prove that we have the mechanism through our, you know, either acreage or per dairy fees in order to fund these very large programs in the Central Valley. But I do want to bring up, I think there's been some great questions from board members that really do highlight some of the kind of the broader policy issues that we've been running up against. And I know Joe touched upon it um, a little bit, but we are seeing where we have this sometimes, you know, kind of a divergence of potential policy, right? Self-help through the SAFER program and the nitrate and the management zones, we have different expectations. And through the SAFER program, as Joe indicated, there are, you know, income um, eligibility requirements, and we don't have that on the nitrate program. And so as we run up and we talk about coordination between the programs, which we agree is absolutely essential. I do think we need to have some discussions about some of these key policy issues 
it makes it very difficult for a nitrate management zone to go out and look at doing well testing and for co-contaminants and then saying, oh, you don't make an income restriction. I can only test for nitrate. I can't test for the other constituents. So I do think that, you know, we, we may want to think about how do we do that? Um, should we have income rest restrictions, at least on the sampling side? Because it does make it very difficult for a management zone to think about bringing in co-contaminant testing. If they have to then go out and ask the, the resident, I can only sample for one constituent because you don't meet the eligibility requirement for multiple constituents. And so I think this is a key issue we need to think about. Similarly, we run into some of the same conflict when we talk about the difference between the need of transparency for public data and the need for privacy concerns. You know, um, board member McGuire, you made you know, the comment about wanting to make sure that tenants have the ability to have their wells tested. Well, if we test that well, we have to post that result on GeoTracker and a management zone is going to be very uncomfortable with posting a result on GeoTracker with the latitude and longitude specifically called out if the owner of that well has no idea that well's been tested and is now um, part of a public database. And so we do have, again, these conflicting policies between requirements for posting on GeoTracker um, and the, you know, and how do we, you know, deal with privacy rights. And we, as the management zone, don't have the same authority that the regional board has we're kind of more of an intermediary offering the service, wanting to offer the service. And so, you know, we are letting people know before we test the well that the information will become public. We feel we absolutely have to do that. Um, and it has, we are seeing early on that it is um, getting some people returning their application, making it a little bit slower. We don't know for yet how long or what that total impact will be. But the posting of all this information on GeoTracker does seem to be um, causing some people some concern of about having their well tested. And maybe it's because they don't understand GeoTracker and they don't understand what that means or doesn't mean to them. But I think that is a potential impact that we are seeing that we may want to talk about on a broader policy perspective as we talk about how do we bring all of these programs together. Um, I think another issue that came forward, as we've talked about, is the whole, you know, the, the drought and the impact with respect to well levels. Um, you know, we're still planning to test for nitrate. I do think that, you know, there is some concern is what does that mean as far as if the well is so short with respect to, you know, being even viable to pump, um, what does that mean with respect to whether we take a nitrate sample or not, and whether there's some consistency we should be looking at as we are implementing, at least under the drought conditions? That has been an issue and a question that's come up with the management zones. A couple of other things to think about, as Anne indicated, when we go into the priority two areas in the latter half of 2022, a number of our priority two areas will not be within the self-help service area. Right? We start getting into Yellow County and further up north where self-help doesn't provide services. Is there a you know, comparable um, you know, organization where that coordination could still occur in our priority two areas? Again, kind of thinking, where are we going with respect to all of this? So, you know, just, um, I don't have the answers. I think we've been having these conversations, trying to find what these answers are. Uh, we know that they will evolve with time. Um, and right now, my real time is daily in talking to the various management zones. Um, Patrick and Anne have been awesome in making themselves available at, on a very you know short time frame when we have questions as to saying, hey, this is a question's come up. We haven't anticipated. Here's our gut reaction, how we're going to handle it and making sure they're in agreement. Yeah, that sounds like that's an appropriate pathway to move forward, at least for now. And we may adjust over time. But uh, we appreciate the, the ability here today. I know we will continue to work through all of this. And again, you know, we uh, we do want the coordination. And in fact, I just as I like to remind everybody, the reason why we have SAFER is in a large part because of the conversations that started in that CV Salts room. 
And so we, it is in all of our interest to make sure we have coordination. And we absolutely agree with previous speakers that we wanna make sure that people are not left with a false sense of security, which is why we worked very closely with DFA, self-help, the regional board, and trying to make sure we had a crafted letter that tried to make sure that when we are just testing for nitrate and a result is conveyed, that we are not leaving any type of false sense of security, false sense of security with respect to their drinking water. But that is, you know, that's kind of stop get. That as has said, that isn't great. That's not a great thing just to let them know that, oh, there might be other contaminants. You want to be able to let them know one way or the other. Um, but it's what we have for the moment, why we try to work out some of these other policy, you know, conflicts between the programs and hope that we can try to get that resolved. But I think we'd all like to do that. So thank you. Thank you as well, Ms. Dunham, for your long-time engagement and all of this. And again, just the good faith, I think, uh, common outcomes that we've all identified here uh, amongst what is um, no easy set of circumstances or programs that we have, but uh, we'll do our best. So thank you. Uh, I, next sorry, we have- Can I just follow up with- Of course. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And I do wanna just um, re-emphasize that it is the um, leaders that are the management zone leaders and that have been part of CV SALTS um, and particularly in the agricultural and dairy communities that were the leaders with, um, with environmental justice organizations and others to get the safer program at all. Um, and that is huge and I think indicates a um, common goal and investment in ensuring that everyone can access safe drinking water and that we all are partners in trying to get that to happen. Um, I know that um, Emily Rooney um, and, um, uh, oh my gosh, why am I so <laughs> am I gonna say? David, David Corey. <laughs> David <laughs> Corey um, are on the advisory group. Thank you. Um, long time already before lunch. Um, but, uh, that are on the advisory group. And so I just really encourage, um, you know, in a, in a number of these uh, policy issues that you brought up, particularly, well, um, particularly around um, prioritization of funding um, for us, that that is a really good space to be um, providing comments within how we're setting the guidelines and priorities for the SAFER program that I, I think is um, an, you know, we're in the time period about to enter it when we're gonna be providing guidance on um, the fund expenditure plan and therefore a lot of that. So I think this is really good timing to be bringing that into those discussions. Um, I, the private well testing and support for those interim solutions is an area that, um, you know, is ripe for reflection and continued and uh, evolving thought um, in within our safer program. Um, and I know as a priority within uh, the advisory group has brought that up over and over again. Um, uh, I also think that um, as you highlighted and we've talked about with um, the limitations of just capacity to do the work, um, you know, self-help is amazing and they're doing vital work and it can't all be on one organization alone. And so I really appreciate, um, you know, those management zones that are actively working with, with the SAFER program to see if they might be able to step up to provide some of those services directly if, um, if we can partner and provide some support for that. Um, I just think we're gonna, you know, a, a significant limiting factor for accomplishing the scope of what we want to do is, is just, do we have enough people going out to sample and, um, and provide and get people enrolled and all of that. So I just think the management zones are a key partner in that, um, understanding the limitations that they have and that, you know, they don't have an obligation to do all of that, but I know share these same, um, goals in terms of ensuring people have safe drinking water and that we want to be a, a partner in that. Um, and then lastly is just, um, I, um, you know, I, I think 
these early action plans are early action. It's like, what can we do now? And it's in everyone's interest, certainly the safer programs, certainly the management zones, certainly the GSAs and communities um, to be able to accelerate those long-term solutions and make sure that individual residents are not this vulnerable and don't have to rely on, you know, bottled water deliveries forever. And that's really is an area of alignment in terms of all of our goals and interests. And so I just really encourage us to, um, to partner in accelerating those solutions as well and um, find opportunities to do that. Again, I just, I think there's such um, exciting uh, momentum and potential and already early signs um, and commitment that's been shown with management zones to, um, to really make this successful and just wanna make sure that we're building on that and, and kind of emphasize how important that's gonna be for our shared success and especially with the safer programs and, and the state's overall goals. That wasn't really a question to you, but it was a chance to talk with you. And I think hopefully you can share, um, you know, some of that with the management zones that you're working closely with. And I certainly, um, you know, know our staff have been um, incredibly committed to trying to make sure we're partnering and finding ways to do that. And if there's ways that I can be helpful or that we can do more, look forward to doing that. Thanks. Thanks, Laurel. And, and you know, the, the management zones are definitely, you know, looking at this, this co-funding matrix, this proposed co-funding matrix, and how if, if you know, at least now, whether if, if a self-help type organization capacity wise, it just isn't going to work, how can the self, can, how can the management zone become, you know, a sister type of organization doing that? And I think that, you know, to be honest, I think we need to find ways to, how do we incentivize a management zone to take on more than just nitrate, right? Because it is, you know, under the basic plan amendment, they have one area that they are required to, to address and they have the ability to take on others. But I think how do we incentivize that through the safer funds? And if there is a way in the cost sharing to make it more of an, an incentive for the management zones, you might it might be easier for us to convince them as to the um, the need and the benefit of doing so. And some of that might be looking at some of these you know longer term solutions by doing the whole co contaminant testing. We'll have a better idea what the problem is up front, so then we can accelerate what those potential longer term solutions are. So I do think that we need to and your co comment about the funding expenditure plan and the guidance is a great one. And we need to kind of really look at how do we mesh these programs, which we've always, always have thought needed to be, you know, coordinated and meshed together. Yeah, and to your earlier comment, and thank you, board member. Um, and to your earlier comment, um, we're born from the same discussion in many ways, so um, should very much be uh, uh, coordinated. So thank you. Thank you both. Um, next, I'd like to call up uh, Daniel Kozad. Well, luckily, um, between Tess and uh, and Laurel, I think uh, you covered all the items that I was going to mention because I think I, I, you know when you spend a lot of time talking together uh, over years, you begin to understand the other side's issues and where they're coming from. So I, can, especially considering that uh, that probably everybody's as hungry as I am, I don't have anything further. Thank you. That's kind of you. Thank you, Mr. Kozad. I appreciate your, your good comment nonetheless. Uh, next, then we have Michael Claiborne. Good afternoon. And I think I'll keep everyone for another couple of minutes before lunch. Um, so I'd first echo the comments of Clean Water Action and Community Water Center, and also the great comments of Mr. Prado about the need to support residents so that they have the capacity to engage in and inform the implementation of this program. Adding to their comments, I have three points, all of which have already been touched on, but deserve some additional emphasis. Uh, the first is coordination between CV salts and the SAFER program is important so that households don't have to try to interact with two different programs and to, to give a complete picture of what the water quality is that the household is re relying upon. Self-help is a logical partner, but as has been discussed, my understanding is that their capacity is limited in the short term as folks deal with drought impacts on access to drinking water. So there's an urgent need in my view to further explore direct cost sharing relationships between the state board and the management zones 
and I'm encouraged that those conversations are taking place. I think there's an urgent need to reach some sort of cost sharing agreement. Uh, like board member Firestone mentioned, I think one, one stop shop is really the goal here. Residents shouldn't have to figure out two different programs. Second is the requirement for landlord consent. Uh, any policy issue, it seems, that touches on landlord-tenant relationships gets thorny quickly, and the discussion today reflects that complexity. However, in contrast to the complexity of the policy issue, the concern is simple and con concrete. Without access to well testing, tenants are at risk of exposure to unsafe drinking water, and a requirement for landlord consent reduces access to, to well testing. So we remain concerned that restricting well testing to those properties where landlord approval is obtained will in practice preclude many residents from accessing drinking water solutions that work best for them. There are many reasons why someone may be unable to obtain landlord approval. Their landlord may be completely unresponsive. A landlord may refuse to allow well testing out of concern, I think unjustified, that a well test showing unsafe water will result in lower property values. And a resident may even be reluctant to ask for permission to test a well out of fear for retaliation or eviction. We need a comprehensive testing program that allows anyone who is served by a domestic well or state small water system to have their water tested to determine the safety of the water coming into their homes. We remain unaware of any specific legal restriction on funding well testing when a tenant with right of access has granted permission. At minimum, there must be an alternate procedure for tenants that, that do not have landlord approval, for example, test kits dropped off at certain labs with testing paid for by the management zone. While the ability to obtain a, a warrant may convince some landlords to consent to well testing and may be useful in some cases, it's, unlike, it's likely time consuming and burdensome enough that it will not often be used and is thus not by itself an adequate solution. And then finally, a point I made earlier today, but I think needs to be emphasized, um, is that as we see draft manage, management zone implementation plans later this year, it's important to remember that 35 years for compliance with the nitrate water quality objective is a ceiling, not a floor. All time schedules need to be as short as practicable. Thank you and look forward to working with everyone throughout implementation. Thank you as well, Mr. Claiborne. Appreciate your good comments. Thank you. And mm -hmm. go Sorry, on. I don't know if you're moving on or if you had more comments. I just had a quick question for Michael. Um, so I uh, just encourage you, I think this issue of landlord monitor or, you know, landlord tenant issues, again, um, to the extent that we, that we can work through policy issues around through the safer program and the fund expenditure plan and kind of work there, I think, um, I mean, probably won't be specifically within the fund expenditure plan, but in terms of how we're prioritizing and what restrictions we have, um, just encourage you to participate in that. I know you already are, but um, I think that's an important space to remember that um, that we have to, to be clear on um, how funding can be used. Yeah, and I think uh, it speaks to the importance of the funding agreements then directly again with uh, the, the, um, the management uh, zones in order to be able to actually be successful here. So and especially since self-help in their letter is identifying that their capacity isn't necessarily there, it'll mean that there's even more focus on these direct agreements with our program and the management zones. So thank you, board member. Thank you, Mr. Claiborne. And last, we have Catherine Robinson. Yes, Good thank afternoon, you. Robinson. Thank you for your patience. No, no problem. Actually, I'm only um, uh, here attending in case there are questions. We submitted comments together with Santa Clara University. Um, I just want to reiterate or just say that I really appreciate um, the thorough responses from the Central Valley Water Board as well as the State Water Board to our, our comments um, and the, the real um, authentic, genuine um, consideration and serious conversation here is, is much appreciated. So if there are questions, I'm here, but I don't have any other further comment um, to add. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, your good contributions and appreciate everyone's time and discussion here today. It was a good morning, meeting morning around the CV Salts program. And um, at this point, you know, again, knowing that our, our, I think the area that I'm most interested in hearing is just our timelines 
on potential funding uh, agreements with directly with the, the management zones to ensure this better, safer coordination, especially given the letter and capacity challenges that rightfully self-help and uh, that we heard from self-help. And then otherwise, um, I know it was flagged as we move into the next tranche of management zones um, in areas that aren't necessarily served by self-help, already starting to think maybe how we might model a, you know, or, or find other organizations uh, to work with um, and ensure that we have that capacity lined up as we continue to um, move on to other priority basins in this program. But um, so just that's just kind of my flag for what I'll be interested to hear. Again, timelines for our funding agreements and then plans for this next tranche. And um, other board members, comments. I know we've, you know, it's, it's, we've, we've blown, we're gonna be having a very late lunch here. Uh, we'll have about uh, 30 minutes or so and then have uh, a meaty afternoon to dig into uh, around drought. But uh, before we close off uh, this informational item, anything further direction, question uh, from, from my fellow board colleagues? Great, okay, hearing none. Just thank you everyone. This Great officially, time. oh yes. Oh, please, please do. Board uh, guys, uh, one of the things, uh, by the way, thank you to everyone and, and thank you especially to all my board members for all the questions and comments you made earlier. You've addressed a lot of what um, was I was concerned about, but I did want to just emphasize one of the comments that I believe it was Ms. Orris um, who, who raised it, and this is directed to uh, Mr. Palupa, and I, I know he um, is um, going to be keeping an eye on this along with everything else associated with this, uh, this very ambitious effort. And that is, that was her comment regarding metrics and transparency and updating information on a monthly basis. Um, you know, I think those are all you know, very uh, uh, logical requests to be making. And obviously, as you know, the issue of transparency is, is important to all the water boards. And one um, about metrics is has been important to us as well. So I wanted to ask um, if Mr. Palupa wanted to address any of those uh, aspects. I, absolutely, and I think I, I got to a few of them, um, uh, but I was certainly writing down a lot of notes there. Um, I will say I think uh, Ms. Orris mentioned a dashboard. I, I know that was uh, that might have been Chair Esquivel's idea, so I don't know if I'm obligated to put one of those together. Um, but I think the the, <laughs> the, the response, you know, uh, I'm I'm sure we've got somebody who can cook something up. Um, but but I think the uh, 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 you know our our response and, and my response is is really um, to try and get the information compiled at our level in uh, my executive officer report. Um, I'll continue to work, you know, with um, the CV Salts Executive Committee, uh, the leadership at the Central Valley Water Board, and stakeholders to see what their top line asks are, um, and in terms of what, what are the what's the big picture numbers, what what can tell you whether this program is working or not, um, and get that information uh, into our executive officer report, which happens on a. An, I know uh, uh, Ms. Orr said on a monthly, it might, might be a, a bi-monthly, so every couple months we'll, we'll get that information out there um, and get it to you and uh, see if, if we can add or, or subtract from that. Um, it's something we already do, but I think we're going to be tracking it in a little, trying to make it compatible, make the management zone uh, numbers all kind of sync up so we can compare apples to apples and then get that information to you um, and, and, you know, as quickly as we can uh, to, to really you know, gauge the, the temperature of this thing uh, as it moves forward. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palupa. And thank you, board member, for a good follow-up question. Okay, I think that concludes our uh, information. I, oh, I have uh, one quick share. comment. Yes. One oh, quick please. comment. Yes, Vice Chair. Uh, just to follow up on what Mr. Prado had indicated earlier, and as we've talked about with community engagement, and it's, I've mentioned it before, but just to encourage um, the management zones, not the management, yeah, but uh, the, the management zones to look at going to where the people are. Uh, everybody doesn't have uh, access to the internet, uh, but everybody that signs up to go get food, signs up to go get a vaccine, Many people go to school board meetings. Many people go to community service district meetings. Those are where the people are. Those are where some of the community leaders are. If you go to those places, you can easily get participation and people willing to serve on the advisory. So 
and you get people to complete the surveys and information that you might have to share. So I'm just uh, suggesting that because again, the reason everybody is together is talking about how to make sure we get safe drinking water to those that have been impacted. So to get them engaged, you gotta go to where they are and have them be a part of the decision-making process that's, that goes forth. And, and I, you know, I just thank everybody, um, all of the uh, stakeholders that have been involved in this process. I think we're off out the gate and we're moving forward, but we don't want it to be 35 years that we get to where we need to go. We wanna get there sooner. And I just appreciate all the support in this effort. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Vice Chair, for, for your leadership in this effort and continued work. And I know it's a once a year, I think, check-in that's on the books, but uh, something tells me we'll be discussing this uh, <laughs> sooner rather than later. So thank you so much. Look forward to continued discussion with you all here soon. That uh, wraps up our informational item on CV Salts. So quickly, um, let me give you a rundown of what the rest of the afternoon will look like we have our hydrologic update, uh, which will cover the general conditions. Our, our staff will be providing that along on uh, Russian, uh, so it'll cover the Bay Delta at a high level, Russian River and Scott River. Uh, it'll, we'll move on to our uh, following uh, up item, which is a drought update, which will start with Office of Public Participation, just doing a quick overview of some drought website resources we have. Uh, Darren Plahamis will then give an update on the drinking water aspects of drought and the work that we're doing. Our water rights staff will then uh, begin a discussion around the TUCP and the, and the temperature management plan, just uh, setting some table there, and then followed by DWR and reclamation to discuss the items on the TUCP and some back and forth. And then they'll leave us with our last item, uh, which is the informational item on the Bay Delta curtailment methodology. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, apologize, I know this uh, morning has gone long, but for good reason, these were important items. And we will now take a late lunch. Let's get back here at 1.45. I know half an hour is not a lot of time, uh, but we'd like to make sure we get back and respect everyone's time and hopefully uh, wrap up what will be a lot of discussion um, here before uh, close of business hours. So thank you everyone. We'll see you here soon at 1.45 and uh, we'll continue on to our next item. See you soon, thank you.
Okay, everyone, it's 1.45. I think we can begin to gather back now. Hope everyone had a restful lunch. We're now on to a meaty tranche of discussion and we'll start with our update on current hydrologic conditions. And again, just to quickly um, just give an overview this current item will just be our staff quickly taking through hydrologic conditions and uh, Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation will join us as part of the drought update discussion where we'll get into um, some of the actions that we've been taking. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and uh, board members. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Good to see you, Mr. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am here this afternoon to cover uh, the update on current hydrologic conditions. So today's update will cover the Bay Delta, uh, the Russian River, and the Scott River in that order. Uh, it is um, a collaborative effort, and uh, after I present, I'm going to hand over to my co-presenters, Sam uh, boland Brian and Alexander Sweat. So I am uh, Stanley Mubako. I am an environmental scientist in the Division of Water Rights, Bay Delta section. Next slide, please. So uh, the current cumulative precipitation curves have not risen much since um, the middle of March uh, of 2021. And uh, I'll start off here, the slide that you're looking at is for the East Station Precipitation Index for uh, the Northern Sierra. It is at 23 inches for the season, which is about 47% of average for this date. Next slide, please. Uh, next is uh, the five station uh, index for the San Joaquim. It is at 18.3 inches for the season, which is 48% of average for this date. Next slide, please. Uh, the six station index for the Tulare Basin is at 9.6 inches for the season, which is 35% of average uh, for this date. Next slide. Here we are looking at uh, from top to bottom, the Northern Central and Southern Sierra snow water content as a percentage of average. And this is shown by the blue light uh, shaded area. This year's trend is shown by the dark blue line that you can see somewhere in the middle. And it shows that you know the little snow that accumulated this year is actually now gone. The Northern region at the top is at 1%, which is only 4% of average for this state. And both the Central and Southern Sierra regions are at 0%, uh, which is consistent with uh, prior low snowpack years. Next slide. Uh, here's an overview of um, reservoir conditions. Uh, statewide, most reservoirs are well below historic averages except for New Malons, which is relatively in good shape. Other state and federal project reservoir levels are only half uh, what they've been historically at this time of the year. Shasta is at 52% of average, Oroville 46%, and Folsom at 45% of average. Next slide. Uh, looking at uh, other reservoirs, uh, for Chakuma Reservoir, we are at 59% of capacity. Uh, which is 67% of average. Diamond Valley, as you can see, there is at 82% of capacity. And San Luis Reservoir is at 44% of capacity, which is 55% of average. Next slide. Uh, next, we are going to look at the, the TEM91 situation. Uh, the graph that you are seeing there, the blue line represents uh, delta flows that are available to meet water quality and flow requirements. So when the blue line rises into the upper red area of the plot, stored project water is needed to maintain delta requirements and in-basin uses. And TEM91 may be considered at that stage. So TEM91 catalogments went into effect on April 29 this year, 
due to the dry conditions and letters uh, related to catalogs were dispatched to 1091 order right holders. Uh, these catalogs, they will remain in effect until wet weather or reduced demands result in changes to supplemental or project water releases. Uh, this particular graph is posted uh, on the Water Rights uh, Division Bay Delta Program website and it's updated weekly for those who would like to scrutinize it a bit more. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows uh, the drought monitor for California as of 25 May of 2021. As you can see, the entire state is experiencing at least moderate drought conditions with more than three quarters of the state under extreme to exceptional drought conditions. Next slide. Uh, a look at the Colorado Basin. It is also experiencing at least abnormally dry conditions with more than 80% of the basin experiencing extreme or exceptional drought conditions similar to the state of California. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows uh, the US seasonal drought outlook, uh, which is uh, the drought tendency during uh, the period under consideration that is May 20 to August 31 of 2021. Uh, this particular uh, graphic was released on May 20. So it shows uh, the drought tendency during uh, the period in question, and the large scale trends are based on derived uh, probabilities guided by short and long term uh, range statistical and dynamic focus. Uh, the outlook shows that uh, almost half of the country is experiencing persistent drought conditions on these uh, uh, days, and predominantly the western half of the country you know, is more affected. Next slide. Uh, the Colorado River Basin snow water uh, content. Um, this graphic here, the quick overview, it shows that snow peak is significantly below median levels for much of the basin. Next slide. Uh, this graphic here is um, the temperature um, forecast and it comes from the Climate Prediction Center. And it actually shows the likelihood that temperatures over the next eight to 14 days will either be normal above or below what will be expected for this time of the year. So for this particular outlook, it shows higher odds of warmer than normal temperatures for much of the United States, including the whole state of California. Next slide. Uh, this will be my last slide, I believe, before I hand over to Sam. Uh, and it looks at precipitation as of May 27. Um, and it's the 8 to 14 day outlook. It shows a 33 to 50% probability of below normal precipitation in the northern half of California. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'll hand over to Sam to present on the Russian River watershed. Thank you. Hi, Chair Eskimo and members of the board. My name is Sam Bolenbrien uh, with the Division of Water Rights. Uh, can you hear me okay? Thanks. So I'm going to touch briefly on the Russian River watershed. Uh, here's a picture of that watershed. And just for kind of orientation, uh, it's divided into the upper and lower Russian River. Flows in the upper Russian River are supported by releases from Lake Mendocino, shown at the north of the watershed. And then flows in the lower Russian River watershed, which include uh, Dry Creek are supported by releases from Lake Mendes, uh, Lake Sonoma. Uh, next slide, please. This figure shows current storage conditions, or as of kind of 10 days ago in, in Lake Mendocino. The black line there at the bottom is the storage at Lake Mendocino currently. Um, the next line up is the green line, which is 2015, uh, sort of at the height of the, the, the drought, the past drought. And so uh, this shows that storage conditions are fairly dry and also that uh, storage has peaked for, for this water year. And so we're kind of starting a, a decline. Um, next slide, please. These are projections from Sonoma County Water Agency. Uh, if kind of storage trends continue on the, the path that they took in 2015, what would happen in 2022? Uh, in terms of kind of the storage conditions of the reservoir. And so what's projected there is kind of each of the uh, past 108 years projected forward. So there's many kind of small gray lines there. But 
also shown are different percentiles. And it shows that there is a, um, a real risk this summer of uh, Lake Mendocino draining. Um, that red line at the bottom is the 76, 77 drought. Uh, so if that year were to repeat itself, that would be the storage conditions, uh, absent other uh, activities in the watershed to help protect this stored water. Um, next slide, please. And so some recent activities relative to that um, is that the board staff have formed a, a weekly stakeholder group meetings and discussions in, in the watershed to figure out kind of how to address these conditions. Um, last week, we issued uh, notices of unavailability to all post-1914 water right holders in the upper Russian River watershed, letting them know that uh, supplies as of today are, are insufficient to meet their water rights priorities. We also issued a warning letter to riparian and pre-1914 uh, water right holders as, as sort of a heads up, the conditions are dry and that the, the board is developing uh, emergency regulations. The board staff are developing emergency regulations to, to respond to these conditions. Um, also last month, the Division of Drinking Water issued uh, an information order, a directive to 25 drinking water systems in the upper Russian river watershed to support both kind of current operational conditions in, uh, in their system, kind of what the, the operators are saying uh, and kind of what their kind of level of conservation efforts are and the implementation of their conservation plans. And also to start reporting weekly uh, on kind of the conditions they're observing in their operations. So this is things like relative to their intakes and, and water supplies and, and how much water they're producing. And so, I think that'll be a key piece of information for everyone as we move through the summer. And then also kind of the, the, the other point to highlight here on recent activities is the uh, staff are developing a package of emergency regulations for consideration uh, by the board. And next slide, please. Here is a graph showing supply and demand uh, within the upper Russian River watershed uh, that sort of underpinned the notices of unavailability. And the blue line shows uh, our estimates of natural flows in, in the upper Russian river watershed. And these kind of stacked uh, lines show uh, demand uh, of what, for various water rights priorities. And so the red line shows uh, repairing demand uh, based on our water rights annual use reports. And so uh, as kind of you can see, supplies in, in the system are well below what's uh, sufficient to even meet riparian demands um, through the rest of the summer. And so uh, that's kind of what we have on our website too, if, if stakeholders are interested in taking a look. We also have copies of the notices and the letters available on our website. Next slide, please. I, I included a slide on Lake Sonoma. Um, conditions are exceptionally dry there as well. However, Lake Sonoma is much larger um, than, than Lake Mendocino. So it's, it's, it is at unprecedented storage levels. So this is kind of the lowest uh, this has been seen uh, for this time of the year. Um, however, it's still, you know, uh, just under 150,000 acre feet. And so it's, it's trending down and uh, Sonoma County Water Agency is implementing a, its conservation plan uh, to respond to these low levels. Um, so also dire, but not uh, as dire as Lake Mendocino. Um, next slide. I think that finishes my presentation and recap on kind of recent activities as well as um, conditions in the watershed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Sweat. I'm a water resource control engineer in the Division of Water Rights, and I'm here to give a brief update on the Scott River watershed. So the Scott River is one of four major tributaries to the Klamath River in California and the watershed is located near the Oregon, California boundary. Um, the Scott River originates in Siskiyou County, flows through the Scott Valley, and then into the Klamath River. The basin consists of about 812 square miles, and the Scott River main stem is about 58 miles long. The watershed en encompasses some of the most important coho salmon habitat in the Klamath watershed, and it is also habitat for Chinook salmon, steelhead trout, and Pacific lamprey. Agricultural uses in the Scott Valley uh, mainly consist of ranching and hay farming. Next slide. In terms of flow, 
uh, the 2020 and 2021 water years uh, will probably be the worst two year stretch in terms of flow in 80 years of records. Um, the April 1st snowpack for the Scott River watershed was about 70% 70, 70 of average. And today we are mailing out notices of unavailability to water rights junior to the United States Forest Service in stream flow rate. So you can see that in the chart above. There is the historical average at the top. You can tell that current flows are well below that um, in, with the blue line. And we're also below the United States Forest Service instant flow rate. So the notices may improve flow, but it's very unlikely that um, sending the notices will result in flows meeting the United States Forest Service in-stream flow rate. And that's because the Scott River Decree, which um, defines the United States Forest Service in-stream flow rate, um, states that most of the water rights in the watershed are independent of the United States in-stream flow rate. Um, there's additional concern that fall 2021 flows, so this fall, flows may not be sufficient for Chinook or Coho salmon to reach their spawning grounds under current conditions. Next slide. Thank you, Mr. Sweat. Uh, sobering conditions, uh, certainly throughout the state. And I would just note that um, when it came to the expansion of exceptional drought, um, we saw what I saw there was a 10% increase from one week to the next. Um, so um, concerning drying conditions for sure. Any questions from fellow uh, board colleagues on uh, hydrology? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sweat, uh, Mr. Mubako, and uh, Mr. Bolenbrink for the updates, uh, sobering as they are. Uh, that moves us on to item number six, which is an update on drought activities. And we'd like to welcome up uh, Nefertiri, I believe, uh, Cooley or uh, Sobek. Um, to, I believe, uh, give a quick overview of, of uh, some of the uh, website resources we have. Uh, thank you, Chair Escobar. I was just going to um, note that um, as when we were in the middle of the, the ongoing COVID emergency, we've put a sort of a placeholder info item about drought and drought conditions because it's really hard to predict even um, 10 days ahead of time exactly what's gonna be happening and what information we, we might wanna make board members and members of the public aware of. And so um, today we have, we have three, um, uh, three general categories of updates. One, we wanted to, um, our Office of Public Participation was gonna provide a short presentation on our Water Board's drought website, the public site that people can go to to get a lot of the information, including a lot of the information that's just been presented. Um, and then we were going to have an update from um, uh, Darren Pohemus about what's going on in the drinking water world and drought. And then a, a somewhat lo longer update from the Division of Water Rights about developments in the, in, in the last two weeks since our last board meeting, including where we are with Sacramento um, um, River Temperature Management and the um, TUCPs. And then we'll move into our last item, which is separate from this drought update, which was a notice item about the um, curtailment regulation proposed proposals. So we'll start out with the, the website presentation from the Office of um, Public Participation. Thanks so much, Ms. Sobeck. And I apologize, uh, Ms. Jessica Bean is here with us for uh, the website uh, component. Good to see you, Ms. Bean. Good to see you as well, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so that I can show you the website. Okay, here we go. Um, thank you so much, Chair Esquivel and board members. Um, I am going to provide a brief update on our new and improved drought webpage for the, um, the State Water Board. Um, we, we've taken all of the previous web pages and linked them into a hub now that we have. Um, this is a very intentional approach. Our goal was to get um, information out to folks as easily as possible, make it user friendly and accessible. So we're hoping to um, continually update this website and we certainly are interested in, in making it useful for folks. So um, if people want to provide feedback on that, um, we, we encourage that, in fact, because this really is um, a tool for our, our users. So we want to make sure that that um, is clear. Um, so 
Right now we have our what's new at the top. This is going to be rotating constantly. I suspect we'll see this um, change pretty rapidly. It only covers our top five most recent items. We also have a link here to the, um, the current drought conditions and that takes you out to the California drought monitor page. If we scroll down, um, there's four tiles you'll see here. Um, these are rotating tiles and these can change based on um, the most important information that we're trying to get out at the time. Um, again, we are still developing some of these and so these may change from time to time, but that is intentional as well. Um, right now we have a calendar of events, the drop tools and methods, which I will go over in a moment. Um, we have a page on the water board's role in drought and then also a link to our water conservation portal. So beneath those tiles, we have um, kind of the meat, I would say, of this page, which is the I am looking for section. Um, right now, we are um, we have items here in alphabetical order. You can find things like we have a link to our drought orders and proclamations, notices and letters. So you can find all the information there. Um, we also have a link to some external sites like the Household Water Supply Shortage Reporting System, Save Our Water, um, and then we also have links to some of our um, region specific responses, which I will go over in a moment as well. And then if we keep scrolling down, um, there's opportunities for folks to stay involved. Our contact information is here, as well as our email subscription list. So anyone interested in drought updates, I highly recommend that you sign up for the email subscription list. This is the most efficient and effective way for us to get um, quickly changing information out. Um, Lastly, we do have the California Drought Monitor again. Um, this is updated regularly on Thursdays, so you can click out into a larger image to see what all the specific information is there as well. So if I scroll back up here, I'm going to go to a couple of pages just to show you some of the key features, our drought tools and methods page. This is where you're going to find information on um, for example, the water unavailability methodology for the Delta watershed. We just recently had a workshop on that. So that is there. We have the water supply and demand visualization tool as well. And so this is where you can um, come across additional um, tools and methods that are gonna be coming up in the future as well. They'll all be housed here. I'm gonna go back to the previous page and show you again, we have some specific uh, watershed pages. Right here we have our Russian River drought response area. So this is where you can find um, announcements, uh, the notices of availability, and the letters that went along with those are located on this page as well. And I will close that back up. Here we go. There's also a specific email subscription list for the Russian River. So if folks are interested in only receiving information on that watershed, um, the contact information is here as well. You'll note that this um, Russian River information is currently housed under the North Coast Regional Drought Information page. Depending on how things go and as we have more watersheds um, uh, have uh, need of a page like this, we'll be adding these into the website. So again, you'll, you may see some changes in these as we gather more information and find effective ways of presenting that. Um, the same thing will go for the I am looking for box. We may end up um, narrowing this down so that we have specific um, information on uh, headers and subheaders just to make it a little bit more useful. And then a few things that are upcoming that I wanted to point out is um, right now under the contact us information, it's pretty general. We have one email address and our drought year curtailment hotline. Um, we are working on getting um, topic specific contacts that we're gonna be adding here. So if folks have specific questions, they can get directly to, um, to a person to speak to rather than having to go through these general numbers. Another question that we have um, been asked and we're working on is an archive page for previous information. Um, that is something that we're working on right now. There was a lot of information from the last drought and we really are just sifting through that to get the most pertinent information and again, make it user friendly for folks. Um, the last thing that I do wanna point to is that if we go to our homepage, um, you can access that website, the drought website directly. It's waterboards.ca.gov forward slash drought, but if we scroll down on the primary page, we are in the in focus section. So the water boards drought information is there. You can link to that drought page that we were just at. And then I do also wanna let you know that we're working to get the, um, the pictures that are rotating at the top 
to include some information on drought that will link into those web pages as well. We're also working with the regional water boards to do the same on our drought pages. Um, and that's all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or feedback. I can take that as well. Thank you, Ms. Bean. I just want to just thank you. Uh, thank you and all everyone's good work on trying to just be uh, more communicative, have everything be in one place. And uh, just candid information for us all that we don't have a content management system on the back end of this website. It means this is all done manually through our coders. And so, um, you know, we'll, we continue to, to do the best we can with the resources uh, available to us, especially because communication is so very critical uh, in this space. And so I uh, appreciate everyone's attention to it. Any, please uh, do suggest uh, and bring suggest, uh, re remarks, recommendations, suggestions to us on the site. Glad to entertain those um, and want to ensure that we just have uh, a responsive and transparent way of ensuring everyone understands the many activities that are going on at the board, particularly in the face of this drought. So just thank you, really appreciate that. Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, just wanna uh, compliment you, Ms. Bean and the team that worked on this. This is um, just vastly improved from the last drought and I'm pleased that you're going to be um, including an archive section. Um, much of what we're seeing here so far is an improvement, at least in process and communication and transparency from the last drought. And so I think there are a lot of really good materials um, that are um, should be made available to the public um, in the name of just what did we do last time and how can we build on that? So thank you for that. Um, just a suggestion, I know because things are, you know, really moving quickly, um, looking for um, the inclusion of comments, even if they are not official comments that um, have gone to the board through an official public comment um, uh, request or opportunity. Uh, specifically this afternoon, we have water avail unavailability analysis and an information item. And I know that staff did um, provide for an opportunity for folks to comment. I was able to obtain that information, um, but I think it'd be great if at all possible, if it could be posted as soon as possible, hopefully even this afternoon so that the public will have an opportunity to review uh, comments that others have made. Um, Thank you. Board member, if I could just respond to that last point. Um, one of the limitations for us in posting comments is that anything posted to our website needs to be ADA compliant and we've, required all the documents that we prepare to be compliant so that they can be posted on our website. But when we receive comments from others, um, they are not necessarily, and they probably are not, do not meet all those rules. And so um, it's quite it, it's quite resource intensive to convert those and um, into a into a format that can be posted on the website. So we will we will do our best, but it's not actually um, very easy. We can certainly produce those if they're requested. Well, yeah. Um, so I'm, we'll I'll happy, we're happy to talk to you about the process and what the, some yeah. of the challenges are. Understood. But maybe as we request uh, um, um, comments, uh, we include, um, I, I just don't have enough information about what all is involved in order to get them to be user friendly. So anything that can be done so that what we receive is in um, uh, working order that it's such that it could be posted. Just as can I can I just say something about the comment letters? The comment letters currently, any of the comment letters that come through to me as clerk to the board, they are on a FTP site that they can have access to. All they have to do is request to have access to the FTP site, and we give that link to them, and it states that on our agenda and also on any documents that go out for public comment. So they do have access to them at any time. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. I think um, to Vice Chair's point then, uh, just maybe making that a bit clear that um, that link can be provided. I think the, the issue is we provide that link uh, upon request. If there is a document that's not on the website that was ADA compliant or uh, that needs to be sort of shared, I think. Uh, we can, we can actually discuss further and we don't need to, we can take it a bit offline, but sure. other than the fact that, um, yeah, thank you. That's a good flag. The FTP site has all the documents then for anything that the clerk receives and it's a matter of maybe better publicizing the ability to access that. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to also mention that it really was a large team that put this together. Um, I had the honor of getting to show it to you, but there's a whole slew of people that are working on this. So we do appreciate the, the positive feedback and we'll look into all of that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for everyone's good effort on, on the work. And again, we're here to continue to improve. So just let us know how we can. Thank you, everyone. Just a, a quick comment, if I could. Yes, by all means. Um, I really am impressed with the website and all the work that has been put into it. I find it very easy to navigate and you know, find a lot of good information. So thank you for that. That's a step in the right direction. I know it was, um, earlier this year was one of the first things I thought of was that we, you know, we need to update our drought website and be able to make this information available as quickly as possible. And so you've, you've done that. Thank you. Um, my only uh, comment would be, we have a lot of different balls in the air right now <laughs> as it relates to different methods, uh, different watersheds where, you know, we're being looked at in, in slightly different ways of slicing and dicing the data, the information, the approach to water unavailability and other actions that are happening. So I, I, I appreciate that you have the North Coast and the Russian River sort of bend out, but the Bay Delta kind of falls into the everything else category on the page right now. So just think through um, how to best organize that. I'm just concerned that folks might go to the website and not really know how to get information specific to their watershed. So just as, you know, maybe as, as you move forward, just keep thinking about that and refining how, how you uh, organize the data. So, but thank you otherwise. Thank you board member. And thank you, Ms. Bean, much appreciated. Uh, next, I believe that we have uh, Darren Polhamus, uh, the head of our division of drinking water. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Escobol. Um, if I could get my slides up. I'm going to run through today uh, some of the water systems and areas of water systems that we're uh, watching here in the division of drinking water and working on to uh, address as the drought progresses. Next slide, please. So first up, you, you just recently heard in the previous presentation um, on the Russian River. And uh, just to highlight again for you, the Division of Drinking Water now for the first time has issued in, uh, information orders, technical orders under a new authority that we got from SB 200. Uh, and we're collecting data on that. Right now that data is coming in uh, and being processed manually as we get it. We're working really hard with our IT group to make that a bit more automated for uh, the folks that have to submit the data to us and us as well. So more improvements to come on that, but we uh, needed to move on this one and, and make that step happen now. So uh, that's underway and uh, we should start to have some information that will be helpful for all on that. Next slide, please. Uh, kind of now going in uh, order of, uh, of uh, concern on my part and, and others of uh, the city of Fort Bragg uh, has uh, issued, and I think I mentioned this before, um, to us a, a tasking from Cal OES requesting assistance for them. They have a projection of a severe water crisis uh, starting potentially in July and uh, getting worse as the fall progresses. Um, they are looking at uh, their water supply, the Noyo River, their main water supply being uh, severely uh, low in flow and possibly becoming brackish and undrinkable. Uh, we're working with a whole host of partners on that one to try to figure out what steps need to be taken uh, to protect their water supply moving forward. There's uh, multiple things being investigated, including um, some other shallow, shallow wells that would normally not be permitted and other actions that we can take. So we'll have, hopefully have more for you all on what the outcome of those investigations are soon. I also want to note that Fort Bragg is a major water hauler supplier. Um, and so this will, their uh, water crisis will impact a lot of small water systems up and down the North Coast around them and possibly other private wells folks that um, maybe needed to rely on them under, under a normal summer condition. And this of course will only be worse. So um, probably our highest level of concern with them at the moment, but they are diligently working on it with our team. And next slide, please. This one I wanted to call attention to as well. So the Marin Municipal Water District took early action steps on their own and probably was a leader in making sure that they started to protect their water supply earlier. So giving them a mention for all their activities that they have under place and underway regarding that. Uh, their water supply is also severely impacted and uh, at some historic uh, lows that they're working to address through. They are monitoring that closely and in contact with us they um, are working really diligently to also think of the contingency plans they may need in place associated with uh, making sure that they're able to continue to, to serve their customers. Um, those could be uh, also emergency debt desalinization or 
uh, I believe, and it was done before, uh, a pipeline over the Richmond Bridge to provide them with some water from some other water systems. So um, big steps to come on them, and they are working hard on that one. Next slide, please. Now moving to Folsom Lake. Uh, this is uh, right here in our backyard here in Sacramento and uh, does address uh, over 10 water systems that rely on Folsom Lake very heavily for their water supply. Not all of them are 100% on Folsom Lake, but they um, uh, will be impacted with any uh, problems associated with that. This is a large population of 486 people, basically half a million people on those water systems, so raises our level of concern dramatically. Uh, we've been meeting with them and the Bureau of Reclamation who operates Folsom Lake and the levels associated with it to work through all of the different impacts uh, associated with the lowering lake level. And uh, of course, it gets complicated as you know, Folsom Lake is tied into the Delta water system and operate in conjunction with the rest of the project the Bureau operates. So uh, we're actively going to be monitoring the levels associated with those lakes. We've recently got now the levels of concern for the different areas, but also know that uh, steps are being taken by the Bureau and the cities that are impacted. They're uh, taking steps to check on their emergency pumps that might be necessary at certain levels, uh, getting their barges ready to float if uh, necessary and put them in ahead of time. So a lot of steps being taken to make sure that, again, they're able to continue the service they can. Uh, we have other concerns that could arise as the lake level goes down. As you know, lake level can get can get low, it can create water quality issues. So we'll also need to be monitor the treatment capacity of the treatment works that would uh, treat this water uh, and you know uh, address that as maybe those issues arise. So we're asking them to prepare for, for those type of conditions as well, to be fully prepared for what, what may come, at least what we can anticipate they may face as those levels get lower. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick graph of the actual lake level to show that we're monitoring its level and, and have some key points associated with where we'll have concerns raised uh, when the head above the different intakes reaches certain levels, uh, capitation can happen and we have to go to alternate means to make sure they're able to collect their water. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, this one is uh, still evolving, but I did want to call your attention to it. Uh, we're getting quite a few reports from small water systems of potential water theft from small systems, from haulers that haul water for many purposes, uh, including some haulers that are hired by uh, private well owners or private domestic users that have tanks. Um, also, there is concern that some of it is being used and anecdotal claims that it's being used for the uh, cannabis grows in Northern California. Uh, this gets a bit tricky. We don't have direct enforcement over someone that would steal water from a water system. It becomes a law enforcement issue that we'll have to work with our law enforcement partners on. Um, but we will work to try to get better reporting and um, possibly see if we can track down what's going on here, monitor water systems production rates. Uh, this was noticed, noticed, I believe, by a few water systems that noticed their production rates were going much higher than they would have expected uh, under recent events. So. Um, Hard to track all that down, but uh, definitely a concerning issue as things get more desperate. And of course, I mentioned Fort Bragg, which will um, you know, not be able to provide source water for many of these haulers, which only means they're gonna be going farther afield and uh, grabbing water where they can. So uh, could be could be the beginning of a, of a higher level concern across a, a wide space here for a lot of water systems that may themselves not be directly threatened, but could have issues. So, and that concludes my items. I'm certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Polhamis. You know, the work of the Division of Drinking Water is incredibly important, particularly now in this drought, and becomes even more apparent, I feel, as we you know, get this better flow of information from district engineers to, to our other programs and the board and really start to inform our drought response. You know, I like to remind folks that it was in the middle of the last drought the Division of Drinking Water even came to the board. And so this is the first time we have the full benefit of having the Division of Drinking Water stood up incorporated better into the water board's programs and work and can really help inform our response to the, the betterment of all of the state and communities. So just thank you. Um, I know we'll be getting a lot more updates in this space and appreciate the thoroughness and information here of flagging those communities we have the most concern for right now. Um, and so thank you. Yep, absolutely. And we'll be back with more. Uh, thank you very much. And next, I believe we have uh, Ms. Diane Riddle. Hello, good afternoon, Chair Escobel and board members. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. 
Um, I'll just provide a brief overview of some of the activities that the Division of Water Rights has been working on related to drought actions in the Bay Delta watershed. We also have staff with us here today from the Department of Water Resources, Ted Craddock, and from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, David Mooney, who will be speaking further about some of the items that I'll touch upon. I'll, um, at the last board meeting, I provided an update, I believe, regarding receipt of a temporary urgency change petition that was submitted by the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources to modify water right obligations that those parties have for meeting Delta water quality and flow requirements, specifically Delta outflow requirements during June and July and salinity requirements on the Sacramento River for the protection of agriculture from June through August 15th. We received the TUCP on May 17th. We then issued a public notice for the TUCP on May 18th. The public comment period on the TUCP runs until June 4th. Um, since the requested changes are actually affected today, um, the board has acted upon the changes that were requested as part of the TUCP earlier this morning. Um, the executive director signed the order um, approving, conditionally approving the temporary urgency change petition that is, should be, should already be, or should shortly be posted to our website and an email distribution message sent out to various um, appropriate list notifying folks where they can get that order. Um, again, uh, we are, comments are still, um, the comment period is still open for the temporary urgency change petition. Um, the board is promptly considering all comments that it's received. We've, we've considered the ones we received today, including those we've received verbally as part of the board meetings as well as any written comments that we've received and we will continue to do so and may modify the order as appropriate um, on, you know, in order to address those comments. Um, some other aspects related to the TUCP that I want to mention, um, in addition to receiving the TUCP, we did receive information from the fishery agencies related to the TUCP. Um, Last week, we received a letter from the Department of Fish and Wildlife providing input related to the TUCP and provisions of the Water Code that require consultation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, that information was incorporated into the TUCP order. We also received input from the National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service this weekend that was also incorporated into the TUCP order over the weekend. Um, Lastly, I wanted to comment upon, we are aware that there is a possibility for future TUCP to address uh, changes that may be needed during the fall time period, September through December. Um, we are requesting that the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation submit any such TUCP as early as possible, no later the end of, than the end of June, so that we can provide for that critical public process um, that we rely upon to inform our decision making. Um, so we are um, we are asking for that. I think that covers the TUCP items associated with the TUCP. We also got a request related to installation of a salinity barrier um, on False River in the Delta in order to prevent seawater intrusion into areas of the Delta. Um, those actions are taken in conjunction with the modifications to the salinity objectives on the Sacramento River. Um, the board received that um, 401 water quality certification request on May 14th. We issued the notice for the request on May 17th and the certification was issued last Friday on May 28th. Lastly, I wanted to just touch upon the temperature management plan for the Sacramento River. Um, as you're aware, the Bureau of Reclamation pursuant to State Water Board Order 90-5 is required to provide for temperature control on the Sacramento River at times when it's needed for the protection of fish and particularly the fish species that are of greatest concern are winter run Chinook salmon and fall run Chinook salmon. 
we, as you're aware, we have been working closely with the fishery agencies, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the Department of Water Resources related to issues um, related to temperature management. Those are reflected in the temporary urgency change petition um, and the carryover storage criteria that are behind that, that request. Um, and um, so we related to that process, we, I updated you last time that we had received a draft temperature management plan on May 5th. Following the last board meeting, we sent comments on the draft temperature management plan on May 21st, identifying measures that should be included in the final temperature management plan in order to be approvable by the board, including minimum carryover storage requirements at the end of September for Shasta Reservoir, including a minimum carryover storage requirement of 1.25 million acre feet. Um, we received the final temperature management plan on May 28th. It does include that minimum carryover storage requirement of 1.25 million acre feet. Um, now that we've received the final temperature management plan, the board has 10 days to consider that plan, or I should say the executive director or the chief of the division of water rights has done 10 days to consider um, action on the final temperature management plan. Um, I think that covers most of the updates. I'll let um, the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation take it from here and expand upon um, the items that I've spoken about. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riddle. I appreciate the, the, good, uh, the good overview and just thank uh, Ted uh, Craddock, Mr. Craddock here and Mr. Mooney for joining us here. Um, I know I've been uh, obviously speaking with Director Namath and, and also um, Regional Director Conant and ensuring that we have this cadence every two weeks of a discussion around what are we seeing on the projects, but importantly, what are we seeing in our watershed and, and, and knowing that there are not just one thing that we're doing here, you know, either the TUCPs or a temperature management plan or curtailments, it's really, or salinity barriers for that matter and their approval, it's the, the cumulative and comprehensive way in which we can understand these decisions all adding and contributing to reservoir storage and carryover for next year and continuing to understand what's, what's happening here in the system, knowing that um, we're in pretty unprecedented territory um, generally. So just wanna thank both uh, DWR and Bureau of Reclamation here for joining us and uh, for being part of uh, this discussion. And so Mr. Craddock. Thank you, Chair Escabel. Really appreciate the invitation to speak today. Um, also, thank you to the vice chair and the board members for having us. Um, so joining me today is Dave Mooney. He's the um, manager of Reclam Bureau of Reclamation's Bay Delta office and is also serving as the acting deputy director for the Central Valley Projects Operations today. I currently serve as the deputy director for the State Water Project um, and, and are just once again, really appreciate the opportunity to share current project operations and status. Uh, so we wanted to focus today on an overview of the actions we're taking regarding the drought. Um, and so if the team wouldn't mind uh, advancing to the next slide, sure would appreciate it. Uh, so the State Water Resources Control Board staff did a, you know excellent overview of hydrology. I'll just share very briefly that um, as you know, uh, the dry conditions are persisting in the Sacramento Valley watershed with very little rain, just a trace amount that occurred in May. And so as a result, the uh, current forecast for the project reservoirs, uh, Folsom, Shasta, and Oroville, um, are running you know, a little below and a little higher than the May 1 forecast, but overall the you know, the conditions that were forecast at the beginning of May for the Sac Valley uh, Four Rivers remain about the same. And maybe we'll move on to the, the next, next slide. And then Diane provided a, a really good summary of the TUCP uh, that we submitted on uh, May 17th. So didn't want to spend too much time here, but really wanted to thank the board staff and the federal and state agency staff for their a review of the proposal and also, um, you know, the input we've we've received. The the proposal looked to you know modify the outflow requirements uh, from 
4,000 CFS to 3,000 CFS in June and July, just due to the extraordinary uh, dry conditions. Uh, moving the Western Agriculture uh, Compliance Point from Edmonton to Three Mile Slough in June 1 to August 15. And then also included uh, limits on both the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project exports from our South Delta facilities uh, to 1500 CFS um, with, with some additional uh, mon you know, variances for uh, timing, delayed timing of transfer water later in the year. Uh, we also um, conducted um, an expedient but pretty thorough biological review and intend to do um, quite a bit of monitoring and assessment um, once we receive the um, final documentation from the agencies. At this point, maybe I'll um, ask Dave Mooney if, if he has anything to add, and then our next topic will be related to the Sacramento Valley Temperature Management Plan. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, nothing to add to the TUCP. I think, uh, the, as Diane mentioned, our final temperature management plan was submitted last Friday. As she mentioned, if we can't achieve 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Red Bluff Diversion Dam, we have to submit a plan for managing to that same temperature at an upstream location. We've been coordinating pretty extensively since the beginning of the year. Uh, it seems like daily for at least the past couple of weeks, if not months. And we provided a draft plan to the board on May 4th. Um, as part of formulating the temperatures, one of the early season actions was the warm water power bypass at Shasta Dam. After extensive discussion and fisheries input, uh, we ended up releasing warmer water into the spring in order to preserve colder water for the summer. And that bypass is now concluded last week on May 24th. And so we're operating the TCB at this time. Uh, we're currently targeting 57 degrees Fahrenheit um, down at around the Clear Creek confluence. So the transmittal of our final temperature management plan, um, it describes our response and how we incorporated a number of the formal comments that we received from NIMPS, the Water Board, and the Sacramento River Settlement Contracts. We've also been coordinating informally through the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group that includes a number of other agencies. Uh, some of the top three considerations that we included but are no means all the comments was first the consideration of life history diversity. So this is a trade-off for how cold to target uh, in water temperatures versus how broadly in time to spread our use of cold water. So it's a trade-off between catching the earlier and, and later reds versus having that protection for the greatest number of salmon in the river. Uh, the second consideration was the downstream extent to manage temperature. So this is a trade-off to preserve cold water by focusing on reds that are closer to Keswick Dam, and it helps us preserve that cold water and provide that assurances. And this is where the majority of the population is expected to spawn. Uh, lastly, given the unique circumstances this year, the governor's drought proclamation and the anticipated actions by the Water Board and others, the plan does show an under September storage of 1.25 million acre feet. So we have an extensive uh, temperature monitoring network to look at our performance and, and watch it in real time and make adjustments. Those are coordinated through the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group. Uh, well, we believe we've had a lot of good interaction. Order 90-5 does provide the Water Board 10 days to object. And we're asking that if there is an objection, that there would be an alternative location for us to manage to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. I think with the Shasta operations now uh, proposed and locked in, uh, Reclamation and DWR can look at the operations for the remainder of the CVP and SWP. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ted. Thank you, Dave. And do you mind advancing to the next slide? Great, appreciate that. So what we wanted to do next is cover, um, have a couple of slides to cover the drought plan update uh, that we recently prepared. So we submitted a updated drought plan on, on May 28th, last Friday. This is a joint document that the state or DWR and the Bureau of Reclamation are preparing for the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. It's actually a requirement of DWR's incidental take permit, but we've you know, agreed that it makes a lot of sense for both DWR and Reclamation to prepare this joint document um, 
uh, as we manage through the dry conditions. Uh, the, the drought plan includes some key components, an overall update on the conditions of the system, water supply conditions, um, uh, information on the status of the fisheries and the fishery monitoring, uh, particularly in the Delta, but, but elsewhere. Um, and then um, goes into detail on our uh, ecosystem monitoring and assessment plans. And then additionally, we use the document um, uh, to really capture the, the drought actions that are currently planned to date. Uh, so they were documented. And then um, also the end of September storage targets for Shasta, Folsom, and Oroville. So they've talked about the 1.25 million acre feet at Shasta. We're also targeting uh, 200,000 acre feet at Folsom and 850,000 acre feet at Oroville to balance um, the overall all system. And, and we appreciate, you know, the agency and the board's input as, as we've, you know, put together uh, this proposal. Uh, maybe we can move on to the, the next slide. And so um, here's a listing of uh, the planned drought actions that are included in the, the drought plan in more detail. We've talked about the TUCP. Uh, Diane mentioned the installation of the drought barrier at the West Falls River. We really appreciate um, receiving the water quality uh, certification uh, for that work and, and have issued a construction contract uh, to mobilize um, uh, the construction of the drought barrier, and, and we expect the in-water work will likely uh, start later later this week, and and then conclude by the end of the month. And so, and then also um, have included an action to to utilize or make releases from new Maloney's uh, to meet Delta needs, and you know thank the, our partners at Reclamation. Uh, for that. So the first three measures really focused on uh, water quality in the Delta. And then we have a series of measures focused on conserving storage in the project reservoirs. The, these include the implementation of groundwater substitution programs, um, both for storage and also as a way to help protect the Pacific Flyway this fall. And then um, uh, delay and, you know, just adjusting the timing of water transfers, which would typically occur in the summer period uh, uh, to predominantly in the, the fall for both projects. Dave, anything you'd like to, to add? I think you have it covered pretty well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dave. And so maybe we'll transition to the, the next slide. And so as we look forward um, in, in chair, we really appreciate the opportunity to continue staying in touch with the board throughout the summer. Um, you know, we look forward to con continued coordination with the board and the agencies. Um, so in addition to this forum, we have our weekly interaction with uh, the water operation management team and are standing up the, the dry team with the agencies. Um, uh, as Dave mentioned, we really are working closely daily, but also have these established forums for, for weekly interaction. Looking forward to planning um, together for the fall. And then, um, you know, we continue to prepare our formal updates of the CVP and the SWP operational forecasts. And, and then we'll be starting to, you know, continue to implement our drought action and monitoring reporting that's included in, in the um, uh, drought plan. So I think that that's an overview of where we're currently at and look forward to uh, taking any questions. Thank you, really do appreciate the, the overview and the engagement. I know there's a lot happening and very quickly to, um, you know, Ms. Riddle's point, when it came to this TUCP and its approval, I know it's a bit awkward because we, we, we have uh, the executive director signed it this morning and we still have a public comment period that is still extending here. We do want everyone to provide us still yet comment um, and so that we just understand and because that process, that public process is so important to our decision making here. Um, but to note and to emphasize, I think we, uh, it, it'll be important and it'll be good for, for process wise for that TUCP, should it need to extend further past, I believe it's mid-August into September, um, that we, we have that sooner rather than later so that we can just make sure we make good use of the public's time and attention and understanding the decisions that the board is called to make. And, uh, but know that you know, we, this is very urgent 
uh, in, when it comes to the projects and the crisis before them here, and we needed to move expeditiously in order to capture the benefit for as much as we can of not just the TUCPs, but also work on uh, curtailment or drought barriers as well. So um, all that to say, uh, again, looking for a little, I think, better process, certainly in the, the TUCPs that we have coming up and just our general commitment to that here. Uh, but just thank you. Um, again, there's, uh, it is not just any one aspect of the work that we're doing here, whether it's the decisions that the board is called to make, but instead is also about our other state and federal agencies and their coordination and cooperation through these very difficult uh, circumstances. And as we saw, very similar circumstances west-wide. So it's not just the, the Bay Delta here or the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. We know, we heard earlier about our challenges also certainly in the Klamath. Um, but I know that that extends particularly for the Bureau of Reclamation Westwide. So just thank you. And, and I guess my only real uh, question for now would just be when it comes to the monitoring and assessment components of this work, I know, you know, going back to the last drought, I think of the salinity barriers, I think of some of the impacts that we saw that were unintended consequences and that, you know, I think really continues to speak to the need to be in real time slash adaptive management kind of mode. And so just kind of wondering, and I, I have heard this, you know, um, had a, a benefit of having a chat with um, uh, Camille Tutan about this as well in DC um, and about just, uh, you know, getting, getting some better resources into the modeling, into some of the assessment components of this now so that we, we continue to set ourselves better up uh, when it comes to the decision-making we're gonna be making in the months ahead, but also, in the potential of another dry year. Just kind of wondering uh, you know, if you two have any thought or where particularly uh, we might uh, want to focus some of that, knowing that um, it, it was an issue in the last drought and certainly I can see it continuing to be something that we can do jointly and better monitoring assessment and uh, have benefit in just even our decision-making in the months and year ahead. Yeah, Chair, I'll maybe start and then have Dave join I think we're, you know, fully committed to um, working together um, and sharing information and and performing the monitoring and assessment. I know our team has, you know, worked uh, diligently to put together a plan they think will be, um, you know, very beneficial for, you know, taking a look at at the status of the species conditions and and then adapting. And and so we're fully committed to to you know working with across all agencies um, in a cooperative mode to, to make the best decisions possible. Um, Dave, maybe I'll ask you if you have anything to add but besides kind of those general comments. Yeah, when we were looking at some of the, the monitoring plans and the tools, uh, many of the, some of the newer techniques and newer studies actually came from our experiences uh, in, in 2014 and 2015, and the need to look at how do we support real-time decision-making and dial in with some uh, additional information. So I, I feel like we're in pretty good shape right now for our monitoring. Uh, we can always do better, and we, of course, welcome input on, on ways that we can refine it for specific management questions. Uh, but I think the, a lot of what we have designed now with was really there to help us manage through these drought and dry year times. Thank you, Mr. Mooney. And thank you as well, Mr. Craddock. Uh, again, commitment there to, to ensuring that we, we, we have the best um, uh, when it comes to monitoring and assessment so we can be the best decision makers in this space. I appreciate that. Fellow board colleagues, vice chair. Thank you. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to get a big picture, but I'm just kind of, um, zeroing in on slides five and six. So drought plan update and uh, plan drought actions. And just um, wondering if you could all comment here on as we move forward in um, implementing the existing TUCP and then uh, potentially looking at another round, how can we as a board um, best obtain information so that as we receive briefings from our staff, we're in a better position to be able to ask the, the questions about um, what happens if you make an adjustment and any potential unintended consequences. So I'll just pull one example out that you know, from the last drought, um, you know, seeing sort of the cascading effects 
of um, uh, carryover storage, export limits, and then potentially a call on Friant and impact on communities there, including drinking water. So how can we obtain information from you um, as we move through these periodic updates so that we can obtain as much information as possible without it, you know, taking over our entire agenda? You know, maybe pull, you pulling out um, some key areas that you're tracking um, as you operate the levers and what you're, you know, wanting to guard against some uh, potential unintended uh, consequence. Yeah, Vice Chair, thank you for the question. And I think what you've suggested makes a lot of sense. That, you know, the, over the last month, I think we've painted, you know, a higher level picture of, of where things are at. And now as we move into operational mode, I think there's a real opportunity for us and our, uh, you know, every other week updates to zero in on in some areas in greater detail. Uh, for the board, um, I'd say additionally, the you know our, the dialogue between our respective staff and the you know daily, weekly interaction we're having will be another way that we're able to get information to you. But I think through you know we're committed to continuing to meet um, through this forum as a way to to provide the information you're talking about. That's great, thank you. And then I would just add to that. Um, some of these additional tools that you now are using in consultation with the fish agencies, um, you know, giving, giving us um, a, a updates on how things are going with temperature management and some of the um, uh, ad adaptive measures um, that you're utilizing this year uh, that you haven't in the past. Thank you, Vice Chair. Board Member Dodek. If I may build upon the vice chair's questions, um, I appreciate the ongoing dialogue and, and the commitment to make information available to us as board members. I definitely agree how that it's that's critical and it's extremely important, um, especially as you know we all try to adapt and as we receive more new information. So my follow-up question is, um, how might we, or what are your suggestions towards making that information available to the public as well? on as close to a real-time basis as possible because transparency is something that uh, I think we're all are committed to, but more importantly, it's part of the building of trust um, as we move forward. You know, I think there are many stakeholders out there who are very concerned, uh, you know, and also very, um, very, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to use the suspicious, but just very, very concerned and are doubtful uh, of this process, doubtful of the outcome doubtful of all the good intentions that I know you all have uh, to manage this in the best way possible. So to the extent that that information can be made available as soon as possible uh, to those stakeholders, I think it will help all of us moving forward in building more cooperation, collaboration, and most importantly, trust. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say thank you for the the comment board member, um, and it's a really good one. We, we strive you know, to have a goal to be open and transparent. And it, as you said, that's a way for us to build trust. Um, so this is definitely one way that helps us um, you know, add to our ability to communicate. Um, since we do, you know, like the drought plan, we do have that posted on our, our um, DWR webpage, but I, I don't know if there's full awareness um, that this information is available. So I think this is one forum and, um, you know, probably after this meeting, Dave, um, our teams can can connect and, and think of other ways to, to ensure that the public knows that, you know, we, we do have information available and information that can be shared to keep them informed. And then, you know, perhaps there's some ways we can package it a, a little bit differently uh, for the state water project. We do have a web page uh, focused on our environmental and operational activities uh, related to project operations, and I'm pretty certain Reclamation does as well. And and so uh, those those sites can be a you know a way to make people aware they're available, and then also provide the information. Dave, anything to to add to those comments? I would add that we also 
post our operational data online. So uh, much of that is either telemetry or reported, um, at least on a, a daily basis. A number of, and that's pretty easy or straightforward to do for a lot of our flow parameters. Our fisheries and environmental data is not always on the same time step. Uh, most of our partners are generally able to post within a week, sometimes a little quicker than that. And we've been working very closely with the other agencies to get that online as soon as practical as well. So there's a, a lot of information out there. It's not always the easiest to, to stitch it all together. And I think if there are specific questions or if we learn that there are specific questions, uh, we can get together with DWR and the other agencies and look at um, what types of packages we might be able to pull together. Thank you. Um, I guess I would ask, because I know we have some commenters on this issue and many, many of those commenters, if not all, follow this very, very closely. So as you come up and provide your comments, if you have any suggestions in terms of how we, both the agencies as well as the board, could do a better job in disseminating information, um, please do share. Yeah, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, board member. Um, you know, that it is important to our decision-making process here that we bring people along uh, so that they understand and see what we see and help them uh, have trust, as board member Dodek said, in our decision-making and that access and transparency and um, knowing that it is a complex landscape. I know that the system that you uh, both run is incredibly complex and hard to completely explain at uh, every detail at any given moment, but uh, thinking through how to better stitch that together for folks so, so that they see what we see and, and help them understand um, how it is that we're, we're, we're leading to our decision-making is just, as you continue to hear, really critical to how we, how we function. I think how all of us, uh, I know how all of us function here as 21st century you know, agencies that um, you know, the, the internet and access to information have changed the way we all um, both decision make in our own spaces, but all collectively as a society too. So anyway, thank you, appreciate it. Board members, any other comments? We do have uh, about four folks uh, uh, looking to provide comment here for us too. Yeah, um, yes. Yeah. Just, just quick comment. So thank you all to vote you both for your presentation today. I really appreciate the information. And obviously um, all your work in developing these plans uh, over the last few days, uh, this is really coming at a quick pace. And I, I personally haven't had a chance to get through everything as in as much detail as I would like. Um, so I just wanted to go uh, the slide you have on planned drought actions. Um, you know, one of them talks about, and I think you mentioned this, um, the adjusting of timing of water transfers and when they happen. There's been a lot of discussion about that um, and it's opportunity, both to you know, maintain cold water pool a little bit later in the season, um, but also the need and benefit of moving water transfer water to help uh, agricultural water uses and urban, urban water users. Um, and so it, it has been an area that I've been trying to better understand. And so just if you, you know, I don't know if that details in the plans that you've developed, um, if there's anything you can share on your thoughts and, you know, perhaps it's an evolving issue in the area that you're still working through, but I appreciate any input you have on, on the timing. Sure, and, and Dave, well, thank you for the question board member and, and Dave, if it makes sense, maybe I'll start from the state water project perspective. Um, uh, so what kind of the approach we've taken um, and it's probably because our, our users are, you know, more on the municipal uh, side is to um, defer uh, the movement of transfer water until the, the fall for the state water project. And, and that really provides us a way of conserving storage in, in, full, uh, in Oroville, pardon me, but also provides a, a benefit since, you know, both projects are operating in a, you know, combined system to, to collectively helping to balance storage. Um, so that, that's the approach we're taking. And then I think Reclamation's taking a similar approach, but also has the, you know, agricultural consideration um, that they're factoring in. So Dave, can I turn it over to you for the second part? Sure, thank you. I think uh, for us, uh, the water is made available for transfer on the agricultural pattern, which is primarily in the, the summer months. 
And so we're also intending to hold that water in storage until the fall to help with some of the storage considerations and have the releases occur then for um, moving that water south. So I think that's a pretty similar to what DWR is looking at. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Board uh, member Firestone. Yeah, um, thank you again for coming and for just being able to um, provide these pretty regular updates and engagement and information and for, um, you know, the work trying to manage through this crisis. I think we're all, um, you know, in a really tough spot and, um, and you know, doing, doing the best we can and trying to work out how we can um, adapt in a really, um, really difficult time. Um, and I appreciate there's been a lot more, um, even better coordination and collaboration um, amongst all of our agencies and with stakeholders. And I understand it to be in the last drought, I wasn't in this position then. So I, I don't have as, as personal a view of that. Um, I have a question and you know this is really just goes to maybe um some of the uh communication that the vice chair and board member dudak mentioned around just being able to um help all of us you know us as board members and the public be able to understand the constraints um you know, balancing and, and potential consequences for different beneficial users um, in the system. And it's, you know, you all know better than anyone, all the operational um, uh, constraints that you have. Um, so one of the um, comments we received already on the TUCP and, um, uh, you know, I, I think was brought up around the temperature management plan was a suggestion that it would be um, that if DWR limit its um, uh, deliveries from San Luis um, and, you know, from reduce them from 5% or somehow um, delayed them, I'm not quite sure what the, what the um, specifics would be, but that there might be a way of utilizing um, some of that reservoir to some portion of that reservoir deliveries um, for, for CVP south of Delta deliveries um, and transfers so that it could preserve um, storage and cold water pool upstream of the Delta. Um, I, you know, you all know better than, than anyone what's possible and what the constraints are. I know this is a very um, complicated topic and one, you know, any sort of decision around um, contract allocation or um, deliveries is, has really severe consequences. So not taking that um, lightly in any way. I just, just that, that that's, um, something I'd just be interested in hearing more about from, you know, both of the projects as you're coordinating operations and trying to um, figure out how to adapt um, and just preserve some, like how you're looking at strategies to preserve um, the flexibility that we may need as, you know, we see how this evolves in the next few months. Um, uh, and if that's something that you've looked at, or if not, if that's something that maybe when um, you come back, I know that's something that's been brought up in the public comments with the TUCP. So just be great to get more information on that. Appreciate the, the question, board member. And it's a good comment from um, that you received from the public as we've been working together, DWR and reclamation on, on the plan you know, I think we identified as one of our overarching um, objectives to conserve storage in the reservoirs, um, both for, you know, carryover supply for next year, but also to protect the fisheries um, that are on, in the Feather American and Sacramento River. So in order to accomplish that, we, we have been looking at San Luis as a way to uh, basically balance the operations of the, the two projects. Um, Dave can probably speak to it in a little more detail than me, but I think you know for the our next uh, discussion we'd be happy to get into a little more detail on that. But as 
as our teams are going through now that we have, um, our, you know, our end of June, our, our true detailed operational forecasts, we're definitely looking at, uh, you know, utilizing the San Luis storage in a way that we're both able to work together and, and meet our upstream objectives at the project reservoirs. Dave, anything to add to that? I just would note that that's one of the terms in the temporary urgency change order is described in a little more detail, some of the constraints in the, uh, for around surrounding exports. So I think that might help answer the question. I don't have a convenient answer for right now, but I think that's one of the, what we committed to working on. So much. Thank you, board member. And thank you both as well. Uh, let's go ahead and we can transition to, I think we only have a couple of commenters actually. Um, so first we have Doug Obiji. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, I am Doug Obiji. I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, although I wish it was under better circumstances. Um, unfortunately, NRDC strongly objects to and opposes the board granting the TUCP and the Shasta Temperature Management Plan under 90-5. You know, the board's actions to effectively rubber stamp what the projects have, have asked to do to violate water quality standards both upstream of the Delta and in the Delta really is just not in the public interest and will cause unreasonable impacts to fish and wildlife. The board is effectively allowing these water projects to violate all of their obligations to the public, violating the water quality standards, resulting in massive mortality of salmon below Shasta Dam without first reducing the more than 4 million acre feet of water that they're gonna be delivering to their contractors, largely for corporate agribusinesses. This is the third time in the last seven years that the board will be approving these gross violations of standards in the Delta and Sacramento River without requiring the projects to reduce their allocations. It's unreasonable and it's unjust. First, in our view, these decisions are not in the public interest. DWR and Reclamation have plainly refused to plan for drought, claiming it was quote unquote speculative to do so. They have, exercise, they have failed to exercise due diligence and it's not just us that believe this, the board itself has recognized that the projects plan for regulatory non-compliance and over-allocate water in dry years, as the board noted in its April 30th letter. In our view, um, and as I appreciate board member Firestone for bringing this up, we believe that the board should require DWR to reduce its state water project allocation to zero and to use that conserved water, which is more than 200,000 acre feet, to increase Shasta carryover storage to 1.45 million acre feet. What's more, DWR and Reclamation are allocating more water to their senior contractors than they would be allowed to uh, under their claimed water rights. And that's frankly unreasonable and is causing significant impacts to M&I contractors throughout the state. I also want to flag that it, that proposed water transfer from the Sacramento River Settlement contractors doesn't appear to do anything to benefit fish and wildlife compared to these contractors simply holding their water in storage for the fall flood up as they normally do. Instead, the Sacramento River Settlement contractors transferred 150,000 acre feet of water for $67 million of profit. And there's no water for flood up in the fall, meaning that the, the impacts of that transfer to birds have not been mitigated. And I also wanna take a moment to specifically mention the impacts of Delta communities from granting the TUCP, um, particularly as it comes, relates to harmful algal blooms. Because DWR reclamation have grossly misled the board and the public about the effects of granting the TUCP on harmful algal blooms. DWR's own scientist, Dr. Peggy, Peggy Lehman, her own peer-reviewed research shows that shifting, that shifting to just three kilometers upstream caused a three-fold increase in the proliferation of harmful algal blooms. And their science, the science by Dr. Lehman, shows that outflow and flow has a huge effect on the proliferation of blooms. And yet, instead of fairly summarizing this research by their own scientist, the TUCP text by DWR reclamation grossly misleads the board and public claiming that water temperatures is the only thing that drives harmful algal blooms. That's not true. And granting the TUCP and installing the salinity barrier is likely to worsen, significantly worsen harmful algal blooms this, second, this summer. Second, there's no question that this is gonna cause unreasonable impacts to fish and wildlife, as much as DWR reclamation would like to argue that it doesn't. 
Everyone knows that the existing water quality standards in Decision 1641 failed to provide reasonable protection to fish and wildlife. The board has found that time and time again. And yet, once again, the board is approving violations of these already two week water quality standards. Once again, just as in the drought, last drought, DWR and Reclamation are asking to violate their own biological opinions and other permits and expect that the fishery agencies will rubber stamp those violations. The, the science shows that we are going to see unreasonable impacts to fish and wildlife, not just this year, but that will proliferate for years to come. Greater abundance of non-native species, expansion of submerged aquatic vegetation, worsened salinity, greater harmful algal blooms, and potential extirpation of delta smell because outflow matters. And frankly, with respect to order 90-5, allowing reclamation to meet 1.25 million acre feet of storage at the end of, end of September is a travesty that fails to protect salmon. It means California's woefully unprepared if next year's dry. We're looking at these kinds of impacts this year and Shasta storage started at 2.2 million acre feet and Oroville was in decent shape. And we're gonna be at the end of this year with, can you imagine how much worse off we would be if we had a million acre feet less of water in storage to begin the year at Shasta and significantly less water in Folsom and, and in Orville. That's, that's the role of the dice that we are playing because the state has not planned for drought, for drought. These decisions by the board and other agencies highlight the gross inequity of California's water rights system and demonstrate that the state prioritizes agricultural profits and outdated unreasonable water supply contracts to private beneficiaries over protection of the environment and the public, including the communities, tribes, and jobs that depend on healthy salmon runs and a healthy Bay Delta estuary. For all of these reasons, NRDC objects to the board's decision to approve the TUCP and approve the Shasta Temperature Management Plan. And we urge the board to instead take the following actions. And if you persist in uh, approving both of those documents, we urge you to include these as conditions on those approvals. One, require DWR to reduce the state water project allocation to zero and save the conserved water behind Shasta Dam so that you achieve an end of September storage of 1.5 million acre feet. We believe it's critically important to not just have an end of September carryover storage target for a requirement for reclamations operations under 90-5, but have limits on reservoir releases because these plans are continuing to not use conservative hydrology using the 90% exceedance forecast when everyone has recognized that operation that hydrology this year is like 99%. That means that the estimates of temperature mortality of salmon, the estimates of carryover storage, and the other estimates are likely biased, um, biased in favor uh, against what, you, sorry, they're likely biased and means that we're gonna see worse impacts than what we see on paper. Second, we believe the board should require DWR and reclamation to reduce their allocations to their settlement and exchange contractors to the volume of water that those entities would be entitled to under their claimed water rights, rather than the excessive deliveries that are occurring under these water supply contracts. Because in a year like this, those excessive deliveries are unreasonable under the state constitution. Third, we urge the board to issue emergency regulations to curtail water diversions throughout the watershed when minimum water quality standards are not being met. And finally, we urge the board to require reclamation to plan for, plan now and begin planning now to meet a carryover storage target of end of September 2022 of 1.9 million acre feet. We think it's critically important to start planning for that now so that we can hopefully avoid some of the disaster that we're seeing this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obijing. I appreciate your good comments and contribution to uh, this discussion. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have Jonathan Carrick. Uh, who is not on the meeting platform, I think, with us, and so would go to uh, Eric Oriana. Uh, can you all hear me? And good afternoon or good evening, nearly. Thank you, Chairman uh, and board members. Uh, appreciate you all prioritizing drought uh, as a discussion item for us today. Uh, my name is Eric Oyana, policy advocate with Community Water Center. Uh, as you may know, uh, Community Water Center works alongside community residents in the Central Valley. Uh, and through our work in the Central Valley, we've learned of uh, residents in the Central Valley uh, limiting their well pumping and experiencing drinking well outages already. Uh, and we still have not entered uh, this summer season. 
Uh, frankly, board members, uh, the worst of this drought uh, is yet to come. Uh, we've sent a letter to members of the State uh, Water Board uh, detailing the steps that should be taken to protect uh, rural Californians drinking water. Uh, in addition to those comments, uh, we recommend the following. Uh, the state uh, should help ensure that excessive agricultural groundwater pumping is not causing significant and unreasonable impacts uh, like domestic well outages. Uh, the state should ensure that the permitting of new agricultural wells, uh, which will lead to groundwater overdraft, does not occur. Uh, state should identify when consolidations are optimal for communities and work to speed up consolidation efforts. Uh, the board should coordinate with the Department of Water Resources to ensure groundwater sustainability agencies develop domestic well impact mitigation programs that cover the costs associated with bringing dry domestic wells back into operation. Uh, in addition to these recommendations, we would also like to know how the state could implement groundwater level monitoring to proactively identify which drinking water wells are at risk of experiencing outages. And lastly, uh, we believe that having a status quo level of dry well reporting that uses the same approach as the last drought is not sufficient uh, and will present uh, significant data gaps on the occurrence of dry wells across the state. Uh, it's important to note that a PPIC report earlier this year uh, noted that there would likely be over 2,000 domestic well outages uh, occurring this year. Uh, and because of that, we kindly ask that the State Water Board hold a future discussion on addressing domestic well outage reporting gaps, uh, and we welcome any response uh, in the meantime. Uh, implementing all these measures will help protect California communities' human rights to water and deter any negative impacts that occurred during the 2012 to 2016 drought. Again, uh, we urge the board to take bold steps to preserve drinking water for all Californians. Uh, we appreciate the work that the board is already undertaking uh, and also appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you as well, Mr. Oriana. Um, I was going to maybe see if Mr. Darren Pulhamus uh, could pop on for a second. I know there have been extensive uh, discussions happening with the Department of Water Resources, including on their dry well reporting tool. I know they're looking to make improvements to that. And I think part of those improvements are just the way um, we continue to make sure um, it is the best place that uh, we have data. But importantly, um, it's not just that tool. We have our Division of Drinking Water, and as you know, there's self-help out, out there currently as well, helping us to understand when uh, outages are being reported. But to your point on then um, really getting ahead of the issue and not just waiting for communities to fail, um, I know there is discussion already with the Department of Water Resources, given we have so much more data on groundwater, well locations, all that, and, uh, and even the work that you commissioned, the Community Water Center, along with Water Foundation and others to just map out where those risks are and importantly, again, respond to them before they, they become actual issues and model out some of that. All that being said, I, I'm just gonna kick it over to Mr. Paul Hamas and see if there's anything more specific there. I know in a lot of good discussion that is already going on with DWR on this very issue. And I thank you, Chair Escobar. I think you covered it pretty well. We're working with them to try to make sure that we get that um, both publicized and people to use it. Um, we're gonna do some outreach with the counties that are an important role in playing and making sure that gets populated as well as our third parties that um, work in the space of the public dry wells. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely evolving. It was something that caught us by surprise last year. It's one of our lessons learned to try to improve on as we're going into the drought. So we're definitely taking some proactive steps. Um, I do hope to have on our drought update at the next board meeting uh, on June 15th as well, DWR present a lot of what their tool has. It has a lot more information now than it did before uh, that the public should be aware of. And we need to figure out how to make that available and, and spread that information around. So definitely also would appreciate people helping us with uh, things we're not thinking of to in this space to, to further the, the goal of making that information available collecting it better uh, from the public and, and then feeding that back around so it creates that good information loop. Thank you, Mr. Volhamis. Yeah, good flag. Uh, we'll, at the next board meeting on the 15th, um, have a specific then discussion around the, the reporting tool and our work with DWR. So that'll be a good moment to, to make sure we follow on and look forward to uh, more engagement around this then. Uh, board member Firestone. Yeah, I um, I know earlier um, 
Darren, you talked about the um, information orders we've sent out in the Russian River watershed for drinking water systems to try to um, make sure we're able, that they're able to, and we're able to track, um, you know, uh, how water supply um, levels are changing so that we can not be caught off guard. Um, and they cannot, more importantly, they, they cannot be caught off guard. Um, and I know we are looking at, we're, we're concerned about other areas outside of that watershed with the, the drought proclamation as well. It sounded like, um, it, you know, my understanding is that we're still, like you said, working on this system to be able to make sure that when we request that information, we can really make it easy to um, give to us in a usable format so that we can, um, you know, make the best use of that information. I'm just wondering if you might be able to, um, you know, again, maybe this is next board meeting or um, coming up soon, give us, you know, kind of a, a status update a bit on that to, and, you know, whether that's something we can um, be looking at as a way of, of getting ahead of um, these challenges so that we don't, um, uh, so that we we don't get caught unawares in areas outside of the Ruff, Russian River watershed as well. Yeah, no, that's absolutely our our goal on that. I think <clears throat> we'll have some information to share. Just my learning and and trying to get together with the DWR staff myself on the tools that they have and how we can deploy those. Just in our work, like you mentioned, of uh, where we might want to target our next information orders. Um, just as a a bit of an aside to show the conversation I had the other day with, with uh, Stephen Springhorn. Um, you know, he did show a, a point on the map that's able to show wells that have had their lowest historic reported level ever, ever recorded. And there was a lot of red dots in some very particular hot spots. None of them surprising. I think we know where they where they are, but it kind of delineated the boundaries of those and gave us some good information to act from that we're now working to how do we how do we focus in those areas on what does that mean for public water systems. Um, you know, some further analysis is needed because, you know, those are monitoring wells and they may not be at the depth that the public water system wells are there, but it's definitely a really good indicator for us to use. And I think it's a very good indicator for the public, maybe even more so in some regards um, on how it's deployed and used. And so we want to, we will focus on both what it means to us and what it means as far as our responsibility goes to try to make that information more broadly available to warn the general public, the counties, you know, all the people that are going to play a role in addressing the, the um, results of the drought impacts. Great. And um, building off that, I, you know, we just had our uh, two information items on CV salts and the need for close coordination with those efforts and, um, and safer. And I think similarly um, with Sigma and the GSAs, um, you know, I know that uh, again, it's in everyone's interest, including the GSAs and counties and certainly residents and us that we, um, you know, are utilizing the resources we have through safer to be able to um, kind of accelerate these solutions that that get ahead of these emergencies, so that um, you know we're folks. We don't have groundwater levels um, lowering in a way that um, we don't have drinking water wells of any kind that are so shallow that as groundwater is dropping, they lose water altogether. And so um, I guess just just a, a flag on that. I know you all and uh, Safer um, are looking at this. Um, this is certainly a top of mind. Um, but just you know, I I I wonder if there's a again a way to um, collaborate with uh, DWR Sigma um, team, and I know we're, we're coordinating with them on in general on Sigma, but just um, to outreach to the GSA uh, leaders in these areas um, that are at really high risk to be able to um, provide information on the kinds of financial resources that we have. And, you know, I, I think one of the constraints we have, as we heard with CB Salts, is just people on the ground, technical assistance providers, like people that can be out there um, 
And so the more partners we have on that, the better. Again, I know we're stretched thin um, and we're collaborating on, on many different levels, um, but I think this just kind of highlights the, the many ways we need to partner with, or we are and need to even further partner with DWR and um, the many parts of DWR and, um, and kind of the local agencies and service providers. Yeah, definitely uh, doing all those things you say as fast as we can and with the people we have to try to make it happen, but you're, you're right on. We need to make sure we make those connections and we're doing what we can in that space for sure. Um, sorry, two other things while I'm talking. <laughs> um, one is, and Eric, I, you may have, no, you're still there. Um, as uh, just on the domestic well level monitoring, um, you know, again, I keep, I said this with CV salts, but um, just encourage you to bring that up within the context of safer fund expenditure plan um, and our funding resources, because it seems like if we're going out and connecting with private well owners, we should um, be looking at both quality and supply. Um, and uh, and then, um, <laughs> sorry to keep bouncing back and forth, but going back to um, Dave and Ted, um, I just, uh, I, I um, obviously timing is a challenge and we saw this year, it's like, you know, we, we're going along a route and then it turns out it's worse than we ever thought um, and we're continuing to adapt. Um, and I think we, um, you know, as we've discussed, we really want to um, try and have as much lead time as possible. Um, hence the request to, to, you know, come early with the, the next application um, for TCP, assuming that you have to do that. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, again, as we're learning more about the drought action plans and sort of how we are getting out of this cycle of um, kind of, you know, we, we have a lot of processes that we have to do in order to act um, and you all do as well, but um, it just means our, our um, the timing that we're all working with isn't really adequate for these sorts of situations. I mean, we'll talk about this more, I think, with our emergency regulation and curtailment limitations. It just takes more time than the timing that we all need it to be. And so um, just, I, I guess I'm, you know, again, really um, looking at are there ways, and maybe this is something, you know, you could highlight going forward again, if, it, if it's not something that you have um, ready to just talk about right now, um, but just, you know, pretty concretely, what are the ways that, that um, we're all looking at changing maybe the, the forecasting or the more conservative um, planning uh, that, that are that's kind of a lesson learned um, in some ways, and also just a change for us with climate change and you know the reality. It's you know what was average is no longer average. <laughs> um, so just you know again, would love to hear a little bit more concretely on that. Doesn't have to be now, but maybe again for for a future one. Um, you know how that's changing for you all. Yeah, thank you for the comments and uh, board member. It's very timely, so you know we we share your concerns about uh, the forecasting and and just how um, you know this year in particular um, surprised us in terms of you know the way the the snowpack um, runoff occurred. We, we're currently um, going through a kind of a root cause analysis to take a look at you know what was the main driving factor, and I think is you know one of the things we've identified is is that the reliance upon statistical, you know, historic models um, doesn't appear to, to uh, you know, to have worked this year that, you know, the, because the soil moisture was so dry, it points to probably a need for more monitoring. And so what we're, you know, anticipating in collaboration with the board and other agencies um, is, you know, completing this root cause analysis and then taking a look at, okay, what, what makes sense to implement um, as we move into next year. And so I, I think that's a very relevant topic for a future board meeting. Um, and we'd be happy to share more as we, it, it, you know, more focused. 
I think that's a, an excellent question. Um, one of the, at least products or efforts we've had to try to address some of that advanced planning, um, also recognizing that each year is unique and droughts are particularly unique. Uh, one of our efforts has been to put together what we call our drought toolkit. It's the collections of, of different options that we might need to activate in these drought and dry years. Um, I'd say that where there was a, a, most of these options have some sort of trade-off that has to occur. So it benefits one aspect, harms a different aspect. Um, there are a number of, of places where we've worked out most of those trade-offs. And if that's the case, we've incorporated it into as part of our action. Um, so you may not recognize it as such when we do make progress because we don't come to you for having it be an emergency. Uh, but I think that's one of our big focuses is continuing to put together our drought toolkit um, just to give us time to think through all the coordination needs and challenges for the different actions we might need to do in either later this year or in future years. Thank you, board member. And thank you both, Mr. Craddock and Mr. Mooney. Um, yes, you know, uh, I, I talked to Director Namath about the root cause analysis work that she's proposing, uh, similarly with Bureau of Reclamation. Again, knowing there it's not even just a Central Valley project that has experienced as slip in modeling, if you will, but the projects throughout the West here. So it does speak to a real fundamental need to understand uh, why, why that was, but more importantly, adapt here quickly and soon to be able to make sure we have confidence in these really critical modeling tools that help plan out uh, uh, operations throughout the year and, and the many um, uses and, and uh, dependence we all have upon the, the project and some certainty there, increasingly in an environment that's not uh, in a climate that isn't providing that certainty for us. So I um, appreciate that uh, good thought uh, board member and uh, the commitment uh, from DWR and Bureau of Reclamation to just better understand that space and really understand a root cause analysis um, and, and undertake a root cause analysis study to really uh, figure out what happened. So thank you. Any other uh, board colleagues, uh, comments or questions here? Thank you. I appreciate everyone's patience today. I know um, we, we got to this uh, discussion a bit late in the day, but still very important and appreciate the back and forth. And uh, appreciate uh, the, the commitment to continue this discussion. So in a couple of weeks, we'll I'm sure either see the two of you or, or your uh, representatives from your agencies, but just uh, thank you. And we'll, we'll be discussing uh, and let's have a follow-up. Again, better understanding that modeling. And as uh, Mr. Craddock said, you know, and Mr. Mooney, we're now really shifting into understanding then uh, the, the real-time operations that will flow from here, but it's a complex system. Uh, as we saw getting to this point, and it, we're going to have to continue to, to monitor and assess and understand and, and hear what the challenges are on the system as we continue through these summer months and what the effect is of things like curtailment, salinity barriers, and these temporary emergency change petitions, which are meant to end up conserving storage and helping set us up for a better year next year. Um, so just thank you all. I really appreciate this item and everyone's uh, engagement, and we'll see you all again uh, in two weeks on a drought update then. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our last informational item uh, before board member reports and the conclusion of today's board meeting. And on to uh, item number seven, which is an update on our water unavailability methodology for the Delta watershed. I just have to thank water rights staff and everybody um, just as you hear there's a, a tremendous amount of work going on here at the board and no more critical than our work in the water rights and curtailment space and the herculean efforts uh, that our staff have done to already conduct a, a public workshop here i know many of uh, my fellow board colleagues were able to attend i was um, engaged in a day-long uh, uh, chairs meeting with our regional board chairs so i wasn't able to attend but look forward then to this informational item um, and would uh, ask folks to, to come up and begin presenting. And again, we're on number item number seven, an update on water unavailability methodology for the Delta watershed. Janine, would you be able to unmute my phone? Oh, you're unmuted. Hi, hi, Connie. Oh, uh, 
You may have been asking to just unmute your phone line. Sorry about that. Connie, you should be unmuted because I just heard you. She may be trying to call in uh, because of data issues, uh, Janine. Yeah, and earlier this afternoon or earlier this morning, we had Connie in on another audio only line. Although Connie, that line seems to have dropped out of our platform. So do you, what would you like me to do, Michael? I can. Um, unless somehow it got mislabeled, Connie, can you, on your phone, if you're still connected, go ahead and uh, press star nine, which is the raise hand command. And we'll see if it ended up getting placed under another speaker. No. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Played. But it did, it, mer it merged her. I think it, her, it merged her, her two lines. Uh, Cause yep. yeah. Yeah. So once, once they're merged though, she should be able to use her phone. Right. And it is showing that her phone is there. Connie, uh, try speaking with us again. <laughs> okay. All right, you're there. there. You Connie, you still there? So Connie, go ahead and try this. Um, they are merged. When you called in earlier, we were unable to merge them because there was an audio device already connected to your uh, Zoom account. So in the lower left corner where you see the microphone, there's a little carrot next to it, an up arrow. If you can click on that and see if you can switch between the devices. Are you there, Connie? I, I can hear some background audio. Why not? I'm hearing Eric. Hey, this this is Eric. In lieu of Connie's uh, connectivity issues, I'm wondering if either myself or Diane can kind of jump in and potentially get things started. And Connie, hopefully you're able to join. She did text earlier and note that her Comcast had gone down. So uh, connectivity issues sometimes in the way of plans, but we'll, we'll try and go forward. Would that work at least to start things? Yeah, I'm happy to get things started today, Eric, if Great. that works for you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Luckily, we have a, some notes prepared for this item. Um, good afternoon, Chair Escobar and board members. Again, I'm Diane Riddle. I'm one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights overseeing the Bay Delta Hearings Program. Um, hopefully with us today, Johnny, Connie Will, Connie Mitterhofer, uh, the program manager overseeing the hearings and special projects section will join us and take over the presentation that I'll get us started um, until then. We also have with us today, um, Mara Irby, one of the environmental scientists in the hearings unit who's been critical in the development of the water unavailability methodology who will be going through um, through some of the information on that. So next slide, please. This is just a slide um, identifying the project team. It's been a pretty extensive team. Um, they've all pulled together, done a fantastic job. We've had help from not only folks within different programs within the Division of Water Rights, but also assistance with the workshop from the Office of Public Participation, um, extensive assistance from the Office of Chief Counsel, um, assistance from the Executive Office. We very much appreciate all of the efforts that staff have taken working on expedited timeframes, um, quickly moving through the materials and doing a fantastic job. So we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of those staff. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Connie and some of the leadership team, including Michael Buckman, Connie Mitterhofer, um, Matt Holland, Nicole Williamson, a bunch of the senior staff have also been very critical in this effort. Next slide, please. So since we just heard an update on the hydrology and straight ride drought conditions in the previous informational item, um, we'll just provide some context for, uh, for the uh, water unavailability methodology today without getting into a lot of the detail. 
Um, next slide, please. So um, I think as we've talked about a lot today, the Delta is a critically important part of the state's water supplies and environment. Water from the Delta provides a portion of the drinking water to two thirds of Californians and sustains millions of acres of farmland. The watershed is also home to numerous ecologically, economically, and culturally important fish and wildlife species, many of which are threatened or endangered and depend on flows of an adequate quality and quantity for their survival. Uh, water supplies from the Delta are also needed to repel salinity from the ocean from intruding upstream and making supplies from the Delta watershed unusable. As you heard in the previous informational item on hydrologic and drought conditions, we are currently experiencing extreme dry hydrologic conditions in the Delta watershed, creating current and expected future significant shortages in supplies to meet multiple beneficial uses of water from the watershed conditions this year again, are projected to be the second driest on record since um, the epic drought years of 1976 and 1977. Due to these conditions, Governor Newsom declared a drought state of emergency for the Delta watershed on May 10th. The proclamation directs the State Water Board and other agencies to consider a number of actions to protect water needed for health and safety and the environment in the Delta watershed. The proclamation specifically directs the State Water Board to evaluate and take action to address conditions where water is not available at water right, water right holders' priority of right, including protection at previously stored water releases that are not available to other users. Staff developed the methodology and plans to issue notices of water unavailability and unavailability for that purpose in the near future, following which Staff will begin the process for the State Water Board to consider the development of emergency regulations to address issues of water unavailability, including brief briefing board members on options and public processes. Next slide, please. So issues related to water unavailability are, this, are part of the State Water Board's core responsibilities to administer the water right priority system in the state, as well as to provide for the reasonable protection of beneficial uses of water. Administering water right priorities is most critical during times of shortage to ensure that limited supplies are diverted in conformance with water right priorities. Because senior water right holders may be located downstream of junior water right holders is not always clear to users when supplies are not available at their priority of right. Similarly, it can be unclear when previously stored water is being released for a downstream purpose and as such is unavailable for diversion. In the Delta watershed, the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project collectively referred to the projects in this presentation are responsible for meeting flow and salinity requirements for the protection of beneficial uses in the Delta, as well as specific requirements for flow and water quality on project tributaries. During periods of shortage, these requirements are met in large part through storage releases. Specifically, previously stored water releases by the projects during the dry season serves a critical function to repel salinity from intruding into the delta and making water unusable for municipal and agri agricultural purposes in much of the watershed. Maintaining adequate water and storage is also critical to ensuring it is, it is available for environmental purposes, including temperature control and minimum in-stream flows that we just talked about. When water users divert previously stored water that they do not have a right to, they diminish the amount of water available to meet project obligations out of conformance with the water right priority system and to the detriment of maintaining storage for salinity control, environmental needs, as well as other project purposes. As you've heard about, uh, currently project storage levels are at historically low levels, creating significant concerns for salinity control, municipal water supplies, and temperature management, and other environmental needs. As such, it is critical that the project storage supplies are protected. Next slide. And Diane, I was just going to point out, we have Bonnie back on if she wants to... Great. Do you want to take over, Connie? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes I can. can. Okay, great. 
Um, so I'm flying a little bit blind. I don't have the slides in front of me. We should be on slide six, um, the methodology development and public process. Uh, given the severity of the current drought conditions, the significant degradation in hydrologic conditions, and recognizing the urgent need to update and further develop the approach for determining water unavailability used during the last drought in 2014 and 15, Division staff worked on under an expedited timeline for developing this draft methodology and conducting the public process. We had our internal kickoff meeting in mid-February of this year. The draft methodology and documentation were released just three months later on May 12th, with the public comment period running from May 12th through May 25th, and a staff-led workshop 10 days ago on May 21st. Staff has considered the comments on the methodology received to date, as will be discussed later in this presentation. Staff has made or plans to make refinements to the current methodology based on comments. However, many of the comments involve issues that will require additional data, tools, and time to address, or were very general without specific reference to refinements that could be made this year. There were also a number of comments that will be further discussed or will be further considered in the refinement of the methodology prior to use in any emergency regulation and notices of water unavailability for pre-1914 um, appropriative and riparian claimants. Currently, the analysis indicates that water supply in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta watershed is insufficient to meet the needs of all post-1914 appropriative water right holders supporting notices of water unavailability this month for those users. Staff has made several refinements to the current methodology and plans to use an updated version to issue notices of water unavailability in the upcoming weeks. We will provide more information on the planned notices later in this presentation. Next slide, please. To address the issues of water unavailability, division staff has developed a methodology for identifying when available data indicates that natural and abandoned water supplies are unavailable for direct diversion or diversion to storage for consumptive use by post-1914 appropriative water users in the Delta watershed. Currently, the methodology evaluates water unavailability for, the, for these post-1914 water users during the irrigation season but is expected to be further modified for use beyond the irrigation season. The methodology also currently does not include a detailed evaluation of water unavailability for pre-1914 appropriative or riparian claimants, but is being modified to address water unavailability by these senior claimants for possible future use in notices, of water unavailability, or emergency regulations. The methodology does not apply to re-diversion of storage releases, water contract deliveries, or water transfers that are not subject to the same water right priority system. The methodology does not currently address water unavailability for non-consumptive uses of water like hydropower diversions, since these supplies are returned back to the stream, though these diversions might change the timing of flows generally from the wet season to the dry season. To the extent these changes result in abandoned flows, they are addressed in this methodology. Next slide, please. And I will now turn the presentation over to Mary Irby, environmental scientist, who will provide a brief overview of the methodology. Thank you, Connie. Good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and board members. My name is Mary Irby. I'm an environmental scientist in the board's division of water rights. I will give a brief overview of the methodology that was developed to identify which water rights may not have water available to them this summer within the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta watershed. For those interested in additional technical details regarding the methodology, you may go to the web address listed at the bottom of this slide to watch the staff technical presentation of the methodology given during the public workshop on May 21st, or consider a consult the written summary report also available on that page. Next slide, please. The methodology at its core is a comparison of water supplies and demands using the best available data and multiple assumptions to modify them. An important improvement included in this methodology in comparison to the methodology that was used during the drought in 2014 and 2015 
is the analysis of water supplies and demands at a subwatershed level in addition to the watershed wide scale. These subwatersheds were delineated based on US Geological Survey Hydrologic Unit Code Level 8 watersheds and are shown in the map on this slide. Those considered headwater subwatersheds are shown in pink and the lower subwatersheds in yellow. The legal delta as defined in the 1959 Delta Protection Act is shown with black hatching. The methodology includes both natural flows, which are runoff flows unaltered by diversion, storage, or other operations, and abandoned flows from in-stream dedications, agricultural runoff, or municipal treatment plant releases without residual claim of control. It excludes imported supplies from outside the watershed or storage releases, which would not be available to water right diverters. Natural flow in the methodology comes from estimates of monthly full natural flow. Past supply data in the methodology, including past months of the current year, come from the California Data Exchange Center for Major Rivers and from the Department of Water Resources or California Nevada River Forecast Center, CNRFC, for smaller streams. Forecasted supply data in the methodology comes from DWR's Bulletin 120 and CNRFC. Forecasted monthly full natural flow estimates include multiple flow projections to account for the uncertainty of forecasting future conditions. These various data sources are represented on the map by the small colored triangles, which show the locations at which these flow estimates were made. For the purposes of this methodology, these estimates are assumed to represent all supply available to meet demands within each subwatershed. The supply data is on a monthly time step to correspond with the available demand data. This time step is also assumed to account for transit time within the system. Next slide, please. A few types of adjustments were made to the full natural flow data set to better represent the supplies avail available for diversion downstream within the watershed. First, gap filling processes were used to account for missing past or forecasted full natural flow data or to augment full natural flow estimates that were not representative of the entire subwatershed. These adjustments were made based on hydrologic relationships with nearby watersheds with more robust data or periods of overlapping data with a more representative data set. Examples of these processes are shown in the graphs on this slide. The top graph shows gap filled data in yellow for the Bear River based on a comparison to the Yuba River. The bottom graph on this slide shows augmented data in yellow based on flows in Mill, Deer, and Butte Creeks that was augmented to estimate flows for the entire Sacramento Valley Eastside Minor Streams region. Second, abandoned in-stream flows were incorporated into the supply data set. These flows are required under certain hydropower license conditions, state water board orders, or private agreements, and do not include flow releases to meet delta flow or water quality requirements and are otherwise subject or are otherwise subject to residual claim of control. Sacramento River watershed abandoned flow values were obtained from the division's Sacramento Water Allocation Model or SACWAM and San Joaquin uh, River watershed flows were obtained from the division's water supply effects model. These flows were assumed to accrue to the valley floor downstream of individual subwatersheds. At these locations, full natural flow and abandoned in-stream flow were compared and the greater of the two values was used in the supply data set to account for in-stream flows that are met by bypass flows versus storage releases. The methodology does not account for abandoned flows being foreign in time or source. This process for incorporating abandoned in-stream flows has been refined within our most recent data set in keeping with planned updates described in the water unavailability summary report. Next slide, please.
For this analysis, water demand is based on user reported direct diversion and diversion to storage data from the State Water Board's Electronic Water Rates Information Management System, or EREMS. Diverters electronically report their monthly water diversion and use information to the system on an annual basis. The methodology uses 2018 and 2019 demand data due to those years being the most current years of demand data available and also being the only years for which data is available since the updated diversion measurement and reporting requirements went into effect with Senate Bill 88. The methodology primarily relies on 2018 demand data because it was a below normal water year. 2019 data was prepared for comparison purposes, but it is expected to be less representative of the current water year demand because it was a wet water year. From the 2018 and 2019 EREMS data set, water rate records were selected for use in the methodology based on several criteria. These include those records having points of diversion located within the Delta watershed, and those having active type statuses, um, including thereby excluding inactive, revoked, or canceled rights, and records having pre-1914 or post-1914 appropriative or riparian water right types. Minor water right types such as registrations and stock ponds were excluded because they are assumed to constitute a negligible amount of water diversion and use within the Delta watershed. And lastly, records ha that have consumptive beneficial uses were included. Those with exclusively non-consumptive uses, such as certain hydropower diversions, were excluded from the data set. This initial selection of water right records resulted in a demand data set of approximately 11,700 total records. The map on this slide shows the distri distribution of post-1914 appropriative water rights in green, in pre-1914 and riparian claims or statements of diversion and use in purple. Because EREMS data is self-reported and not systematically verified for accuracy upon receipt, it may contain inaccuracies and other errors. Therefore, a quality control check was conducted on a manageable subset of the records. Those records with a face value or reported diversion amount greater than or equal to 5,000 acre feet which accounts for about 10% of diverters in the Delta watershed, but approximately 90% of the water diverted. Based on staff review of the annual reports submitted for these records, and in some cases, information collected from communicating directly with diverters, several types of data errors were identified and corrections were applied as necessary. These included corrections of data entry and reporting issues, removal of duplicate diversion values, and limitation of, a, of demand to a rights face value if the reported value is in excess of that amount. Next slide, please. Several adjustments were made to this quality control demand data set. First, in order to be able to compare supply and demand, demand values were aggregated at the same subwatershed supply scale as supply. Where right had points of diversion in multiple subwatersheds, the total reported diversion for each water right record was split among the applicable subwatersheds based on the proportion of total points of diversion located within each subwatershed. Second, in recognition of area of origin protection, state water project and Central Valley project diversions, other than New Malonis, which does not export water from the Delta watershed, we're assumed to have the lowest priority date. In-basin uses, in -basin uses served by the projects, which are not subject to area of origin protection, are expected to be met with previously stored water this summer due to the lack of significant inflow and other project obligations. Assigning the most junior priority of right to the projects also helps prevent any duplicate reporting between the projects and their various settlement contractors uh, with their own underlying rights or claims for materially impacting the analysis. Third, the methodology accounts for interbasin transfers. For example, uh, the Central Valley Project Trinity River division demand within the Delta was removed from the demand data set because these diversions are met by imported water. 
Lastly, the demand data set was adjusted to account for agricultural and municipal return flows by the application of a return flow factor that varies by month and watershed to reduce demand. These return flow factors were derived from CalSIM 3 in the CalSIM 3 model and were applied to demands um, to the, were applied to demands through those subwatersheds where the majority of diversions and return flows in the watershed occur. Next slide, please. Three additional adjustments were made to either the supply or demand data sets based on a comparison to the other data set. These adjustments are important due to the two scales at which supply and demand are compared in the methodology. The headwater subwatershed scale and the watershed wide scale being either the Sacramento River watershed or the San Joaquin River watershed. First, supply and demand within the headwater subwatersheds are compared to assess the physical availability of supplies in the headwaters. The graph on this slide shows an example of this process for the Yuba River subwatershed. Demand is shown by the stacked bars with statement demand, that is riparian or pre-1914 appropriative demand, in blue at the bottom, and more junior post-1914 appropriative demand shown in gray, stacked by decade of priority above it, with the most junior water right priorities at the top. The superimposed lines represent supply. The single red supply line on the left side of the graph represents supply for prior months of this year. Where it branches into four lines, these are supply forecasts for the remainder of the water year, ranging from drier potential conditions in red to wetter potential conditions in yellow. Demand that is above the most applicable supply line based on current, current conditions is demand that cannot be physically met by available supplies as there are no other sources of available supply for these subwatersheds, unlike is the case for downstream subwatersheds. This unmet demand is removed from the demand data set using the watershed-wide analysis to more accurately assess the availability of supplies to meet downstream demand. The water right holders identified as having unmet demands in the headwater subwatershed analysis may receive a notice of water unavailability based on this analysis. Second, the headwater subwatershed analysis also considers that there may be very dry conditions where the available supply cannot satisfy even all riparian and pre-1914 claimants. When these conditions exist, the headwater subwatershed is assumed to be disconnected from the watershed at large. And therefore, both supply and demand are removed from these subwatersheds within the watershed-wide analysis. In the example graph shown, this would be the case for all water supply forecasts beginning in July. The last adjustment to the data sets is the allocation legal delta demands. Because the diverters in the legal delta may have access to supplies from both the Sacramento and the San Joaquin River watersheds, their demands are divided between the two watersheds to enable analysis of each watershed individually. The methodology makes this division based on the proportion of the total supply contributed by each subwatershed. For example, if the Sacramento River watershed contributes 80% of the connected supply within the Delta watershed for a given month, 80% of legal Delta demand is charged against Sacramento River supply for that month, and 20% is charged against San Joaquin River supply. This method has been slightly revised from what was described during the public workshop on the methodology and what is currently displayed in the visualizations. Prior to the revision, this proration was calculated using all supply generated within each subwatershed. The revised method uses only water supplies from connected subwatersheds based on the availability of water to senior water right holders, as I just described. Next slide, please. After these comparative adjustments are made, the methodology compares supply and demand at the watershed wide scale, being the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River watershed separately. Examples of these graphs are shown on this slide with the Sacramento River watershed shown at the top and the San Joaquin River watershed shown at the bottom. 
Demand is organized in the same way as described for the headwater subwatershed visualization. However, you may notice the addition of large light blue bars at the top of the stacked bars. These are the project demands, which have been assigned the most junior priority for the purposes of this analysis, as I described a moment ago. You'll also notice that these graphs contain only one supply line, which is in purple. This is a result of the comparative adjustments to the supply and demand data sets. For the examples shown, the adjustments were made using the 90% exceedance supply forecast, one of the drier supply projections. These visualization tools, including the headwater subwatershed analysis shown on the previous slide, are available on the methodology webpage. The tool is interactive, allowing users to select among watersheds and between the watershed wide scales, as well as to view either the 2018 or 2019 demand data sets. A detailed demonstration of the visualization tool was provided during the methodology workshop, including how a diverter with a right in a headwater subwatershed or a lower subwatershed might best use the tool to understand water availability at their priority of right. That demonstration is available to view on the webpage listed on this slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As mentioned previously, the purpose of the methodology is to determine water unavailability based on the water rights priority system. Before issuing notices of water unavailability, staff will update the monthly supply forecast with the most current data available and consider recent daily full natural flow estimates um, of supply to ensure that the most appropriate monthly supply forecast is being used for the analysis. An example of this comparison for the Sacramento River watershed is shown on this slide. The blue line represents cumulative daily full natural flow, full natural flow values um, through nearly the end of May. It shows the conditions are tracking most closely with the 99% exceedance forecast, the driest projection. Staff will also consider the impact of any significant anticipated precipitation events on water unavailability. Together, together, these checks will help the board to determine which diverters should be notified of water unavailability and when those notices should be issued or lifted. I'll now hand the presentation back over to Diane to discuss the public input that has been received regarding the methodology. Sorry, can I ask a quick question before we go on to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, where in this is, um, is, is water supply that's required to stay in stream for um, public trust resources factored in? Is that in the yeah, <laughs> since we condensed our slides, it was probably a little easy to overlook. Um, if we go back a few, um, can you just scroll back on the slides for me? I'll tell you when to stop. Here. Thank you. The adjustments to the supply data set. So that's the second bullet here. Um, I didn't illustrate it for you, but um, we pulled those from Calcium 3. Um, and it is um, abandoned flows that that have like an end to their applicability. Um, they're available for diversion below that. Um, and the change that we made is that we're now comparing um, those abandoned in-stream flow amounts to the full natural flow value that we have and taking whichever one is larger um, to account for the fact that they might be being met by that full natural flow or they might be um, releases of stored water um, that's in addition to full natural flow. That I'm suspecting that? Laurel might have a slightly different question. Oh, sorry. Is, that, is that correct, Laurel? Are you asking, do our, is the water unavailability methodology addressing in-stream flow needs? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, I think that's probably oh. the question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, this was also helpful, but <laughs> yeah. 
So the methodology does not currently, is not currently um, assuming any needed flow level for the protection of um, in-stream beneficial uses that's not available for diversion. It's essentially identifying if all of the water that's available in the system is allocated to consumptive uses, this is how much water would be available to which group of users at which priority of right. However, the methodology does help to protect water needed to meet in-stream flow requirements. Because in the Bay Delta watershed, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources have primary responsibility for meeting in-stream flow requirements as part of um, long-standing agreements and water right decisions. Um, that responsibility is assumed to may retain, be retained by DWR and reclamation. However, if other water users are diverting their previously stored water that they release to meet those in-stream flow requirements, then that water, there's less of water available for the projects to meet all of their obligations, including their in-stream flow requirements, um, temperature requirements, salinity requirements, those kinds of things. So a big part of the effort is, is in order to protect that previously stored water so that the projects can retain water in storage in order to meet their various obligations. However, there isn't currently as part of the water and availability methodology provisions for protecting a portion of the natural and abandoned flows in order to provide for environmental protections. That is something the board could consider as part of an emergency regulation or they could consider emergency regulations that manage down to manage all of water purely on a um, water and availability basis related to consumptive uses. There are a variety of different approaches that could be considered. For the notices, the assumption is that we're looking at all of the water being available for consumptive use purposes. Thanks, Diane. I think that probably it's shifting to me now. Um, so does that answer, does that answer all your questions, Laurel? Um, that, that helps me a lot. I'll probably have more questions, right. it, but thanks. I think we're now on slide 16, please. Okay, great. So I'll pick it up here and go over some of the public comments that we received. This slide shows all of the comments that we've received either, either dur during the public workshop or um, in writing. Um, we really appreciate all of the input that we've received today on, we recognize a very expedited timeframe. We also appreciate um, the various offers that we received verbally in writing for stakeholders to work with us further to address their comments and also um, where parties have identified that they um, are working on voluntary solutions that could meet the intent of the notices of water and availability and potentially future um, emergency regulations. Next slide, please. So I'll go over some of the general comments we've received so far. Um, several of the commenters identified that the current methodology represents a substantial improvement from the method used during the prior drought as Mara um, explained earlier. Um, and they also expressed the importance of taking action to address issues of water unavailability and to implement the water right priority systems for the reasons we just discussed. Some suggested improvements that could be made in the near ter term and other raised issues that won't be able to be addressed this summer. Some of the commoners raised issues with the expedited process to develop and employ the methodology and identify the need for a longer term process that can address longstanding, complex and controversial legal and technical issues. Some suggested that the current methodology is appropriate for notices of water and availability, but would not be appropriate for curtailment orders uh, under any future emergency regulation for some of those reasons. Most of the comments acknowledged in one form or another the complexity that exists with determining water and availability with 
the data, tools, and other technical and legal complexities and uncertainties that exist in this watershed, um, particularly on an expedited time frame. Some suggested that due to these issues that any action by the board related to water and availability would not be appropriate. Some suggested that instead of, um, of a water and availability methodology that the board develops that utilizing the complaint process exclusively would be more appropriate. Um, others identified issues with the met methodology that should be addressed but did not suggest improvements or improvements that could be easily implemented in the short term. With respect to the comments that indicate in one way or another that notices of water and availability should not be issued in the, in the near term with the currently available best information, as we discussed earlier, this is not a tenable solution this year given the very dire water supply conditions that exist. Um, as was described earlier today, staff have been in regular communication with DWR, Reclamation, and the fishery agencies regarding the conditions this year and have heard very clearly that um, notices of water and availability and possibly future curtailments are a key component of the process of the um, plans to provide make up for the shortages and supplies that exist this year. Um, these communications have made clear the very real need to address issues of water and availability um, at a water user's priority of right to protect previously stored water released to meet Delta water quality and flow requirements and other project obligations as we just discussed. Um, complaints against individual users would not be effective for addressing overall issues of unavailability. Complaints have also been received in prior years related to issues of overall water, water and availability in the Delta watershed that are still relevant. Further, many of the issues uh, of concern related to water and availability pertain to ensuring project supplies to meet minimum environmental protections and minimum health and safety supplies for which the State Water Board has an obligation beyond administering the water right priority system as we just talked about. Um, issues related to using the methodology for possible emergency regulations, we recognize that that's, um, that will be an additional discussion beyond the discussion that we have today. And um, we plan to provide for that again, that will probably be on an expedited timeframe, but there will be additional public process to consider any possible future emergency regulations. Next slide, please. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the more specific comments that were made. Um, several comments were made that are being addressed or planned to be addressed in the near term. Commenters identified where additional clarification and technical documentation would be helpful in order to better explain the methodology and the improvements. Other comments indicated that clarification would be helpful to avoid misunderstanding of the methodology. We got some comments um, in particular um, about issues that, that indicated that we just hadn't likely um, explained the methodology clearly enough. Um, and so some of those issues should be easily addressed with additional documentation. Um, these changes to add clarification and additional documentation are currently being made or will be made in the near future to the documentation. Other comments identified that follow-up action should be taken to ensure compliance with water use reporting requirements included in Senate Bill 88. These actions are also being taken separately from the water and availability work, but will inform that work as appropriate. Comments were made regarding providing better support for abandoned and return flows. This information is also planned to be provided in the updated water and availability report to the extent that um, those issues are well understood. Um, to the extent that you know there are there's still some ambiguity, we are using the best available information. Other comments were made related to refinement of riparian and pre-14 demands. As we discussed earlier, staff is currently working to build upon initial work to refine demand data for pre-1914 and riparian claimants um, and associated documentation for possible use in issuing further notices of water and availability. Several interests also identify that they were developing voluntary solutions. Um, again, voluntary solutions that meet the intent of the water 
and availability of notices are highly encouraged, including voluntary solutions that prevent the diversion of previously stored water by water right holders that do not have a right to that water. It's our understanding that the Delta Water Master in particular is working with Delta Interest to attempt to come to such an agreement in the near term. Other parties on the San Joaquin River and Casamas River also identified that they were developing possible voluntary solutions for consideration in the near term. Next slide, please. Next, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the comments that I think are going to take more time, better data, um, and um, new tools in order to address. Some comments suggest that essentially more perfect knowledge of all of the variables associated with water and availability are needed for any action on water, water and availability. Um, the reality of the situation is that you know, we have the quality of data that we have and we have the shortages that we have and, and that's the data that we have to work with in the long term. There are various activities I think the division is planning to refine that data. Um, and that is definitely a high priority, but given supply limitations, um, it, you know, information indicates that it's still important for the board to be using the best available information to determine where water may be unavailable, particularly with over 17,000 water right holders and claims of rights on record in the watershed with even more points of diversion, numerous real-time and dynamic supply issues that are, that are not all well understood and numerous other complexities, it will not be possible to develop, you know, a methodology that reflects all of those nuances what I think we need to come to is a fair representation of water supply availability for different users. Um, and that is what staff has been working on. We'll continue to refine the analyses that we've um, developed to date, particularly during um, any consideration of emergency regulations that we don't think at least at this point um, that the information that we've heard as part of the comments um, means that we, we should not be looking at issuing notices of water unavailability for post-1914 water users. Um, getting into some of the specific comments, some commenters suggested the use of daily and even sub-daily real-time verified demand and return flow data through SBA. 88 reporting requirements, the board has been working to improve water demand reporting. However, significant additional work is needed before real-time data that is verified can be used for the purposes of water unavailability, including implementation of additional reporting requirements, significant infrastructure improvements for water users, follow-up on compliance and associated IT infrastructure so that this information can be assimilated in real time and assessed for accuracy. Currently, the board only receives monthly demand data after the fact. This demand data, again, is self-reported and as such is subject to error. Um, as Mara discussed, staff have taken efforts, significant efforts to improve the demand data set that we're using um, this year, um, including removing duplicate reporting, adjusting de demand data to reflect water rate limitations and other improvements. Use of more real-time verified data could be explored further with any emergency regulation or in long-term planning, but could not be done in, at least in the very short term. Similar comments regarding um, supplies were made as were made with demand, suggesting the use of daily or sub-daily real-time verified supply and abandoned flow data. Similarly, developing real-time verified supply data is not possible at this time, but can be explored further um, in the future in coordination with the Department of Water Resources and other federal and local partners. Comments were also made that increased spatial resolution and dynamic supply and demand analyses are needed to reflect the specific issues of water and availability at each point of diversion. This level of complexity would require significant improvements in tools and data and time to develop. Some comments suggested that adjudication-like proceedings are needed prior to addressing issues of water unavailability 
given the number of right holders, the complexity of the issues related to adjudications, such a process could take decades and significant resources and would not address water supply shortages that exist this year and likely not for the next several years um, if we continue to face water supply shortages. A number of longstanding legal and technical issues were also raised. Many of these are specifically related to water availability issues in the Delta watershed. Um, to the extent that Delta water users can develop voluntary solutions, these voluntary solutions may address issues, at least in the short term, for purposes of um, the notices of water and availability. Longer term resolution of these longstanding issues will take more time. Uh, next slide, please. This slide shows some of the specific additional refinements to the methodology that are planned before notices of water and availability are released based on many of these refinements are based on public comments um, and additional staff review. Staff have further examined supply data sources used in the methodology and in order to to ensure that we are relying upon the best available sources of supply data, staff have identified that adjustments for small for some smaller tributaries are appropriate, including for Poudre Creek. Staff have also further examined abandoned flow assumptions in recognition that abandoned flows that are part of an in-stream flow requirement would not likely occur in addition to full natural flow, the greater a full natural flow or abandoned flows was used. Um, in addition, uh, flows from Stony Creek, um, abandoned flows from Stony Creek were removed since they're not expected to be abandoned flows occurring from Stony Creek this summer and fall. Staff have also refined the assignment of water rights that exist in multiple sub-watersheds to better reflect supply sources for those demands, including for the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project demands. Lastly, in response to comments, staff have adjusted the proration method used to assign delta demands between the Sacramento and San Joaquin River watershed to account for actual supplies that could be available to the delta to exclude consideration of supplies that were where there is no continuity with the delta. This again was a comment that was made as part of the public comment process. Staff will continue to work with stakeholders to make refinements to the methodology that are possible this summer. However, those refinements are not expected to affect the finding that water is not available for post-1914 water rate holders due to the extreme limitations in supplies this summer. Staff will also continue to work with water users who propose voluntary agreements that meet the intent of the notices of water and, and availability to implement water right priorities, the water priority system and protect previously stored water releases made to meet water quality and flow requirements. Um, with that, that covers um, the brief summary of the uh, comments that we received and I'll turn it back to Connie to discuss next steps. Thank you, Diane. Um, if we are in slide 21, please. Um, next several slides, we'll be talking about next steps and also um, how to obtain additional information. So we previously mentioned that we're looking to issue notices of water unavailability in the upcoming weeks. Um, we are targeting mid-June uh, for these notices. So what are notices of water unavailability? Notices of water unavailability are used to inform diverters that based on the best available information, there is insufficient water available to divert under their priority of right. Notices of water unavailability are not directives to stop diverting and are different from notices of curtailment that would occur as part of a possible future emergency regulation. Notices inform affected diverters that water is either currently unavailable or will be unavailable in the near future for their diversion. Notices of water unavailability play an important role by offering the opportunity for voluntary compliance prior to the initiation of any formal enforcement action by the State Water Board. Diverting unavailable water can result in penalties for injuring more senior water right holders and public trust resources. Before the State Water Board takes enforcement action, diverters will be afforded notice and an opportunity for a hearing. We expect to issue approximately 
or close to 17,000 notices of water unavailability. The exact number of uh, water right holders um, is still being looked at. Uh, it, the notices will indicate that as of the date of the notice, water supply in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta watershed is insufficient to meet the needs of all post-1914 appropriative water right holders. The notices will also include a warning to all pre-1914 and riparian water right holders that water will become unavailable this summer for some senior right holders. The State Water Board is currently in the process of evaluating the seniority at which water may be unavailable for these right holders and when. Next slide, please. It should be slide 22. As Diane already mentioned, um, and as occurred during the prior drought, we anticipate that water users will be interested in proposing possible voluntary agreements or solutions in response to the notices of water unavailability. In order for such agreements to be acceptable, they should include all affected water users and should be approved before being implemented. As Diane also mentioned earlier, a number of issues were raised in the public comments that are unique to the legal delta. We understand that water right holders are working closely with the Delta Water Master on voluntary measures that may resolve these legal and technical issues and how to address them, and we certainly encourage that continued cooperation. We also anticipate that there may be issues with notices of water unavailability and water supply needs for health and safety. Water users that may face these circumstances should be working to obtain alternative sources of water, including through voluntary transfers or purchases. Where available sources are not available and there are true health and safety needs, those needs should be identified to the board as soon as possible so that board staff can work with water users to address those issues. For those reasons, it is critical that especially the post-1914 water right holders complete the online certification form once they receive the notices of water unavailability and sign up for email subscription lists to receive the most up-to-date information. Next slide, please. Board staff are continuing to closely track hydrology in coordination with our state and federal partner agencies. Current conditions, which are expected to worsen as the dry season progresses, may warrant development of emergency regulations to protect water supply and beneficial uses. Emergency regulations may be needed if notices of water unavailability do not protect the diminishing available water supplies. Again, the point of notices of water unavailability is to provide notice to diverters when supplies insufficient for their priority of right and help the board and diverters implement California's water rights system in times of shortage. Notices are not the same as a formal curtailment or cease and desist order under which the board directs a diverter to cease diversion. An emergency regulation could create a temporary emergency appropriate process through which the board could issue official curtailment orders. That is an immediate directive to stop diverting. Additionally, the scope and scale of curtailments that may be needed in the Delta watershed is significant and broad. Notices of water unavailability that staff are anticipating for delivery this month will only apply to post-1914 diversions. However, pre-1914 and riparian diverters use large volumes of water during the summer, and water appears, based on current data, likely to become unavailable under some of those rights in the near future as well. Fair and effective and timely implementation of the water rights system and protection of lawful users and uses of water are critical for the shortage conditions we are seeing. Without an emergency regulation authorizing the curtailment of pre-1914 and riparian rights, the board's authority to curtail those rights is likely to be challenged, and legal challenges are likely to impede the board's ability to effectively curtail those rights in a timely manner. The table on the slide shows the volume of water associated with pre-1914 and riparian diversions in the Sacramento River and San Joaquin watershed, which cumulatively amount to approximately 7.5 million acre feet of water on an annual basis. These pre-14 and riparian diversions are largely self-regulated. Emergency regulations could help ensure comprehensive, fair, and timely implementation of the water rights priority system for all diverters. Next slide, please.
Given the timelines to develop emergency regulations, staff are beginning to review and consider potential approaches to emergency regulations and necessary components, in including the draft methodology presented today, as well as the Term 91 approach that protects stored water and delta outflow. Develop, as, as Diane has already mentioned, the development of emergency regulations would need to be done on an accelerated time frame, but would include a public process. The timeline may be later in July or more likely in August. Next slide, please. There are a couple of ways by which we are able to quickly and effectively communicate information to the public and stakeholders regarding future updates, namely through our web pages and LIRA's email service. Shown on this page are several links for pertinent web pages, including the Waterboard Stroud web page previously discussed a web page that includes the tools and methodologies the board is working on to support drug decision making, and the project specific web page that contains the summary report visualization tool and Excel spreadsheet for the methodology we discussed today. Next slide, please. Shown on the slide is our sign up page to subscribe to the various email subscription lists the board offers, also called LIRIS. I would like to flag our drought updates email list. We are also in the process of establishing a, a subscription list specifically for drought updates relevant to the Bay Delta. If you have not already signed up for the email subscription list, we highly recommend that you do so. We will provide updates regarding the methodology and information on notices issued on water unavailability to this list. You can sign up on this page or the methodology page. You can also contact us if you have any questions via email at bay-delta at waterboards.ca.gov or leave a message on our Bay Delta Drought voicemail box. Next slide, please. That concludes the staff presentation today and we are um, happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for what I know is uh, a lot uh, to try to cover in a very short amount of time, um, knowing that this was uh, a days long uh, workshop that uh, you all tried to quickly condense for us and really appreciate it. I think I'll just say, you know, to your all's credit, um, we actually don't have any public commenters on this item. So you had did such a thorough job at the workshop that um, no one is deciding to, to comment on this today. So um, it does provide us here as a board some opportunity for a little back and forth. So I just want to say, again, say thank you. I know that it has been under incredible pressure and um, from us, from, from the circumstances that we find ourselves with, that um, you've had to do uh, Herculean work again um, and a work that I have reviewed and don't see a fatal flaw amongst it. I know that there are certainly feedback that we are receiving regarding a more perfect system and I'm there. I wish we had a perfect system. And you look at some of the fundamental challenges we have in the water rights space, and it's um, something that's decades of accumulated neglect uh, collectively, we as a state that we have to deal with in these very unfortunate and um, you know pressing circumstances to deal with our water rights system. And so um, it is what great, with great faith that I look at the work here and know that it's a vast improvement of just uh, you know five years ago without sustained investment into the water rights system and or even the way that we engage, but for SB 88, which you know did provide us at least then a yearly um, uh, report from and monthly time steps for some of our diverters. But uh, we don't have the real time 21st century water rights system that I would be uh, say is Cadillac and, and uh, ironclad there. And instead what we have is nature curtailing us, the very obviousness of that and the need for the state and local communities to move through that curtailment in a way that doesn't allow, you know, unmitigated impact to human health and safety in our environment, but instead shows that we can make best do of what is available now, which is sufficient data to move forward faster than we certainly would like to, uh, and less resourced uh, than we should be for it, but um, needing to move ahead. So, um, you know, I think that the other point that I would make is there's a continuum here, certainly between voluntary actions and regulatory work that we are doing here. I say continuum because they are not two different things. 
that are based off of the same data to my previous point and information that if folks have a more comprehensive have more comprehensive data as you've heard here we, we are interested but needing to move quickly but let's talk about that next system let's talk about what we might need in the months and the year ahead and use this as an opportunity to add a little um, emphasis and a little urgency to the care that we need to bring to our water rights system not just at the water board but we collectively as a state um, and and use that to um, make sure we're having the sorts of conversations that we need to. Um, those conversations include what is an incredible job and work that our Delta Water Master has done that maybe shine a light into the space that we need to be going there uh, quickly over, you know, with uh, not an incredible uh, amount of resource, but a lot of trust and a lot of uh, work with water rights holders, figuring out who has riparian or pre-1914 rights you know, shaking out and get, getting better data and understanding fundamental work in the water rights system that we need to be doing across our watersheds to just say, prove up, prove up what, what, to what you have claimed to, ensure you have a, a, a proper right to that, and importantly, help contribute to this data, shared data uh, exercise that we're all in to become better decision makers in the water rights space. And so um, just to, to say that, again, I think that if we focus on what is the same information that one might use in a voluntary space or in this regulatory space and say, you know, let it, let us all be better decision makers in our, our common space, I think is important to bridge what is sometimes a false dichotomy between, you know, a regulatory action at the state level or a voluntary action at a local level. We're all looking at the same, needing to uh, protect the same uh, uh, outcomes and human health uh, first and foremost, but also how we uh, lessen uh, unmitigated impacts in the environment. Um, and so I'll just end and say that I think that um, not unlike the work that staff have already done to emphasize the fact that, you know, 10% of our of our diverters are diverting 90% of the flow and that maybe a focus on those 10%, those which may be the more sophisticated amongst our water rights holders anyway, may yield us um, some, some continued uh, ability to just prioritize and figure out how we best um, not have the perfect system now, but the best that the state of California can possibly contribute to. So just thank you um, for, for the good work. I know it's been a long day. There's a lot to possibly unpack in what was provided, but I think um, that's my top level at least. And I just appreciate everyone's time. Colleagues? Well, I have a I have a list of questions, but before um, doing that, um, I'd like to just um, you made some good comments there, uh, Chair Esquivel, and just thought I'd um, uh, say me too on um, just this sense that we don't have to get it just right, and it's important that we build on um, progress. And a universal comment that we did receive in the comments was that. Um, we've advanced. We've advanced in the information that we have. Um, however, I'm still concerned that um, just looking at ways that we can um, incentivize um, these VAs, because I think that if we do get um, a significant number of VAs, then we're going to, um, you know, still have more than likely we will still have some challenges. Um, just having been through the last drought, um, both the challenges, you know, in the in the courts, but then also proving up a case um, before our board, before the hearing officers, you know, demanding um, more, um, not as granular as perfect, but more granular than what we received. And so um, in the spirit of that, um, I do have um, a, a request in that area. Uh, there, there were quite a few suggestions. Um, of course, a lot of folks said uh, have have the time step be daily and have it be just perfect. But then there were other, um, I think, you know, maybe more creative approaches. I think the state contractor suggested weekly. There were some suggestions to work with DWR, um, also um, validation of actual use, depending on whatever we go with. And it sounds like the quality control system that you've implemented um, already uh, does account for some of that. And so I guess I would just, you know, encourage further refinement depending on, on what's adopted. I guess my question there is, um, can that further refinement continue in the midst um, once 
um, curtailments are already issued. Yeah, I mean, it, particularly at this stage where we're issuing notices of water and availability, that is really why Connie emphasized um, signing up for our email distribution list. We are planning to send out one paper notice to all of these users identifying that really parties should uh, sign up for that email distribution list, to visit our website, and if they do not have access to those electronic means of communication, there's the phone line provided. That's really, um, you know, we need to be a little more nimble getting out paper notices to this larger group of users and making refinements um, in the midst of rapidly evolving conditions and very poor conditions is, you know, a challenge. So that's the, that's the direction we're trying to move is to really utilize our email distribution list and um, real-time communications. Um, so we do continue to, we do want to continue to make refinements. It's not clear that some of those refinements, particularly for um, determinations of water and availability for post-1914 users, is really going to change the determination because, um, you know, it will probably affect, you know, how deep it looks like water is unavailable for pre-1914 users and repairians and those types of issues. But um, we will definitely continue to make refinements. Um, I think there will be refinements in the water and availability arena. And then again, we need to look at the methodology we intend to use if we're going to proceed with emergency regulations. And that, you know, obviously is its own additional process. I think we would hope to build upon work that we've already done. Um, but in that yeah. arena, you know, we have additional opportunities for, you know, to couple that with reporting requirements. Um, and some other actions that are more difficult to employ in a notice environment. Um, so those are all things that we're thinking apart as part thinking of as part of the next phase of the process. Great, and then I, I do have quite a few, so I, I, I'll try and move through quickly here, but um, on riparians, aren't we at the stage already where riparian water is not available? Um, it, there is some amount of um, natural flow available. And so when there's natural flow available, that would be shared between all the riparian users. That's obviously a challenge to implement that type of approach, particularly if you're managing down to a supply of zero rather than a situation where you have an in-stream flow requirement. The other challenge that we have is I think roughly 50% of the riparian claimants also claim a pre-1914 appropriative right. So this is, again is where I think having an emergency regulation potentially could help with reporting requirements to really identify which right are you claiming this year so that we can do that accounting exercise. Right, right now it's a challenge when we have claims occurring under both types of rights. Yeah, understood. And we'll get, if we're not there already, which I thought we were, um, then we'll get there fairly soon. So, um, you know, just utilizing the Delta Water Master's memo, um, you can't claim everything. So, okay. Um, and then mo moving along here, um, I think the challenge, there, there's going to be significant challenges just going through the comments, um, you know, significant challenges in the Delta. Hopefully we'll get um, a, a voluntary uh, package from Delta Water users. Um, but um, I continue to be concerned, especially on Central Delta. And so I'm just, I'm confused on this issue of a proportion of supply in the analysis. So it doesn't seem to be aligned with Water Right Order 89-8, which is a precedential decision that um, I understand um, it, it at least refers to the South Delta. Uh, I don't know about Central Delta, but that water supplies in the South Delta are um, coming from um, the San Joaquin system, not the Sacramento. Dana, do you want to address that? Or that might be something, I, I acknowledge that comment and we did see that comment and are, are looking into it. There is a lot of complexity in the Delta. A lot of the issues that were raised have been issues that have been around for, you know, decades and decades, I think, you know, prior to the, the project's development. And um, so sorting through those issues, I think is 
going to be a challenge, quite frankly. And um, those are um, those are issues that um, that we'll need to work through. I don't know if Dana wants to add more on that. Sorry, I was still muted. I'm. I, that is an issue we'll have to follow up on. I don't have a response today. Sorry about okay. that. Understood. So I guess I'll just, um, you know, I read through the decision. It's complicated. And so I, I don't want to make it sound like I know the answers. But one thing that I do feel strongly about, and that is there are a lot of complicated issues that have not been resolved. And so to the, to the extent that we can tee up those issues, but not go back and undo something where we already do have an answer. And so if a previous board issued that decision um, where it seems to fit, I think that we should apply it um, so that we can, again, you know, further refine things for the remaining um, issues. So Vice Chair Diodamo, I just wanted to tighten it up a little bit in the sense that um, that is a, a precedential decision that has been pointed to in a number of instances. At the same time, there is some countervailing language within the board's decision 1641 and elsewhere. And going back a number of years, this along with the Delta pool and a few other issues have been sort of high level issues that have been primed for a definitive resolution at some point by the board. Mm -hmm. But so far the sort of the conflicting threads have not yet been resolved. Okay, okay, fair enough. So um, talking about these challenging issues then, um, it seems to me that since we have the, uh, and I know this is not for us to decide today, but I do just want to flag for us to be thinking about um, where we can move quickly, move definitively, but there will be some of these remaining challenges um, and complex issues. How can we best tee things up so that we can utilize the expertise um, or assistance of the administrative hearings office. And I don't expect an answer, but if you, you know, want to comment on that now, fine. If not, just, you know, wanting to flag that that's something that I'm interested in because I do uh, feel frustrated that sitting here uh, many years after the last drought, we still don't know the answer to those questions. And I don't want to leave the board um, at some point in the future, knowing that the the future board is probably going to have these same uh, challenges, still not answering these questions. So, how can we thoughtfully tee up um, some of these challenging issues that seem to always point back to the Delta? I'll just offer one one response. I don't have the full full answer, but we have been coordinating closely with the Delta Water Master's Office, and you know I know these issues are are certainly front and center on his um, you know agenda of items to think about and problem solve on, um, and so we will continue to do that, and I think work with him on you know how potentially to involve the administrative hearing office and and where exactly to do that. Great. And then I have, hopefully these are just quick, like how is this being treated, but treatment of stored water. Uh, how is uh, stored water being treated after it serves its purpose? So say water moves down New Malonis to Vernalis. How is that water treated after it hits Vernalis? Or another sort of related question is um, projects that re-divert at the pumps. You know, how is that previously stored water being treated in the analysis? So in terms of making findings for water availability, the, the purpose of the analysis is to determine water available, natural and, and abandoned flows. The purpose is not to, you know, allocate previously stored water for project purposes that, you know, those are, those allocations are being made under contract. However, there is commingling of water. There's an, it's unclear to users, those types of issues. Um, I think the other issue that you're getting after is the projects make storage releases for various purposes. They make them to serve their downstream contractors, um, both along the river and in the Delta and uh, also to export water from the Delta. They also make releases in order to mean, meet water quality and flow requirements. 
we are considering all of the releases that are made for water quality and flow requirements as not abandoned flows, unlike some of the other in-stream flow requirements that we are considering as abandoned flows. I recognize that we got the comment from, um, from parties on the San Joaquin River related to um, treatment of new Molinus releases. It is um, our understanding that those releases are intended to contribute to delta outflows. Um, this is something in particular the, the Reclamation is counting upon this year for um, meeting their obligations. I, I'll let Dana comment on the legal issues pertaining to that, which I know she's looked into a little bit further. I don't have anything to add to what um, Diane said, other than to say that if the if the water is being released for the express purpose of meeting delta outflow, that we're not um, considering it to be abandoned. Okay. Same as um, with the other project reservoirs. That's helpful. Thank you. And then um, um, as to uh, protecting stored water, it seems that there's either you know the the water unavailability and curtailment another approach would be um, a regulation but then there's a complaint process as well so um, i recall that we did get a complaint back in 2015 or 2014 um, from the state contractors and just wondering what is the status of that complaint is it still pending That is a good question. I believe that it is still pending. I'm not, Eric may know particularly. I, you know, I don't believe that it was further resolved. I think the drought conditions subsided, um, but I think the issues identified in that campaign are still relevant. Right. right. Okay. So I think, okay. you know, and I know we're not here today to talk about an emergency reg, but because we're gonna be moving so quickly, I just am using this as an opportunity to communicate with my colleagues and you know stakeholders that are listening that um, in looking at a reg, I'd be curious about uh, the um, codifying the existing approach that you're talking about on water and availability as opposed to going forward with a complaint as opposed to um, something that we might be looking at on the Russian River and that is um, a reg to protect stored water. I don't know the pros and cons of those three different approaches, but I'm very curious to hear your opinion about that. And with that, um, I'm finished with my questions. Thank you. I'll, I'll just provide a, a quick reply to the complaint issue. Um, I think complaints are, are similar to the existing tools that we have with notices of water and availability. They would be subject to individual um, investigation and enforcement action, it would be a lot more complex, more time consuming. Um, it's not to say it's, it's not, it's, it is certainly an option that is on the table, but in terms of providing, um, addressing the issues of water and availability, it would be, um, I think, a lot more challenging than an, an emergency regulation where your enforcement process is just, quite frankly, much more efficient and effective. Um, and in individual based um, complaint processes. Um, also, I think there may be some lack of clarity in terms of actions that could be taken related to water and availability for riparians and pre-14 users. Um, and I can again let Dana or David Rose um, respond to that more if needed. Thank you, Ms. Riddle. And thank you, Vice Chair. Fellow board colleagues, any other questions or comments? I know there's a lot. I will, yeah, there is a lot. And I will actually, uh, uh, Chair Esquivel, I think your very articulate remarks earlier uh, about this, the state of our water rate system were spot on and the investments that are needed um, go without saying. And I think this year has really called uh, a highlight to really what we need to do going forward. 
where I am less certain is uh, right now and the time that we have to make decisions in the coming days and weeks and months here, um, not knowing how long this drought will be, but understanding just how severe it's become and so quickly and, and you know, far more quickly than any of us had really anticipated. Um, so I've, I've really appreciated the discussion today and the good questions that have already been shared um, by Vice Chair um, and just acknowledging we're not, we're not gonna have answers, you know, fully today. Um, but I do, I, I will be interested to hear more about voluntary agreements um, in any given watershed, tributary, you name it, and the relative benefits uh, of those agreements, the relative benefit that those agreements could provide in a short time frame, in, in terms of them being able to be implemented quickly um, versus perhaps, you know, our, our existing process or even looking at emergency regulations or looking at other efforts where we you know, are obviously spread thin. Um, and I appreciate all the work that Diane, you and your Tani and your team have done here and how far you've gotten us. Um, but I, I don't know what proposals will come in or what they'll look like, um, but just in weighing the, the pros and cons of you know, embracing a, you know, a voluntary approach for this summer to get through this summer, you know, against, you know, what benefit we might, and, and allowing that tributary to then balance, you know, their own water supply versus the ben any relative benefit that we might get from moving forward with the unavailability approach that we have today. Um, setting aside that there are no emergency regulations, we won't have them for, for months now um, in all likelihood. And so, you know, thinking now in June, in July and August, likely, you know, what solution might get us the best um, impact in managing the system, in allowing us to manage our priority system, and in freeing up supply for all the uses that we've just, you know, been discussing today. So, you know, I'll leave it at that. I'm just interested in perhaps hearing what your thoughts are in terms of how you would weigh a voluntary agreement in terms of, you know, does it need to be exactly a one for one trade off and, you know, with our unavailability method, or is there more to it, more nuance to it in terms of um, short term benefits and utility and uh, a less of a drain on staff resources? Um, that's a good question. I, I think voluntary agreements, the that involve more water users are, you know, are helpful. I think it's going to be challenging for us if we have voluntary agreements that only include a subset of water users. I also think um, early consultation with DWR and reclamation on issues pertaining to um, protection of previously stored water would be very helpful to us. I would certainly make that request of parties proposing voluntary agreements, but the more baked they can bring us of a voluntary agreement that meets those two criteria of really encapsulating uh, the majority of the water use in a watershed and also having consultation with DWR and reclamation um, related to, you know, getting their verification and assistance with verifying that the voluntary agreement has provisions that will assist with this. One of the primary objectives being, you know, ensuring that the project's previously stored water being released to meet standards is is not being diverted without a prior, without a water right or contract. So that I appreciate you asking that question because that's definitely something we probably should have plugged a little bit more. Um, is and you know that would be really helpful for us to be able to consider those voluntary agreements. I think, you know, it, it will probably depend on the size of the water users. Um, you know, I think a, a small diverter with a, you know, 10 acre foot pond is a lot different than a diverter that's in this class of 5,000 acre feet of use or more. I think we'll, we'll have to prioritize consideration of those issues and really um, make sure that we're looking at actions that encapsulate the majority of the water. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I know some of the challenges in the, in the last drought there, you know, there was the, I believe the voluntary agreement from the Delta water users, which was a 25% reduction. And then some folks on the San Joaquin side also had a proposal and there may, there may have been some others. Um, and the, the San Joaquin side, you know, wasn't approved in the last drought. And maybe there, I'm sure there were specific reasons and concerns and maybe that had to do with the, uh, the parity issue. Um, but perhaps if they can address some of the concerns that you just brought up, um, you know, we can get over that home. Anyway, so I, I appreciate your giving some additional thought to that and um, working with the water users if they submit a proposal. Thank you. Can I just ask a clarifying question because I don't have the history that you all have. I just want to make sure I'm following, um, Sean, what you were talking about. <laughs> um, so. I, I just am not clear when you're talking about voluntary agreements as um, opposed to regulatory action or water rights actions, it, how it seems to me that voluntary agreements fit within um, regulatory and water rights context. So I just am the this um, I'm not following what your um, you're saying our choices are, is it to allow voluntary agreements within this process or is it um, something else? I'm not, sorry, just wanna make sure I'm following. Uh, for me, I would be supportive of a voluntary agreement to the extent it can meet that, you know, like Diane said, you know, the majority of the water users or the largest water users in any case are participating and that all the regulatory commitments that are needed, you know, whether it's D1641 or another commitment on a specific river are being addressed, then yes, you know, to me, that satisfies the need to, you know, better manage water and enact the priority system in a way that's a little more outside the box. It might involve some of the more senior water right holders, um, the, the free 14s, the riparians, to the extent they're participating, um, but it basically keeps that watershed system whole. So, so, but, so you're saying then there wouldn't be a need to um, enact emergency regs or what are you saying? I, I don't know exactly okay. um, if there would be, I, I think it would be an, an alternative to w whatever might be envisioned with an emergency regulation for that watershed. But I, you know, I don't know what implementation exactly looks like because I haven't myself right. seen okay. any of the proposals. I'm just, you know, at this point, I want to flag that I'm interested in keeping the doors open. And looking at how, yeah, how those can be facilitated and yes. um, supported. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I wasn't trying to put you on there. I, no, I just want to make sure I was following. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess um, I am struggling with just the timing problem we have. And, um, you know, I, I guess... Um, I mean, if we have to wait for, um, if what happens this year is always how it happens, we can't ever, you know, um, by the time we get, we are able to adopt emergency regs um, to be able to do curtailments, it's too late basically, or maybe there's a little bit of time, but so I, I guess I'm just, um, you know, more fundamentally interested in how we um, how we're how we're working through that as we you know deal with this. I mean, I feel like that's everything in this drought is like this, <laughs> we're in a really bad situation this year, and we're looking how we can get into a better one. Um, you know, by this you know before this happens again, hopefully not next year, but potentially. Um, but um. Anyway, I um, I don't know that I have more. Um, I just I really appreciate just the effort that time that staffs put in, and also just all the um, engagement from stakeholders and um, digging in because we have to figure out how to like you know both all of the board members so far have said I think our system uh, isn't what it needs to be, but we've got it. Um, we've got to use it and we've got to make it better and we've got to get um, these things in place. And so we're doing the best we can um, as we move through. Uh, but I do really hope that we can, um, you know, use every opportunity to not shy away from 
just creating a system that will actually work on some of these fundamental timing issues um, and, and structures. It just seems like we're really set up to fail here with that. And I, um, you know, I haven't been around as uh, in this space as much as any of you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm already frustrated, so. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe I can um, just quickly mention on the timing issues. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily too late for emergency regulations. They're effective for a year, they can be renewed. Um, we are also potentially gonna have a problem with water availability issues in the fall and winter when all of the storage reservoirs are wanting to store water and we still have needs for meeting um, Salinity control and alpha standards. So I, you know, I, I think there's that. There's also, you know, the opportunity for the board to investigate longer term voluntary or regulatory approaches. Um, you know, that is some of these issues have been teed up as part of the Bay Delta planning process as issues that probably need to be addressed, you know, at some in some mechanism through that process. Um, to widen the net of responsibility and, you know, that can be done, you know, obviously through a voluntary approach or um, a regulatory approach. All right, it's late, so I'll try to keep it short. Thank you all for the, the good discussion and, and really a tremendous amount of gratitude to the staff for the work on this. I was around in the last drought. I, in fact, was the hearing officer for one of the enforcement actions against uh, Byron Bethany for not complying with, uh, with the curtailment orders. And so the issue of unavailability and how staff determines that was something that was a major focus back then in that hearing. And to see how far we've advanced since then in terms of the complexity of the assumptions, the modeling, the projections, um, again, much gratitude and, and kudos to staff for, for the hard work. It's not perfect. Obviously, we could always use more information. We could always use, as an engineer, I love equations, I love analysis and modeling, and we can always do more of that. Uh, but it is a step forward. And I was able to watch the entirety of the staff workshop, I believe it was last Friday. Well, one Friday, um, I was really heartened by the spirit of collaboration I heard in terms of all the stakeholders, um, you know, being willing, asking to be able to have a role in helping us uh, build this, helping us develop the information so that as the vice chair mentioned that a future board, and that might be you next year, um, would have better information upon which to make these difficult decisions. So I definitely would you know, support moving forward collaboratively to trying to improve the system and the process that we have. Um, Board Member Firestone, let me, let me sort of try to answer your question from my perspective with respect to voluntary agreements and emergency regulations. I don't see the two as being um, separate. I don't see the two as being uh, conflicting or contradictory. Um, I think actually they help one another. One of the things that uh, I would say, emergency regulations, uh, one of the benefits, I guess, is if done right, the emergency regulation should reflect the solutions, the objectives, what it is that we're trying to, to address and what we, you know, what solutions we think will help address that. So it lays out what the board's expectations are, what we hope to accomplish. And it also could provide the avenue as part of the regulation for developing voluntary agreements, but it provides some framework around it in terms of, it gives, it gives the negotiating parties a framework upon which to negotiate, rather than you know do a you know fetch a rock, bring me something, I'll let you know if I like it or not. It gives an outline of something, and it should also provide for the avenue of voluntary agreements to accomplish the objectives as outlined in those regulations. So I, I see them as complementary. Um, I also see. Uh, that emergency regulation or the board's very firm intention to proceed is also an incentive for developing a successful voluntary agreements. And I would agree with what Ms. Widow and, and others have said in terms of a successful voluntary agreements should 
have measures of accountability. We should be able to track, report, and, and know what the outcomes are. I think, you know, the former chair, Marcus, like to say, trust but verify. And I think, you know, that is something that I would look for in a voluntary approach. But I do think that having some parameter and framework and indication of what we expect um, will help shape that voluntary agreement discussion, having the board strong intention to proceed because this is a dire thing that we need to do, will motivate the discussions on voluntary agreements and hopefully give it that focus and that, that um, uh, resolutions parameters that we need in order to actually determine um, results and hold accountability and hopefully help us in future proceedings uh, when future droughts come along. So again, kudos to all the staff for your hard work and thank you to the, all the stakeholders for their engagement. This again is not going to be an easy task. It's not going to be a short term task, uh, but it's one where I think we've made a great deal of progress and there's hope for, uh, for future progress to be made. Thank you so much board member. Thank you all board members for the, the great comments and good discussion here amongst us. If I can just emphasize uh, again, board member Dodek's point that uh, it is a continuum of work between a voluntary solution that may be out there or the data that's part of a regulatory uh, approach by the board. And that's the important part. It's the same data. It's the same hydrology. It's the same water rights holders and information about those water rights holders and their diversions that are the fundamental basis of the discussion. And so to the extent we can continue to get better about that information so that whether it's by state action or voluntary local action, which like board member McGuire, I see the benefit of perhaps moving more quickly in that space, but we can't just uh, depend on that good faith uh, and instead need to make sure we all manage through these um, dire circumstances together uh, either way and see this as just a common outcome amongst us all of needing to manage through this time. And yes, um, can more effectively at least use the board's time if we have voluntary agreements and serious partners in watersheds that are looking at the same data and to board member Dodek's point, looking for those same outcomes and all of us contributing in our way to that discussion. So thank you. This is um, again, no, no light topic um, after a, a long, very long day um, so we will have just further discussion here, um, certainly uh, both in public and then also uh, with staff as we, we try to just best understand not just this, these decisions and this work, uh, the water rights work, so critical that it is, but just how it's in fact in impacting and part of our considerations from the Division of Drinking Water, our considerations for, our, for water quality and its challenges in this and try to do best by what is um, not an easy topic in of itself, certainly, but during drought, uh, all the more consequential for all of us. So thank you. Um, and I, we'll talk further. Thank you, Hun. And that concludes I, that item. Item number seven brings us to our last item, again, at a very long day, uh, of our board member reports. Fellow board colleagues who would like to go first on, on their reports as I try to quickly figure out what, what I need to say. For mine. I can go super fast. My my brain's dying quickly. Um, <laughs> I uh, this morning I got to be the keynote for the ELAP conference. Um, and I mean that's why I was late to the board meeting. So it was a very short keynote. <laughs> but um, uh, there was over 800 people participating, um, and just I think a really great kickoff to um, kind of this new era of the ELAP regs that we passed before. So that was exciting. It is exciting. Our laboratory community is an incredible one, actually. The, the amount of sharing that's going on, I mean, you think of like PFAS, all these emerging contaminants of concern, you know, there's, I mean, our toxicity provisions and the water flea and the, the love life of the water flea and its its impact to, to, to labs. There's just so much going on. I'm very glad you were there, board member. Um, and I look forward to continuing to hear from the labs as we implement um, what I know was, I know a many years discussion and um, one that came with a lot of concern about uh, implementation. So uh, thank you, board member. Others. Um, I was on a panel um, 
on the 27th at the Almond Board Alliance, and it was moderated by former Secretary of Agriculture, Bill Lyons. And uh, with me on the panel was Randy Fiorini and um, representing uh, Turlock Irrigation District and uh, Patricia Poirier with um, uh, Kern uh, variety of GSAs. Um, and we had a good discussion about um, Sigma um, well, drought, I wouldn't say good, but informative, an informative discussion about drought. And they asked me what the biggest issue was um, before their industry. And um, I commented that instead of, this would be the time my phone rings. Um, I commented that <laughs> instead of talking about regulation, that they should be uh, taking a good hard look internally with you know the criticism that they've been receiving. I talked about some of the comments that we've been receiving before the board and um, uh, they do have, um, I, I think um, a good story to tell at times, you know, regarding their conservation practices and amazing increases in efficiency. But for some reason that's just not resonating. And I suggested that they sit down with um, some of the stakeholders and get sort of an ex external look on their industry. So. I felt like the, the comment was um, well received and I appreciated the opportunity. Great, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, okay, I've oriented myself and figured out what I, I've been doing. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly comment that I apologize first and foremost to the Water Association of Kern County. I was originally slated to uh, be part of a panel with Valerie Kincaid that Eric Ekdahl, our, uh, our head of Division of Water Rights, um, they thankfully stepped in for me for. The reason why I was not able to fulfill my commitment to that uh, event, their water summit, was because I had to, I was called to testify before Congress. Uh, the House uh, Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife held a drought uh, hearing oversight, oversight hearing on drought, uh, Western drought particularly, and I had the pleasure of being on a panel with uh, Liz Klein from the Department of Interior to talk about some of the coordination that's certainly been going on between us and the federal agencies, but importantly, how California is finding itself responding to drought conditions like our, our as we know, our many Western state neighbors. So uh, fortunate to, to come and carry the collective leadership here of the board uh, in our work and the state uh, to that, that discussion. And then uh, later that day on the 25th actually was also then part of a salt and seam panel with um, Secretary Crowfoot um, Sammy Roth from the LA Times uh, moderated the panel and uh, importantly also had a community member from North Shore um, attend uh, with along with assembly member uh, Garcia. So it was um, a very uh, you know lively discussion certainly an important and timely one and with drought and western water issues front of mind certainly the connection between the Salton Sea and the Colorado River and its challenges um, was part of some of that discussion. And so just appreciated those two opportunities uh, to engage. Uh, and now I'm standing in the way between you and your evening. So I will say that I have no board member report, no public meetings this, this time. But next time I will have one. So I'm excited. I'll be excited to report on that. I'm excited and looking forward to, to the report. And board member Dodek, I saw you. Uh, I, I will pass as well. OK. Well, thank you all. Uh, again, this was an incredibly long day, always uh, well, well, time well spent and important discussions. So just thank you everyone. And uh, we'll be here in two weeks. Um, and so uh, we will see you at then the June 15th board meeting. And um, as you heard today already, you know, previewed that there will be further discussion regarding drinking water impacts and our work with DWR and identifying dry wells. Um, and so look forward to, to that further discussion. All right, I'll leave everyone be. You have a good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention, time and patience, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is adjourned.